uh, working with CSLP students, which we'll explain more. Thank then you. we're housing the Center for Leadership and Community Engagement, and uh, that's my role within it. So introducing Melanie now. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Bullock. She, her pronouns. I serve as the new director for the Center for Leadership and Community Engagement. Um, this is my number five at American University, but excited to join the team and continue in the legacy of Marcy uh, and the great work that she's done um, and the team has done with community engagement. And then we're also adding, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, also adding this leadership education and pedagogy layer um, to our work as well. So I'm very, very excited to meet you all and see you all. Thank you for braving the wind and the rain and <laughs> going sideways, the misty rain um, this morning. Uh, but excited to chat with you all and talk with you more about this work. Yeah. And we're appreciative to see Tyrell for helping us set this up and to you all for being here in person. We have six hours together. So um, knowing that it's going to be a little bit of a long day, we'd love to get to know each of you a little bit better as well. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about maybe your, your name and then what brought you to this panel, uh, your name, position at AU and what brought you into the panel. So it's Maria, do you want to kick us okay. off? Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I'm Maria Ulysses, I'm faculty at SIS, and I taught community-based research and community-based participatory classes for a long time, but I've been away um, on fellowship, and I'm back, so I'll be offering two at SIS in the fall, one undergrad and one grad on CBPR, community-based participatory research, um, that I've suggested and recommended, hopefully we designated. Um, we're going to be doing work with um, a community that um, serves migrant uh, new populations of migrants in the DMV area. Um, and we're going to be working particularly with migrant youth age 15 and 24, looking at social determinants of health, my area is global health um, and international relations. Um, so very excited to be here. Um, I love the participatory nature of CBPR and you know, looking forward to these discussions today at workshop. Thank you, Maria. Hello, I'm Catherine. Um, I'm an actual instructor in SPA. Oh, thanks. Um, and I am an alum of AU as well. I was in the master's in public administration program and Ooh, lots of same courses. Way. Yeah, awesome. And lots of the courses involve informal community-based learning um, because we're often working with government and nonprofit partners. Um, but when I started to do instruction, I also started to informally in include community-based learning in my courses. Um, but I am excited to learn more formal ways um, to do CBL. If I lean down and uh plug in my computer, I don't have to go, right? <laughs> um, my name is Larry Engel. I'm an associate professor in film and media arts, and I'm the division director for the program. Um, I am a C, am I a CBRL? CBLR. <laughs> CBLR fellow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I've been doing uh, CB designated work uh, primarily in the film division in uh, visual literacy. It's uh, actually a core first semester course for undergraduate majors. And we, uh, in our block classes, have um, community clients, nonprofits. And the students do amazing work in their first or uh, fall semester of their second year. Um, I've worked hard over time with um, the community to bring CB designation to graduate courses because a lot of our courses are 400, 600 level courses mm -hmm. and um, we've succeeded in doing that. Which yeah. Great. So now we just have to get more folks signed up. Our community-based uh, course, uh, Community Documentary run by Laura Water Hinson and Heather Bromley is another uh, course. I'm a longtime documentary filmmaker so, and I teach a lot of smartphone filmmaking. So I teach especially to non-media students. So if any of you want to do self-documentation on your research or work with the community, so you get some behind the scenes work or visual communication becomes part of your effort, 
um, in CV related work, call on me, I'll come in or zoom in um, and work with you or your uh, students. And it takes about an hour and the students are on the way. So, so you can there you. It's like <laughs> pass, pass, pass the box. Yeah. Pass the box. yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm Gabrielle Gonzalez. I'm the program coordinator for experiential and lifelong learning at SIS. Um, me and Stephanie Fisher are really excited to bring CBS courses um, to more of the forefront of SIS. And we really want to encourage faculty to seek this designation. So um, I'm excited to learn more about what it is. Thanks, Gabrielle. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Josie. I um, just graduated from undergrad Friday and have a year left on my master's in engineering. Thank you. And I did um, a lot of programs through, um, what are you now? CLCE. CLCE. I'm, I'm not going to transition well on this one. Um, and also, yeah, I think... Um, I think Sarah said slice and that helps. That was a good, uh, that was a good way for me to remember. Um, anyways, and, and I did a lot of program work with Sauger over the past two years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just kind of here floating around for a little bit while I wait to launch my big girl life. Um, and so, yeah, super happy to be here. Is the big girl life before the master, after the masters or? Does Big Girl Life start now that you have your bachelor's? Um, maybe now. Maybe, you know, we have a year of flexibility to figure it out. Yeah, hopefully now. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> um, I don't know if our friend in the back wants to introduce as well. or that's... You, you can go first, and then we'll uh, get to the people who are filtering. Awesome. Hi, I'm Susan Comfort. I am also new five months in the American. Um, I'm an adjunct in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I teach strategies in stress management, which is um, pretty great since my name is Susan Comfort, and that uh, has always been my name. But I'm really thrilled to learn more about community-based learning because uh, I've spent my career in the nonprofit movement, and so I've always, you know, encouraged and managed college students to get involved. Um, but more importantly, strategies and stress management is really based around a sort of upset of stress and like community-based approach of learning about the nervous system and how we respond in community or in interaction versus isolation and even self-care. So thinking about not just that, but then the generosity and gratitude aspects of self hair stress management, nervous system reactions, we have to set students up with an opportunity to be generous, grateful, connected, and doing something like this might be a really good way to do that. Um, so I'm teaching another session in the fall. We'll see what I can incorporate now or later. Um, but <clears throat> because I've spent a career in the nonprofit movement and I have some expertise in different styles of interactive teaching. I used to work for Playworks. And so there's, I do a lot of games in my classroom, a lot of like, um, you know, interactive learning and crowdsource learning. Um, I'm happy to both learn and offer in terms of, you know, how we have our game in teaching at AU. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Um, so we have uh, two others joining us today. You want to introduce yourselves. We're just doing what brought you to the panel? And then what's your name and your um, kind of role at you? Great. I'll just put that together with another name. Um, Stephanie Fisher. I work at SAS. Um, so I'm the executive director of experiential learning. So I oversee experiential um, learning and kind of get more community based learning designation into our classes because I think we're doing all that. Um, so there's another SAS. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I oversee the fraction program, which um, are sort of like projects that grad students do in like places like state department versus um, uh, save the children, things like that. We also have one of the skills courses, um, and I'm going to the Philippines in a couple of weeks, teaching the broad course uh, that we're working with a local uh, child protection, child and organization. Um, yeah, I'm here to learn more and figure out how we can get more folks in our yes. Amazing. Thank you for coming up today.
<laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Ludwig Grandas. I work uh, at uh, World Languages and Cultures. Uh, I am here because I, um, I frequently teach a community-based learning course or I have students who include uh, one credit with CSLT. And I always find it very both rewarding and challenging both for me and my students. But always at the end of the semester, uh, the, the, the exchange is very positive um, and that we all learn a lot. I am always you know, open to uh, more discussions and ideas on how I can incorporate a community-based learning component, even for uh, courses that are not designated as such, but I always sort of sneak in points of a grade for a community uh, project. So, uh, so I'm here to sort of share and compare notes uh, if that's what you're doing here. Absolutely, and Ludi, how long have you uh, been teaching CBL at AU? It's been... Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> one of our, our most experienced faculty who's put out so many great projects. So we have such a good mix within the room. I wanted to give a uh, chance we're doing um, introduction. So just uh, what brought you to the panel, your name, and then your role at AU, um, if you want to start, Shay. Um, so I'm Shay Lamana. I work in SIS as a department manager uh, for the Department of Environment Development and Health. And I'm here because we as a department are interested in incorporating more community-based learning components in to um, particularly undergrads and figuring out how we can attract and retain some of the undergrads that are interested in the topics that our faculty teach on. Um, and I have worked in community-based learning both here at AU before this role and at West Virginia University. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Serena Daniels, and I do teach um, here um, as an adjunct faculty member um, for DPAT, which is Department of Public Administration. Um, so I, this is new. To, well, I wouldn't say I would say it was new, but I, because I think I remember coming another year, but it was online. So not sure. Um, interesting to learn more about how can students integrate what they've learned in the classroom and um, into into the basically. So I wanted to like my class. We don't really have that component per se, but um, I, I could just be a resource for them if they are looking for something to do, you know, how they can apply their skills on the outside. I will say sometimes in my class, like for my undergraduate students, I, because um, I do have um, undergraduate students at another university, I was a business professor. So what I've done with them was, to, wasn't really a integration of what they learned in my class, but it was more like, because um, I teach policy. So I wanted them to look at some some um, governing meetings, some government meetings, mm -hmm. uh, and participate and come back with a report to let us know what they thought about it. Because sometimes they've never gone to a public meeting for sake. So I want to, so to some degree, I want to do that still, but I also want to um, learn more about how I can be more hands-on in terms of what they think about take to the community. Absolutely. And like you said, Lorelia, the immersive aspect of this is one of the most uh, kind of rewarding for both students as well as for the experience of the class. And so before we uh, maybe turn it over to see who's in the Zoom room, I just want to give a sense of the agenda. So, you know, thank you all for joining. One of the things that we'll get to explore today is not only kind of an introduction for a lot of the faculty we have present who this might be a little bit fresh or new to, but then also some time towards the afternoon after lunch to hear from kind of faculty who have been doing this uh, for a number of years, different ways that they've piloted as well as a community partner who they've worked with. And towards the afternoon session, then having some time to actually talk through what does it look like to ingrain this into your course. So starting off with a little bit more of theory and then ending with a little bit more of that practical integration. We'll have breaks throughout. We'll have some interactive activities throughout um, so as we kind of go through the agenda, we'll have about half an hour for lunch just because we start off a little bit uh, late, but we also wanted to give everyone a chance to hear from each other and hear from the different schools about all of the different work that's going on. Um, so that's just the only adjustment to kind of our, our timeline for our presenters. Uh, we, do we have anyone on Zoom who'd like to introduce themselves? Um, let's make sure that they can, we can hear them through this. Yeah, participants. Okay, I think we just have Ocheze, Katrine, and Navila. Um, right now, I see you're all muted. If someone's able, if someone wants to introduce themselves, then uh, feel free to unmute an intro. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Ocheze okay. Joseph. Uh, we see you talking, Ocheze. I want to make sure that the rest of us are able to hear you. Um, the audio should be coming actually out of everything. So give us one second. I think Lindsay stepped out. No worries. We can um, let me try turning it up from over here. And if that doesn't work, then potentially put it into the chat, Ocheze, and we can read it off. Oh, so it looks like she's talking. Uh, it to her yeah. 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 The slide audio is coming out fine from the room, but the Zoom audio isn't. So, um, actually, maybe one thing we could do is. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Should I go to Zoom settings here and then say yes? I, yeah, because our skills institute. Yeah. 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 I did. Yeah. 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 This is the. Oh, we should just do my system. Um, Oh, Chesley, can you try to down? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, great, 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 great. Hi, Thank everyone. So I'm um, um, oh, Chesley Joseph, <laughs> and I'm the director. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, we were turning up the volume. Oh, okay. It's good now? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, we didn't have you before. Okay. Would you introduce yourself. Okay. <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm the director of undergraduate programs in the School of Education, and I'm looking forward to um, chatting with everyone during the panel uh, second half. Yeah, uh, Ochazi is joining as one of our panelists as well. So. Then, sorry, let's try and get some videos here. Maybe I can stop the screen can share. Stop, sure. Okay, there we go. Awesome. And just wanted to give you a chance, Nabila or Katrine, if you um, would like to introduce yourself. I'm Nabila. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm helping the facilitator. Thank you. <laughs> And I'm Katrine, and I'm also helping CTRL. Thank you, CTRL. All right. All right. So our PowerPoint's there. Yeah. And then we just want to make sure we hit optimize for the real quick, too. Great. Sounds good. So um, I'm going to kick us off this morning. Um, I'm also going to pass out, um, we um, have some handbooks or like workbooks, so to say, with some more information and some of the content that we'll be going over today. Um, so that is for you all. And for folks that are on Zoom, we'll make sure you get a um, digital copy and actually we'll share a digital copy for, for everyone. We will continue to be updating this too. Um, but for today's purpose of um, content and delivery, I um, wanted to make sure you all had something to work through as we go through our slides together this morning and this afternoon. So again, my name is Melanie Bullock. Um, um, I, I get the lovely opportunity of talking about Center for Leadership, um, this new concept um, of leadership education that will be joining forces with community engagement and um, community-based learning. Um, as some of you all may know, um, we, we have a team of individuals who, um, with, with CSES and LCLCE that have been tasked with doing some um, great work um, around community engagement. Outside of the folks that you see in this space, we also have Devontae Parker, who is uh, one of our assistant directors and will be working with some leadership development programs moving forward, but is also the leader of our alt group program. Um, we have um, Jacob Ortiz, who is our associate director, uh, works with education and equity, um, also DC Reads. Um, uh, Jacob has been with us for about two- uh, Since about 2019. 20, okay, sounds good. Um, and Devante actually just joined us in October. Um, so we are excited um, for um, his work with leadership, but also um, the work that he will continue to do with all breaks. And the same with Jacob, um, will continue his work with education equity and DC Reads. 
And then we have Sarah Resendez, who is our coordinator for programs, operations, actually in finance. We need to update that. Um, and so um, uh, she is also responsible for our one day service events and programs. Um, and is the glue that holds our <laughs> operations um, to, to get the heartbeat of our, our group. So I wanted to introduce some of those individuals that aren't here today, but um, are very uh, instrumental in the work that we do with CLCE. And we also have an excellent team of student staff mm -hmm. as well. So um, Joseph Atulo, he comes from Ghana and has engaged in community-based learning um, for this tri-semester program, which was very intensive, as well as uh, with Amanda, Kyle. Uh, Kyle Lopez, uh, he's our graduate assistant for working with Washington. So if you apply for any of the working with Washington grants, whether your students are using the Lyft Fund, if you're applying for a faculty micro grant or a community partner honorarium, you will probably hear from both of us. <laughs> We're excited because we'll be having some new team members join us too, um, new grads and some student staff members that will be joining us in the in the fall as well. What's that? A, 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 a team certification. Okay. Right. Yeah. Oh, good we'll go back. Probably hit the little snooze button too. Oh, so. oh great. Uh, Get it. Yeah. Awesome. And can you help me? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, uh, go back to this, this one. Oh, perfect. Okay. There we go. Sounds good. All right. Going forward. Oh, that's okay. Can you just stop sharing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Larry, you were saying that uh, last time you attended this, it was completely via Zoom. I've noticed that I think there's some advantages to doing it completely virtual, others to doing it completely in person, and hybrid is kind of that new thing we're all trying to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so some of the programs um, that the CLCE offers, um, and we'll, we can talk a little bit more about these, but just wanted to capture some of the work in our office. We have, again, DC Reads, um, CSL, sorry, CSLP, um, our Alt Breaks, uh, our President's Volunteer Service Award, MLK Data Service, Eagle Endowment, Venture to Volunteer, um, lots of uh, programs that our, our office does and facilitates throughout the school year. We are also part, a, a, we are a branch out of the divi sorry, Division of Student Affairs. And so we report directly to Dr. Dane Hutchinson, um, who then reports to Dr. Raymond O. Um, but we are a part of the Division of Student Affairs family. But it, the unique thing about our office is that we have like one foot in student affairs and then one foot in like academic affairs, which is the beauty of our work that it intersects, the intersection of both worlds um, sits in our space and in our um, and, and all the programs that we do. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that today as well. So what's this new leadership thing? I'm so glad that you all asked. Uh, we're trying to figure that thing out as well. I uh, wanted to highlight to, like why leadership, why now? Um, it, talk about the scope impact, um, opportunities for collaboration, next steps, and we can also have a little bit of space for some question and answers um, at, around the leadership piece as well. Um, so why leadership and community engagement? Um, we know studies um, have shown such a connection between the two. Um, it, 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 leadership is very much evident in community engaged practice um, and community engagement. We, we know that students are developing skills that are applicable um, through community-based work um, to a variety of other leadership roles and leadership experiences, um, and that they are leading in these organizations and in the work that they're doing as well. We see an enhanced civic responsibility as a result of the partnership of leadership where students can understand where leadership exists and their community engaged work and the skills that they're applying to that work and what they're able to gain and then apply to other spaces as well. Uh, we, it's a mutual beneficial relationship where leadership gives 
community engagement and community engagement gives to, to leadership experiences. Um, students are building empathy, cultural competence, and a host of other different skills in both worlds and in both spaces. And both um, areas, there we, there's proven fact and data that supports that students are um, building innovation skills, entrepreneurship skills as, as well. So the how, how did the two meet and how did they work together in collaboration? Um, we see the opportunity where it can exist in, of course, CB courses and community-based research based off of the different skills that we know students are gaining from those two experiences. Um, the workshops and training programs that our office will provide and that we will do will also, I believe, add value to students that are engaged in community work um, as well. And then, of course, the networking and partnerships across the board with our faculty partners, with our community partners, student affairs. Um, there's a lot of really good opportunities where that how can exist in the relationship building, um, the partnerships that are created around this work when we talk about leadership and community engagement as well. I did pull some data um, from the National Association of Colleges and Employees, sorry, employers. Um, every year they do, uh, well, a lot of different studies. One particular one, um, they study and uh, research and uh, do some, um, sorry, do some research around what uh, industries are looking for from recent college graduates. And they put a job outlook survey out um, on, um, available for anyone and can definitely share that resource a little bit later. Uh, but they had this job outlook survey where they are sharing what skills uh, they industries and in um, different organizations are looking for from recent college um, graduates. I did pull one particular table and data uh, point uh, around employers rate recent graduates on different eight career readiness competencies. These are the um, ones that have actually frequently come up in the job outlook survey from year to year. Um, and you see things like communication, it's a little, I don't know if it's a little big, communication, teamwork, critical thinking. I'm going to scroll down to, to leadership and specifically around this particular table and why I pulled it. Um, we see the um, level of importance that particular competency is to different industries, um, but then also the proficiency that they're seeing um, in that particular um, career readiness skill um, uh, in comparison to the importance. And so with leadership, we see that the leadership shows up as one of the important competencies that jobs and uh, careers or industries are looking for from recent college graduates. Um, but you see the proficiency, I can't talk today, proficiency um, is a little skilled, a lower than what the um, experience importance is. And so um, we, we see an opportunity here to continue to build those leadership skills and our students through community engaged work so that that can be a little bit um, more sizable um, scale, scale up in the future. Expanding scope, what that looks like for our work with the Center for Leadership and Community Engagement. We are looking to offer some new programs, layered on top of what we are already offering. Um, just to note, we are very much keeping intact all of the current existing programs that sit within or have sat within CSES um, and will sit with the um, Center for Leadership and Community Engagement. We're just adding a leadership component through some new programs and opportunities for our students and collaborative opportunities that we have available for other um, uh, campus partners throughout AU as well. Um, our, our program areas and focus areas will include training, some mentorship programs, um, and some community-driven initiatives. One particular program I want to highlight that is launching in the fall is a new Emerging Leaders program for any student that is identifies as an emerging leader. Um, a, a lot of that energy will, um, in terms of promotional marketing, will go towards our first-year students coming into campus, uh, where we will have a year experience, cohorted experience for students that want to take a deep dive in leadership development um, during their time first year at, at um, American University. Uh, but also, there will be some community-engaged um, components to that particular program, um, where they'll be introduced to some of the things that we offer in CLCE. Um, we also have, we have a host of workshops that we're building a web page for right now where any uh, faculty, staff, student can request um, uh, us to come and share those resources with your um, departments and areas um, as well. And then we're also partnering with some larger um, organizations, one particular organization called Leadership, where we'll be able to bring in some facilitators um, from different institutions across the um, country to come and do some leadership training for our students as well. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yes. So, so 
So I was curious what this means. Is it a certificate? Or is it part of the designated classes? Can you give us more? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, that is a, um, one of the big goals that we have is that we will eventually um, develop the program uh, to include maybe evolve into a certificate type program. Um, also looking at opportunities to connect it, connect it to some academic courses as, as well. The preliminary initial pilot phase will include um, a, a series of workshops and trainings for, for students. We will kick off with a retreat in the fall. Um, they will have some mentorship opportunities where we will introduce them to the concept of mentoring and then they will have to identify faculty, staff, and other peers to be a part of their constellation of mentors as a part of that program as well. And there's some celebratory things that will be a part of that um, one year experience. And our hope is once students complete that one year, they'll be able to come back and join us as mentors as we build out a second year portion of that um, program. And then eventually get to certificates um, or some other components that we're, we're talking about right now, but um, will be a part of the ongoing development of that particular emerging leaders program. The more that we thought about reimagining the office too, the more that we realized there was missed potential here and that we need to be doing more to train our students to be leaders. And some of them are developing these skills, but it's often something, especially in, when we look at things like first year retention and there's sometimes that sophomore slump, this could be a way to build out some of the programming that we already have. And we hear about this within each school too. SBA has their change maker series. There's a difference maker series within, um, I think it's SOE or SIS. Mm -hmm. So there's a few different schools Cass that are doing. Lead. Sorry? CAS lead. Uh, CAS? Yep. Yeah, CAS lead. So then, um, you know, it's kind of mirroring some of the other work that we're seeing happen across campus. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two questions. Question. Um, so you said you're targeting first year students. Is this during their first year? So is it more like, is it kind of based like CBRS like where students are applying into this or expressing interest in it during their application and admissions process? So not during the application process, um, but we are getting ready to launch some marketing to go along with the new All-American Welcome um, activities. Uh, and the information is going to uh, families and parents right now to hopefully engage a cohort of students um, so they can apply throughout the summer into the fall um, and the kickoff for that particular program will happen we're looking at later the latter part of September or early October to give us some time for students upon arrival to still apply to the program at that point as well okay so it's like for their first year not yeah. like they apply during their first year yes so. yeah for their first year yeah. we're also thinking about to that gap that students often identify once they get to campus in finding their community mm -hmm. so uh, Susan. I'm interested in this on so many levels because I have a daughter who's a first year. I just picked her up at college. And so like watching her journey at school and like how she develops confidence and leadership. <laughs> and it makes me think like, what's, the, so the question is, what's the balance of like leadership and engagement, community engagement? Is that the AU community? Is it the larger nonprofit community? And, you know, the DMV, are there mm. certain like designated groups that are like mm. groups that you work you don't have to answer all these questions, but I'm just curious. Like my daughter would probably, and my daughter speaks for all first year students, it'd be more, more engaged to do something on campus where she could like practice leadership, you know, to meet people, et cetera. And there's certainly plenty of needs. So I'm just curious, like I was thinking external community, but now I'm thinking like, well, wait a minute, what about leadership and community engagement here at AU? I think that's one of the unique strengths that being positioned within the Division of Student Affairs allows us is that we often, you know, as a whole division are creating opportunities for students to evolve their leadership capabilities. And now it's kind of housed and filtered through CLCE, although there are other ways to step up in leadership through like uh, Center for Diversity and Inclusion, as well as, you know, some of our other auxiliary offices where maybe they've become tour guides within new student family orientations, etc. So to answer kind of the other part of your question, which I am very eager to do on the uh, what do partners look like outside of AU too within the community? Um, it's a great question and it's one that within our six hours together we have like a little portion later on that we'll kind of talk about partnership creation, what do we look for when we're thinking of community-based partners within the academic sense, but yes definitely understand that leadership isn't only through CBL, it's uh, one of the ways that students can engage with it through in their academic experience, yet there's also other things that we do within our office that allow students to elevate their leadership 
knowledge and experience through kind of, uh, you know, on-campus programming. Yeah. Any other questions? We, re we appreciate this them. too, yeah, yeah because yeah. this is a big uh, shift <laughs> so, yeah. for, for those of you who have been with us for over 10 years. It's we've uh, now taking this kind of next next step. We know there was some skepticism at first mm -hmm. on how this would fit in, but we mm -hmm. do honestly believe this was already a part of the programming. We're just trying to elevate mm -hmm. this, and make this more explicit to our students right now. So, and the co-sign that we see leadership exists at, at, at American University. We know that leadership um, or, and leadership learning exists in different spaces. I think we have a just really unique and cool opportunity to just put a spotlight on it um, in a different way and to provide some more resources uh, for our entire campus community, um, uh, but specifically our students to build that leadership muscle, I, I, I guess yeah. you could say, while they're here at um, AU. And if I may too, I think one of the things that's so unique about AU is the fact that our student body comes to AU and to DC because they oftentimes want to make a difference. They want to make a change. It's why our AU vision, and we'll get to this with the how does AU kind of support and connect to the work that we do. But I think that nowadays students are oftentimes, you know, preparing maybe for a decade to come to college. And then they come to college and they're thinking, what's the next thing I'm supposed to be told to do? And I think one of the things that's so important within kind of the division of student affairs and these uh, underclassmen experiences is shifting that mindset from, okay, now it's not about us telling you what's gonna make you successful. Let's make sure we're developing that strength within you to figure out what can I take on that's gonna allow me to find my identity, to connect my interests and to really then be a leader within the things I care about. So I really do enjoy kind of this connection with leadership and how we see this will evolve students to then take their own kind of leadership within uh, their AU experience. And to help us like bring framing and to create the foundation for this work, um, we are using, uh, there's lots of leadership theories frameworks and models um, uh, and, and they keep the cool thing about leadership is this ever evolving and developing concept. Um, and so there are newer theories and um, frameworks that are um, developing now and um, are um, helping to challenge even some of the older frameworks as well. Uh, the ones that I, I pulled, um, I did I wanted to highlight that we are having conversation around and using as a platform for our work um, and also seeing pieces where that framework connects the dots for leadership and community engagement. Um, include, of course, the servant leadership model um, that a, a lot of um, is, is very familiar on college campuses and is used a lot in both spaces, inclusive of leadership programs and also community um, engagement programs. You also have the transformational um, leadership theory. Um, the two, I, I'll take a deeper dive in um, the social change model of leadership um, is, is one that um, has a really, really cool framing of understanding who I am as an individual and my own individual skills that I can contribute to something greater. Then it connects the dots to um, values related to how do I work in collaboration and in partnership with other individuals. Um, and then moves into this space of like, then how do um, I put my skills and your skills together collaboratively so that we can create um, positive change. Uh, and there's a lot of really good resources around that particular model um, for leadership and community engagement to help us meet at the intersection of both of those worlds. And then this newer piece I wanted to highlight um, from Jordan Harper, um, a, a, an incredible um, um, mind, <laughs> creative mind is doing some work around leadership for liberation. Um, and this particular model actually challenges the social change model, it deconstructs it and then reconstructs it from a more inclusive lens. And so I'm excited to really dig into um, Dr. Harper's work and world around leadership or liberatory leadership um, and framing around inclusive practices when we think about leadership and community engagement um, uh, as well. All of these, um, for the sake of time today, we'll, we'll highlight a, a few of these a little bit later in the presentation. However, uh, we will provide some more resources uh, for you all if you're interested in reviewing and um, kind of sifting or shifting through or sifting through some of the information related to some of the leadership frameworks we're, we're exploring. Um, collaborative opportunities uh, with this particular work. Um, like I shared before, we are building a page and offering resources for campus partners to 
um, ask or request different workshops or trainings. Um, they will involve a host of different themes that we're building curriculum around, inclusive of immersion, sorry, emotional, intelligent leadership learning. Um, yeah. Sorry, no, no, you're fine. Are we going to have access to the slide deck? Yes. Or do we mm -hmm. Yeah. Pull it out now. No, no, no. You'll have access to the slide deck. So if you want to, um, there's a lot of links and QR codes and things of that yes. nature. So we'll, we will have um, this for you available for everyone um, after today. Yeah, the CTR will send that out. But if mm -hmm. you do want to take photos, no, you're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm really interested in this, um, in this area. Awesome. Yeah. I just want to make sure I can find stuff. And well, and particularly like the QR code, um, we'll take you to a link, but will be shared with you as well, um, where we can get a little bit um, uh, more insight from you all about what things you're looking for as it relates to leadership programming, um, leadership education, um, some ideas that you may have to bring to this space and to this um, collaborative opportunity where we talk about leadership and community engagement. Uh, we want to really build these collaborative opportunities uh, across campus, uh, but wanted to, get, wanted to get your insight to help us do that a little bit more. Uh, again, with the different opportunities, we're talking about like workshops, trainings, um, we're building even um, some passive types of programs, like building a leadership to go kit and box for people to use in their classrooms or for organization, you know, meetings and other things of that nature. Um, bringing um, the thought of bringing in different keynote speakers uh, to talk about different leadership topics, as well and a host of other uh, resources that we will have available for campus partners too. Um, next steps, again, if you can scan the QR code later, if you go into the actual slide deck and complete that, that survey, it will help us really inform uh, future decisions around how we can build collaborative opportunities. Um, but we will also share out with this, with this group that has participated today, um, some new programs and ideas that we're getting ready to launch in the fall. Yeah, I guess one thing that, uh to keep note of is that because we're in this portion where we're building out some of the structure, we wanna make sure that we're supporting the members, you all, or the practitioners making this happen, especially when it comes to community-based learning. So um, I know Amanda will speak later on the community of practice, but this is also something that we're happy to share on our community of practice, even though it's slightly adjacent, it's still very closely related um, because we wanna make sure that our CDL and our leadership development models are kind of tied together. So uh, know that we want, really participation and engagement from you all. So don't feel like your ideas aren't, you know, um, welcome. And we'll, our job is to really figure out how can we, can we filter those and execute those out, so. One, can I? Yeah, yeah. I opened up the, the link and noticed, I mean, maybe I'm the lone wolf here in this, that this is a faculty institute, the form has language that says faculty that are interested in. Sometimes there are other, uh, peripheral agents in uh, departments or in academic units that are helpful in instigating some of this or mm -hmm. setting some of this up. So maybe changing the language on the form so that yeah. it's clear that Absolutely. program coordinators, academic program coordinators are yeah. the faculty and staff. Yeah, request it. Thank you. And, and two, if there are additional parties or individuals that we could be sending this out to that would be able to provide some valuable mm -hmm. feedback for us, please let us know. Um, and we'll make sure that we can send it out more widely as well after, of course, updating the, the language. Yeah, I do think that one of the, peop the people who really need to have that information uh, are the advisors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good, yeah. This past semester, I was teaching a community <laughs> and the majority of students did not know that they were taking a community-based learning course. When I asked, I, I told them that they had to engage in 20 hours of community service. They, they just, they didn't know that they had to do that. So I think, and, and I said, so why are you here? So like, well, the advisor sent us here. Yeah. An advisor, whoever that was, or advisors. So we are working more with AU Core now. We have support from uh, Dean Trogdon, who's our newer Dean of Undergraduate Education. And she's also looking at, well, one, she's looking for first year advising program. So we'll probably see some shifts in that in the next year. But two, she's also looking at how we share information about community-based learning with upper class advisors, because that seems to be one of the challenges the first year advisors might know. But I think also if they're in your class, they tend to be maybe sophomores or juniors, right? 
So it's also being really explicit about what a CB class is. We do have that coding in when you go into schedule classes, but you have to click that link. You have to look at this and it's another obstacle to students. Um, we have looked at getting it recoded as CB, but we also learned from Brad Knight, who's senior program director in AU Core, that we're actually also changing the entire schedule system uh, next year. And we're going to a student version of Workday for students to register for classes. So <laughs> uh, stay tuned. There will probably be more things. And we're hoping we can be even more explicit about how CD classes are coded. Yeah. And once we get through the initial transition phase. And we're, we're, where I guess that funnels into is what we want is something standardized, something that's yes. transparent, communicative. We don't want to necessarily make it a surprise or trick students into doing it. So if there's suggestions, right? Like this is where our community practice sessions and we're even gonna create sort of like a um, different working groups within the community of practice. So uh, one might be on how are we making sure that it's transparent, well marketed. And if this is something where you're like, hey, I have ideas or I've seen this happen, then let us know and we'll make sure that you have a say within leading that kind of small team. So the last little bit, um, and if there's two additional questions um, as we continue to talk through this work, um, please definitely bring them up. These questions were great um, and are very, very helpful um, as we continue to think about what does leadership look like um, or what does that leadership lens look like for, for our continued work. Um, I wanted to share out just some of my personal favorites. Hello. Oh, okay. I thought I went to the wrong page. But some um, of my personal favorite resources around leadership education, uh, and there's a host of others, um, but I wanted to highlight uh, for today and uh, today's conversation, I talked about the Leadership for Liberation um, by uh, Dr. Harper. Uh, I will actually, and we have a SharePoint of resources for you. Um, that particular um, workbook that um, is highlighted here uh, will be included in the shared resource folder that we have, digital folder that we have for you all. Um, but that particular workbook has just an overview of the Leadership for Liberatory framework, but then also some really unique activities uh, to frame Leadership for Liberation and um, the different things that you do with students. Um, my other favorite uh, is learning as a way of leading that particular book is a great way to frame uh, leadership uh, and its connection to social justice. Uh, leadership for a Better World uh, focuses on the social change model. Um, and then a digital resource. I, I love a good podcast. If y'all also have some good podcasts, please let me know today. But there is a Leadership Educator podcast that we'll share with you the link for that, um, where they interview a, a lot of different uh, leadership educators, um, to educators in general um, that uh, tell their story and then talk a little bit more about their work and how it shows up on um, different college campuses. And then this last one is the National Clearing House for Leadership Programs. That particular website, and we'll share this link, has a host of different materials and resources for faculty, staff, and students, um, particularly uh, as we, we talk about how, like, how do we build cor courses and syllabi in today's session. They do have some really good uh, information and resources and sample um, work on their website um, for faculty um, and staff partners about ways in which you can uh, continue to build leadership skills with your students, but then also connect the dots with your work and other areas uh, around leadership education as well. So any other questions about this whole leadership piece? Like what, what is it? Like, what are y'all doing? Yeah. Talk to you. Okay. 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 Um, one of the biggest um, issues that I face with my students in uh, production um, is lear learning what leadership and participation in teamwork or groups mm -hmm. means. And so I would love to have, I kind of use COGOD's um, team contract as a starting point. Mm -hmm. I, I personally like to know more about it. Yeah, so, and we, we see that during group work in, in the classroom and outside of the classroom, um, we are actually in conversation with our friends and student involvement as it relates to their work that they're doing with student organizations and how we can merge 
more conversations about like what does leadership look like um, for students working in teams and in groups and curriculum, more curriculum around that that doesn't just sit in student involvement, but can be shared across campus um, as, as well. So I'm glad you brought that up because um, I think that affirms some of the conversations that we're having around how to create some resource and curriculum around that particular topic. Yeah, I haven't put out a lot of on fires. <laughs> yeah, I, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll also, you know, be over the summer kind of developing a little bit more around faculty training. So some of our kind of in-house experts, so to speak, who have seen this, uh, we'll hear some more on the panel later, but Gemma Puglisi, for example, in the same as in school communications, um, I know that in her class, they elevate, they have the class split into about three different groups. So it's maybe eight, nine students per group. So it can be pretty daunting. And having an established group lead and then kind of going almost like a structure from there where there's a reporting off mechanism, that's some way to have uh, all students kind of really engage in that idea of leadership within their team groups. But you're right, there should be something where we can share those resources amongst faculty and provide a little bit more of a forum for Q and A's or uh, sharing out strategies. So um, that's definitely something that through our community practices and through some of the faculty development trainings that we're going to be piloting, uh, that's I think some good opportunities to learn more on that. And Stephanie, oh, I just it's more of a, a structural question: um, Has the old office been replaced by this office? And <laughs> I guess the question more information about that. Um, the whole idea of community-based learning, I think, is the service part, not. Mm -hmm. I think some partners would scoff a little bit about the leadership mm -hmm. part, you know, yeah. I mean, or, or you know, just be friends, not friends, but you know, you're not here to lead me, yeah. you know, yeah. you're here to be in service to Absolutely. that, so yeah. I just wonder, um, yeah, structurally and philosophically, how do we reconcile all that? I'm so glad you brought that up because that's been a big conversation. <laughs> um, I can at least, uh, well, I can address both. Um, the uh, most uh, recent uh, uh, piece that is also a part of not just the name change is we're actually moving locations. And so we will still be, uh, I don't know if you all are aware that um, uh, our MDC is going through a major transformation right now. And so at the end of the summer, we will actually, our office location will be physically moving to the floor of MDC as a part of a newly structured plan that they have that is really actually really nice. Um, we'll, we'll be- We just got an email in. from Vince Harkins about it. Oh, we did? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, good news. We have <laughs> <laughs> but um, excited because um, that that space is also going to create more collaborative opportunities um, with networking with some of our campus partners. Um, and the floor plan is also open a, a, a lot more student friendly from what I'm hearing as well. So physically, we will be moving. Uh, we, right now, we're still in MGC two seventy three. Um, is still in the same same spot. We'll just be moving at the end of the summer, one floor, one floor up. But our entire team will be collectively together in, in that shared in that shared space. Um, the uh, philosophical piece around um, how to make sure when we're teaching leadership, it's not from the frame of um, I need to be in like the, like the person in front um, or in control or the, the power dynamics of, of leadership are on the forefront of like what we are teaching. We wanna make sure like when we, um, our, our concepts of leadership, and that's why some of the frameworks that we picked um, are very much nestled in how to um, uh, create positive social change in the ways in which I show up in leadership. We also wanna make sure that leadership, the concept of leadership is, is something that everyone can see themselves in, that it's not just reserved for a president or you know the top of, uh, the, the, the deemed leader by title um, for an organization, but everyone can lead, everyone can serve, and they can see it as this um, collaborative relationship that shows up in all of the work that they do. And so when we, when we teach the philosophy around leadership um, and exploring some of the concepts that we, we talked about, it is more from a, a very much a, a mindset of like, how do um, I collectively lead and serve um, and, and take the, the power dynamics out of the traditional title of leader, so to say, or um, a leading out of the work that I'm I'm doing. Is that? I guess I, I guess yeah. as the mission of the office changed, 
Oh, and the, the, the mission actually has it. If you, um, our mission statement very much reads to leadership and service. Um, and so the mission of, and the vision of our office is, is staying the same and intact. Um, the only thing that is, is different is this added piece, this programming piece around like how do we build these skills, the skill development piece around leadership um, for, for our students. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to note because it, it's come up in our conversations is that we want to make sure that um, leadership is not on like the, this because it's this new thing that we're exploring and doing some practice around, it's not um, the forefront of our practice and our, and our work with, this, with CLCE. Like we are very much still, all of the programmatic things and our mission and vision around community engagement and community engaged practice will be at the center of our work, will be at the heart of our work. Um, we are adding the, the skill development around leadership and highlighting where leadership exists. Um, as we continue to think about like, what does the programming look like around, um, around leadership education? Maybe that yeah. Of the words even, you know. Yeah. came up. Yeah. Up, yeah. It has yeah. come up. Yeah. We also uh, think at times too, sometimes students misunderstand leadership mm -hmm. as the really outgoing person that always has to be out in front and part of leadership, especially with the model that we're looking at is more social justice focused. Leading might mean that you prioritize, hopefully, the community partners' needs first, and you listen to them. Leading might mean following mm -hmm. in different and ways of leadership, leadership. Um, leadership um, yeah. instead of the more traditional black and white binary that especially college students tend to see at the beginning. One way to also kind of conceptualize this is that leadership exists, we've mentioned skills a lot, across different competencies, right? So uh, if we break down leadership, we might end up with 20, 30 or more competencies. And not all of those competencies are exactly the most relevant to community-based or community engagement. So when we think of some like, okay, what does it mean to be a leader who is exhibiting curiosity as like a dimension of their leadership or active listening or empathy? These are skills that leaders need, but that within certain leadership development programs, um, maybe that's not the focus of it. Maybe those ones are more around managing teams. And so kind of getting away from this idea of leadership as this, like leadership in management as like a monolith and then breaking it down into what are the skills and competencies that make for servant leaders or these transformational or social, social justice oriented leaders. And then focusing our efforts on developing those skills and competencies um, so that they're, we're building up really the skills that make them better leaders within the community. I think that's gonna be a big part of our summer is like figuring out what are those competencies that we really want to train our students on and then what are going to be our kind of workshops are on kind of our touch points in which we're doing it but for cslp for example that's going to be a big thing that we do is like we we take feedback from community partners we hear feedback from students and one of the things that comes up is that students sometimes you know they don't necessarily know how to ask for their next thing right i see the people who practice this we hear it. So what are some of the ways that we can equip students with that skill to ask for what it is that, um, or to exhibit that leadership quality of, of maybe engaging through um, asking like, what can I do next? Or like, is this, you know, the best way I'm doing this? Or how have I been doing this that could be altered or changed, etc.? I think the other unique thing, like being transparent too, in addition at, um, about like the history of how we just define leadership is going to be a part of like our <laughs> teaching right so like I think it's important to talk about the fact that uh, leadership over time has evolved but it very much was this concept of like uh, and, and re was reserved like there's a whole theory called the great man theory of leadership that leadership and was only reserved for white men and we want to share the history so we can deconstruct that mindset and the, those old theories and frameworks of leadership and reconstruct it from a lens that is more inclusive. And again, like where everyone can see themselves and being a part of, of leadership and leading as well. Especially the communities our students are volunteering in. Mm -hmm. Communities who often don't have access to the same leadership. And How did you, I couldn't hear you, Amanda, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, allergies. Uh, we're also thinking too about the communities that we're volunteering in and how to put their needs forefront and have students think about how they might follow. Uh, Shay, I know you're being patient with your. Yeah. Yeah. Just that uh, 
um, I appreciate the complexity and the nuance of what you're doing and what you're kind of opening up and diving into. One of my, I guess, a request would be to share with this group and those that engage in your office a simple by definition that is intellectually appropriate for a first year student that we can then communicate easily to students. Yeah. Think of the CSLP. CSLP program with the serve, earn, learn, like it's that easy. It's the three words. And like you can show like pretty easily, like it's class plus service, reflection in the middle. That's the program. Like it's easy and like that that is hard enough to communicate honestly on this campus that mm -hmm. what service is is complicated to define and do so effectively. So when we think about how many iterations of telephone that definition is going to go through before it reaches a student's ears or parents mm. or a faculty member who's not super engaged but wants like thinks this is exciting pushes it on mm -hmm. and may not be communicating it effectively in the way that you envision it coming up with some basic definitions and terminology that is intellectually appropriate for a first year student i think would be really really helpful in promoting the success of the programs. So what I'm hearing is to define some of the terms that we use most frequently, such as leadership service, uh, you know, maybe CBL, or if you have others then, or was there one term specifically that you wanted? Leadership first. Okay. Yeah. We um, started playing around with that. Me and Devante have, um, in, in language, trying to, how do we construct a shared definition that can um, uh, translate well um, the purpose of what we're trying to do? Um, we started, this is not final. So they're in the booklet, there are, um, there's leader leadership, leader development and leadership development outlined here. This is a working draft though. So we're still defining what that looks like, but Shay, you were so on point and on target with a lot of other um, uh, thoughts and uh, uh, things that have been brought up from other campus partners of like, we're talking about leadership, but how are we collectively defining it, understanding it in this space at a at a year? So thank you for for that. Yeah, I just don't want the meaning of what you're doing and how much thought is going into it to be lost in someone miscommunicating it because yeah. there isn't a shared understanding. That's good, and we know that happens too. Yeah, and I know. Was it Luria or? Yes. Yeah. I did have a question. I'm just looking at my goals to be public policies, policy and government work. And um, most people, students that come to my class, they're motivated to serve, obviously, because they they have either come out of the private sector, like I've had the attorneys in my class right now wanting to get away from the private industry and serve the public. Mm -hmm. So in looking at the leadership component, I do have a question regarding, you know, like she was talking about the first year students coming in, but we still have to identify some type of motivation piece mm -hmm. students, right because students can come into classrooms and they are there and they don't really understand why they're there but but you also have students that come in they know why they're there they want to serve the public but I wonder if we can also maybe think about pulling those together like the public service component we call it in in our you know it's public service motivation like you're there to serve you're motivated to serve mm -hmm. no matter the barriers that may be in the place like social justice no matter you know if if you're, you're trying to move things forward, but there may be some barriers that may prevent you from moving things forward, right? But they need to still be motivated. So we still have to put that component in there some way. I don't know how you would block that or combine that, but you still got to be motivated to do what you do because otherwise you're going to get disappointed because, I mean, there's not money flowing. I'm talking from a perspective. There's not money flowing saying we're going to fund this, we're going to fund this project, this project. Mm -hmm. You still got to be motivated to just keep pushing. So, um, and I'm going to ask this question because I was thinking about it when you were I'm um, talking earlier, how do you motivate students to come in and serve, whether it's nonprofits or any other program that is serving the public in, in order to community in general? Yeah, uh, I guess before I answer that, I feel like, you know, Catherine, you might have with the public service motivation, that was something that from the MPA, you know, we, we heard about pretty often, just wanted to see if you had anything you wanted to share before we kind of feel that question. Yeah, I was talking before you got here from the IFSC HMP Um and I am an alum of the MPA program, um, and I was talking about how in the MPA program we talk a lot about informal, I, because the majority of the students are either currently engaged in service or plan to engage in service, uh, and leadership, um, in terms of public management, and so what I was excited to do in this is to get intensive and see how we can make these direct connections between CBL um, and maybe, I hate to kill two birds, 
for the students in terms of being like, here's other opportunities and training and leadership and connections on campus. And I've been in classes where they like recommended the former CBL. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, if you're interested in leadership and service, you should check out the CBL. And they give you more information about different opportunities. Um, and we've also connected community partners to the CBL in terms of saying like, thank you for coming to our class and speaking. You know, please connect with um, the CBL office um, so that we can formalize this relationship uh, between the campus and um, But to echo Shay's point, <laughs> this needs to have really clear language for faculty members, but also for the students to understand like what there's especially public servants <laughs> are overburdened. Um, and so when you say, oh, you should volunteer, you should do more stuff, I think often the reaction from both faculty members and students is, this is just one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So kind of <laughs> showing the flexibility, mm -hmm. the different components of the program, how this can be beneficial both to the student experience, but also to the faculty members in terms of helping them have more resources and guidance uh, would be great. I think this is also one of those points too where our office can offer a definition broadly of CBL and leadership and how this all works and motivation for students, but it's also going to be different in each class. Yeah. So for instance, I teach a first year writing course and one of the writing scholars articles that we read at the beginning of the semester is on active citizenry. And the frame of the article is about public writing projects. So ideally in a public writing project, you'll identify a public issue, a specific audience, and start to connect what you're doing in the community to ideally the research you're doing in the classroom or the academic work that you're doing, and then create a public facing project that addresses some issue related to the community learning. My students, the big thing that I emphasize throughout the semester is, and this is an article we read in the maybe third day of class, and then we come back to it in maybe week 11, leading into finals, because it's their final project. Like what is the public writing project that you want to do? How are you going to Think about making clear your active citizenry and where you are in progress to an outside audience. So for them, they've been thinking about through reflection, through different things that are required in a CB class, which we're going to get into mm -hmm. shortly, how all these things connect. Part of it's going to be, it is going to be different in each class. And that's one thing that we want to emphasize. CBL is interdisciplinary and it's going to look different depending on your student cohort, your program. The same way I might talk about this to first year students who are figuring out who they are in DC and at AU while they're managing roommate problems and their econ class or AUX is gonna be very different than say, Garrett Grady Lovelace who's teaching seniors who are in a capstone project with a much better idea of the kind of work that they wanna do and what their motivation is. Yeah, to, to kind of pull from also, you know, an example something that we've seen over the last year. So we had our largest CSLP cohort, it was 63 students this past semester across every single school across um, over a dozen different majors and every grade level in the undergraduate side. So when we're thinking of service learning, it's really easy to kind of think of, oh, this is the individual that would uh, self-select into a program like this. But in order for us to really show that this is something that's really inclusive and that can be um, accessible to a diverse population, it's about the idea of that motivations aren't uh, while they, while it's important to ensure that there's a balance between intrinsic and extrinsic motivations, that their motivation for doing CSLP isn't only for that additional credit, it's also about making sure that students who never maybe have served before understand what's in a way in it for me. And that's a big thing that we teach during our orientation is that sometimes we have students and this kind of is what we see at AU as a predominantly white institution is that students maybe have this conception of service as, oh, I am only going into a community to help them. Not realizing and taking into account the privilege that they have going into the community and what they're getting out of it too. So speaking from kind of my own experience as someone who is a child of immigrants, Indian American, um, our, I think, motivation towards service wasn't naturally as ingrained, let's say, as how it is within other faith communities even. And so because of that, like we're oftentimes pushed towards things that have an extrinsic motivation. Personal reflection is one of the key ways to develop an intrinsic motivation. So we may, and this is kind of what I aim to do in my presentation is say, whether you're interested in understanding the purpose behind the academia that you're studying, whether you want to see DC more and get involved with the communities there, 
whether you want professional development skills and leadership development skills, resume building experience, et cetera, whether you want to meet with more people and understand how diverse experiences work, all of these different aspects come up through a community-based learning experience. So there is not really like, while there may be individual motivations that students get during the process, I would say like reading these reflections, it's really fun to see a student who honestly just signed up because they were exposed to it or, you know, maybe someone they knew was doing it or maybe they liked what we said. They needed one more credit to graduate. Yeah, exactly. They need one more. Yeah, and then, and then it changes when they're reflecting on it, um, why they continue to do it. And I think that's one of the huge, like, honestly benefits of, of CBL from like that really personal exploration experience. So um, that's, I think, something else we, we definitely want to balance in is making sure that students have that moment to reflect on what is their intrinsic motivation and not only what other things that they're getting from it. So I think we're going to transition, um, sorry, to defining community-based learning. Uh, do we have one more quick question here? And one question just to add, I really, really uh, appreciate what you're saying, Sandra, because, you know, so part of it is that you're going to become a better ex researcher, practitioner, hmm. right? Student, hmm. when you think about all these skills and you need all the algorithms and the of thinking, emotional intelligence, connecting to communities, whether you're a community as a community practice or a community as an organization. Policymakers or you know, a global partner, a local partner, whatever it is. So, to sort of also frame it as that is part of the process of your own personal and also professional career development. I think it's really key. And I utilize myself as an example, right? So, as a researcher who's inspired both in the community and in the academia, like that makes me a better researcher. I'm asking more meaningful questions. You know, I'm engaging, I'm learning new things um, that I wouldn't otherwise say if I was just in my office, for example, so that I should say, you know, well, they're in outside of the company. And I think a lot of them get it because once they have these experiences, whether it's internal, I don't appreciate the person saying it, but it is like um, inside the community and maybe you see where it starts and then it sparks an external connection mm -hmm. the other way around. I think they can it's sort of like the proof that then there's more proof, right? Absolutely. They realize their own learning process that like, yeah, this process. And they learn it's an active it's learning process, exactly. that they're always they're in progress. Engaged, right? they're, they're actually engaging the things to whatever they're learning, hopefully also in the past, right? It's connected to what they're also experiencing. Mm -hmm. right? And that they're also able then to connect with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, almost like yeah. the way that we engage with uh, first gen students in a way where sometimes maybe a first gen student comes and thinks, oh, it's only for getting a better job or having a degree that I go to a university when you realize it's so much more than that. Once you're actually in it, I think that similar kind of marketing of, hey, what's it mean to be a first gen community engagement practitioner, you know, is that kind of same thing. And honestly, with you all as faculty, staff, supporters of CBL, this is hopefully going to be something that we carry forward as like a torch together, you know, as a first time practitioners, a lot of us. All right, so let's define community-based learning. Ooh, sounds good. Um, so, and also talk about um, why community-based learning exactly. as well. If I could get the arrow with me. Okay, there we go. So um, how uh, we defined uh, community-based learning, it's on the screen here. Um, if you could just sit and I'll, I'll read through it, but kind of ponder through this as we prepare for this next section of our conversation today. Um, community-based learning is fundamentally an academic endeavor in which engagement in projects and activities takes place through reciprocal and mutually beneficial partnerships with the greater community design to advance the, the public good. Um, it shows up in different ways, which we'll talk a little bit more um, in, in detail um, here shortly as well. But I'm, because of time, I'm going to move us um, to this reflective moment um, and, and want you to think about like, how do you currently define, how do you define community-based learning and your teaching practice and how might this definition evolve after today's discussion? You think about it real quick, and I think probably just we're going to continue to move 
Um, yeah, yeah you can, I forgot so about that, yeah. space and then we're going to have a group reflection discussion moment too later on. So uh, feel free to yeah, take a moment to write something now. Think about that a little bit more. All right. So uh, again, we kind of honestly just talked through a fair bit of this, but I wanted to mention that when it comes to the benefits of community-based learning, as well as the challenges, they're widespread. They're across different stakeholder groups, but they're also unique to each of these stakeholder groups. So when it comes to our students, uh, it allows them an opportunity to explore the DMV area and feel a sense of belonging in communities that maybe are new to them, or they didn't realize exist within DC. When it comes to um, students as well, I'll go down kind of the students list first. It's connecting their theory to something that's applied or practical. Uh, it allows, sorry, it makes visible entry level work experiences and internships. I think this is a big kind of charge of my own is to feel like within DC, we have actually over 14,000 nonprofits. And oftentimes when students are thinking about what that entry level career looks like, nonprofits isn't really something that comes to their mind. Yet we have this kind of competitive advantage within the city to show that there is a really great way to get this experience and to actually have a real leg up because everybody is an AU, it's going for an internship. What makes something maybe more distinct is something like working within a nonprofit in this kind of community first fashion. Uh, it's providing opportunities for more community leadership. So we have other programs like the Eagle Endowment, for example, where students can apply for a grant of up to a thousand dollars to take what they're doing with the community partner and put it into action, be real project leaders themselves. So something like that is opportunities for additional community leadership um, and building skills for student thriving. So that's kind of what we just discussed with everything from uh, professional development skills, leadership, et cetera. When it comes to faculty, it's more engaged classroom. You have more synthesis with learning outcomes. You prepare students to be academic citizens. And it's a sustainable structure, something that's repeated. And depending on your style or the way you would like to teach your CDL course, we could have partners who you can work with semester over semester and projects that you can repeat, or we can have it where it's a little bit fresh or new every semester. It's totally your choice as a CDL faculty, and we're there to find a partner that fits that need. Uh, with the community's perspective, there's enhanced visibility and recognition. Uh, it's a pipeline for recurring volunteers. We try and ensure that when we develop a partnership, they're not kind of left out. Um, as we move forward in semesters. And ideally we want the student volunteering at least one semester. Exactly, and like when a student is exposed in a CBL class, you know, they'll hear about some of the op other opportunities like CSLP or Evo Endowment or other programs that create condition or continuity within volunteering and service learning. So there's kind of, yeah, that I fly. Uh, increased capacity to address needs and challenges. Just yesterday I was on this AI panel and something that came up with nonprofits is like this idea that corporations, they have R&D budgets, they can be on the cutting edge of what's next. Nonprofits, if they get extra capacity, if they get extra money, where's it going? It's to the community that they're impacting, it's to their programming. So students sometimes allow for this really next uh, set of leaders or what projects look like moving forward. And the other thing that we've learned since COVID Many nonprofits, especially people that we partner with for years, have lost their adult volunteers or volunteers 22 plus because everyone's lives have changed so dramatically during COVID that they're more dependent on the volunteers and it's harder to retain volunteers. Um, yeah, no money that used to be spent on like things like uh, community engaged programs where students could get paid to work within the community. We've seen that kind of decrease. It's we're hoping to make it come back. You know, that's some of the things that we're lobbying for generally, but. Uh, we're seeing that reduction after COVID of, of adult volunteers. For AU as an administration, uh, it, it supports inclusive excellence for faculty. So this is actually something that during our community of practices we'll likely talk more about is that inclusive excellence has a big priority for AU. I really see community-based learning as a key portion of that. And the more that we have faculty and staff saying the same thing that CBL is the type of way to achieve inclusive excellence as an institution, um, because we hear about it in our faculty community practices that scholarship within CDL is oftentimes under recognized. So if we bring that up as an equity issue, that's maybe another way where we can get some support in. And not to ignite everyone's anxiety over the dreaded elements and merit, but different units are looking at this and how it's measured and how faculty are getting credit for this work. So 
It aligns to our change makers in the changing world strategic plan. So that highlights things like experiential learning, like putting service first, like creating connections within the community. All of these things happen naturally through CDL. It promotes our efforts as an anchor institution where we're uh, creating inroads within DC and showing that we're not apart from DC, but a part of DC. And it creates a foundation for the Carnegie, Carnegie classification. Uh, which is something that I know a lot of us have kind of discussed or talked about. It's a way to kind of uh, take a lot of the data that we're starting to collect and formalize it into something that would raise our prestige as an institution. Um, I will say that that's not really within the short term horizon uh, due to the amount of extra capacity and work it would take, but it is something that we're hoping to build for that future. Um, before uh, Amanda talks a little bit more about the faculty experience, I just want to mention some of what the challenges that each of these stakeholder groups might be facing are. So for students, they need to log their hours and also reflect on their experience. We just talked about why intrinsic motivation is so important within CBL. So that's kind of where the reflection happens. It's really easy and you know, kudos to our faculty who really ingrained this within their final presentations or their uh, impact logs. But having students reflect on their service right after is something that we kind of have to keep diligent about. And students aren't really gonna like it at the beginning, but I, this is a little key piece of data from CSLP. I asked them to rank all of their assignments that they did within the cohort. And the number one, their favorite assignment was actually the personal reflection that they did at the beginning of the semester. That came from Garrett, who's gonna be presenting at the panel in the middle. Um, but that's just something where students may not like to do a paper at the beginning or see that happen, but by the time they reflect on it or see that at the end, it really allows for that full circle moment to happen. Uh, students must be responsive and agile to community partners' needs. This is something that building up students' capacity to ask for what they are kind of, um, so we can have this participation agreement, how are community partners told what students are doing over the duration of the semester, making sure that students are advocating to adhere to that plan as well as we're training partners on like not uh, getting stressed and then, you know, uh, being disorganized when it comes to an anticipated experience and then how that might change over time. Um, and then I think that's actually the, the last one too, the struggle with time management communication skills. I think you could even throw like transportation into this category as well as one of the big uh, challenges we for students. From the community, some partners may feel like it's a little bit more transactional. One of the ways we mitigate that is by trying to create something that is long lasting. What we've kind of now done that's a little bit new is put partners into two buckets. One is affiliates and the other is community partners. So nonprofit affiliates are ones who are maybe having a short-term need for community-based learning. They don't necessarily have the capacity to maintain a long-term community partnership. So that's maybe a way that we engage certain partners for just a semester and that's okay. It doesn't feel transactional to them. It feels like an honoring of what it is that they expected. But if we do that same process for a community partner, which expects a long-term commitment, that we, we are prioritizing, making sure they're not left out of the lurch there. Um, that kind of goes onto that second one on students who mm -hmm. be for a semester. And partners must verify the hours are reported. This is big within our academic integrity code. Uh, as we develop the support and structure with the Dean of Undergraduate Education, it's just even more and more important that students are logging in their hours and that partners are verifying them. So we're working with both GW, who engages a lot of our same partners within the DMV, as well as uh, Spurt Local, which is an association of over 500 nonprofit members within the DMV to do trainings on gift bowls and set up structures so that it's not an additional task for partners to verify those hours. At the moment, I'll be completely transparent. It's, it's been like, we just got gift post nine, 10 months ago um, as like a full system. So it's new for everybody. Not everyone's gonna be consistent on it just yet. And but it's an outside system that AU has to pay extra money for yeah. and there are different packages. So we only got the new system in at the very beginning of September. Yeah. Yeah. So like with that, you know, it's just a thing on training and having patience with everybody and making sure that when something is difficult, we don't just almost like let it slide, but holding it, like letting us know, hey, there's a gap here. Like it doesn't have to be your problem. That's why I really want to stress the community partnership piece. Like know that that's what we're here for as a resource, as an office is that if you're noticing, hey, my partner doesn't really understand CBL or GivePulse, send them out like 
let let me know and I'll I'll be my priority. Um, for American University, I think we can kind of skip past some of those challenges because right now there's maybe bigger institutional ones, but uh, making sure that we're just supporting the training, having the budget really to do it, that's really what that we challenge boils down to. We'll chat about this briefly later, but for instance, uh, we have a new president coming in. Uh, I think Larry and maybe a couple others in this room are also on the Senior Governance Faculty Senate Working Group, but several of us learned from Vicki Wilkins on Monday that we may be doing a new strategic plan in July. Um, and we will, we've will. we also been told that we may not know about the Working with Washington budget, uh, which funds community funding lift grants, the faculty micro grants, and the honorariums, and the support that Kyle and I are providing to the office until June or July also. So again, if American University wants to support community-based learning, then they need to be more transparent about this and communicate this sooner. Um, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of the faculty points, but I do believe after teaching community learning classes since 2011 as an adjunct and then transitioning to full-time faculty, and now three of my six classes every year community learning, it does create a more engaged classroom. There is a deeper motivation to do your work instead of just the focus on grades and the more transactional approach that students, especially early college students, may have towards their education. Uh, there is a synthesis with learning outcomes. Sometimes there is pushback, especially from administrators who are well-meaning that community-based learning does not fit in with out learning outcomes. And I would argue actually community-based learning, if you think about common learning outcomes throughout courses, communication, thinking about integrative learning outcomes and complex problems, if you're thinking about real-world solutions or implications, most certainly I think our work does have synthesis with the learning outcomes. Uh, we're preparing our students to be academic citizens. I keep coming back to this definition of academic citizenry. Uh, it's something we see in community-based learning. It's something we see in writing studies. But I do believe we have an obligation to train our students to be more than just researchers and scholars. They need to be active citizens in our communities and be thinking about how the choices they make in the classroom can translate to the outside world, too, even thinking about Lolita's point earlier. Um, there is a sustainable structure that makes class personally enriching to teach. I think about when I do my own lesson planning at the beginning of each week, how am I gonna build in formal reflection? It might be in those great assignments, but also the five, 10 minutes beginning of class to warm up to get our heads in that space. That's an informal reflection for the things that have happened during community science and to figure out how it's tying into their academic learning. Um, I do think, especially when we create final projects that tie together the academic learning and the community-based learning at the end of the semester, that's when it really comes together for our students. Um, and it may also be a slower learning process for some students, and that's okay. We have heard from students, especially when they get to sophomore, junior year, they've realized the value of what they did earlier on. Uh, I will be honest, it does require pre-semester planning. So one of the things I struggle with right now, especially as a faculty fellow, it feels wild to tell faculty what we know will let you know, but it's really hard to plan your fall class if you don't know if you have that support from working with Washington to make that happen. Uh, whether it's paying for your students lifts to Virginia or to board seven or eight, or to pay for those student projects at the end of the year. I really hope we don't have to go back to the world without this funding, but I'm emotionally prepared for whatever the outcome is. Um, additionally, pre-semester planning, you have to have those partnerships lined up as soon as possible. You can do a little bit of that on the fly, but the more that you can be transparent with your students about scheduling, timing, all of this, the better. And the more that we learn about who our students are now at this during, post, whatever point of we are at COVID, the more that we realize that they need training and support to manage their time, to manage their assignments, and to not procrastinate. We're also thinking too, we do want to provide sustainable volunteers over the whole semester. So I experienced this for the first time this semester in maybe 12 years, uh, but I had several students this semester ghost to community partner once they finish their 20 hours, which is awful. But if they've been procrastinating on logging their gift pulse hours, and I, I have gift pulse set up as a complete incomplete hour grade in Canvas, then I need to be thinking about structure-wise, how can I change that for fall to eliminate that? Um, because it has been clear in things like the syllabus, and I can hold them accountable grade-wise, but I also don't want to do that to the community partner. So again, all the different ways of pre-semester planning, it does get a little more complicated. You can tie yourself up in knots, but at the same time, it's better for the students and the community partner. Um, it does require training on interpersonal issues arising from DEI-related commitments. Um, this is something that we've experienced in pretty much almost every single community-based learning course that I've had, and it's 
not always with white students, um, but it often comes from, from some of the most privileged students in the class, especially as we look at how expensive it is to attend American University, that we are a PWI and that we are tuition driven and in this budget crunch. I think these are very real concerns that we may be talking about more and be explicit about how we're teaching our students. Um, Backward design, it takes a lot more work, but again, reading CBL into the course, it's not an add-on to the course. So again, if you're thinking about my big thing, not to sound like someone who's gone to many AU core and faculty trainings, but backward design. If you think about your learning outcomes and then what are the major assignments that help you meet those learning outcomes, and then how do you start to scaffold and sequence the course to support student learning throughout the semester? I, I also have one question for the audience. So. Um... Raise your hand if you're a faculty and keep your hand raised if you're an adjunct faculty. Okay, so I think about half of the new faculty who we have in this room today are adjunct faculty as well. There are different difficulties or challenges that you know pose to adjunct versus term versus tenure. So as you know, as we're in this journey of starting up your first CBL experience, please do let me know. I will be completely transparent. I have no idea what it's like to be an adjunct term, et cetera, faculty. So educate me, let me know what are your unique challenges as an adjunct or any type of faculty member. And um, we'll try and figure out how to, again, uh, take account of that unique challenge. Yeah, Larry. I have a couple of um, observations, if I may. Uh-huh, yeah. Related to the strengths and challenges. And also a comment on um, how much I admire adjuncts who come to even a, a workshop. Um, given that it's a union. Getting free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I would argue you paid for that lunch. <laughs> pay for it. Hopefully, there'll be something yeah. coming in the fall or summer with our new president. But um, I, I just want to note my appreciation as a tenured faculty member when I. Um, and in a room with adjuncts who don't aren't paid to be here, mm -hmm. and I appreciate it. And I wonder if even within our uh, financial situation that we find ourselves in, if there can't be a note from um, our leadership that there ought to be some consideration for compensation. Uh, for adjuncts who do take on these works. Um, I'm so. going to add that to my list, uh, my wish list, if we aren't asked yeah. to be involved in strategic planning in the summer. Yes. Um, can we talk about that? Yeah, and actually for, for first time adjunct workshop attendees who are in this room, um, no, I'm gonna follow, that's part of the notes I've been taking. I'll follow up with you all afterwards too. And maybe there is a way we can talk through compensation. I, again, don't want to promise anything at this moment, but um, traditionally speaking, we've tried to account for that within this type of six hour workshop. So definitely, yeah. A couple other things. One, I take note that I am the only privileged white male and old white male in this room. Thank you for naming it. Uh, I love um, but I do think that um, that's a structural problem <coughs> that needs to be addressed in some fashion. So that's another note. Um, I, I think that the strengths um, in terms of looking at faculty is that this, it's, this is one experiential learning. So it's not just community-based. And if AU emphasizes experiential learning, which I know in SOC, SIS, everywhere we do, we live in a world that needs help. Um, so I think emphasizing experiential learning is important. Also, it focuses on the scholar teacher model that is foundational to AU that had some challenges going to R1, um, and we'll see what happens with the new. Uh, president. Um, so again, uh, framing, I think, uh, to, um, in, in those fashions. And then one note on grading, um, and this is maybe a little far afield, but for four years, I have abandoned points and grades. 
I, I am a firm advocate of ungrading. And in the CB model, that works brilliantly mm -hmm. because the work that the students do and the revisions that they make are strictly based on feedback from client or partners and faculty and peers. And I see a complete change at the undergraduate and graduate levels um, in the ability of the students to listen and revise. Mm -hmm. That's and that definitely my takes morning, my morning comment. Thank you for those observations. It takes the that motivation there from that extrinsic to more intrinsic, just based off of that grading model. All right, a few other hands. Do we? Yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's go, uh, Gabrielle. Um, yeah, so I have a question about this backwards design, um, but I was hoping to talk about a little bit more. So like if we're looking to expand the number of offerings of these types of courses, um, some professors might want to integrate it into a course that they already have that already exists. So being mindful of that sort of backward design that you're trying to promote, how, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. So I think, especially if you're trying to revise an existing course, backward design can still work. But again, you have to think about the learning outcomes. This is where my students ideally like what they need to achieve. They need to at least have some level of mastery towards these learning outcomes to pass the course, no matter what grading model you're using. Um, I would say look at the final assignments and how do you start to weave and clean based on that. So for instance, uh, think about Larry's idea right now on revision. <clears throat> In my final project for my writing class, they could weave in, in that public writing project, the research and community-based learning they did this semester. They could just focus on the community-based learning. They're doing a similar public writing project or a vision project that other writing classes might do, but I am looking at the community-based learning as the experiential research. And that's how I bring it to you guys. So I think too, like asking faculty, we're not, I don't think it involves reinventing the wheel or the entire course. I think do believe it does require some intentionality and some creativity. Um, you are going to have to revise assignment sheets. You're going to have to look really deeply at your grading. Um, with my community-based learning final projects and writing and complex problems, it is a labor-based rubric for the final grading. And they get the feedback, but they've also gotten the feedback throughout the semester on earlier drafts of the assignment, one-on-one uh, -on -one conferences, and small group work in class too. So backwards design really thinks like, where do we want to end up? And then how do I start to scaffold the course? And in theory, most faculty are probably already doing this. It might be more or less explicit. I have noticed the longer that you teach a certain course, the harder it is sometimes to wrap your head around this. So. This is where CBL faculty trainings can really come in handy. So, you know, that's something that's a nice specific topic. 90 minutes is where, you know, we could potentially figure out how we could instruct that or teach that sort of thing. I think collaboration as being the really key component, if an entire division, department, et cetera, is interested in increasing the amount of CBL courses that are offered, helping us out with setting up like what is a dedicated time or a time that we could then host something like that and giving us some notice that we could then maybe speak with some of our partners, whether it's through AU, whether it's through GW or elsewhere. And you know, depending on the funding that we have, hopefully if we have the funding, then Amanda would stay with us. We can continue to do faculty trainings from, from that lens too. But I think that's the difficulty for us is reaching out, like getting all the faculty together in a room. Uh, so I think that's where the department support would come, you know, so much in handy. Uh, one last thing real quick too, and I wanna to get to Stephanie and Shay also. Uh, the community practice page that we have, we also have example syllabi, but again, this is the challenge of community learning. It's going to look different every single class. So the more people that are teaching community-based learning courses, if you can send me <laughs> materials that you would like to share with folks, um, we can also be clear about how much people could borrow or adapt. That would be great. Um, we're looking at the summer building out the example projects because that's been the big thing that faculty are often struggling with. Like, what's the project looks like? What do the assignment sheets look like? What could students create? And often it's looking at what other students have created and then that's where the backward design comes in. They're like, okay, if student did X, Y, Z, how could I get my students doing something similar or how could I adapt this based on my own discipline? Yeah. 
sorry, I'm done. So we'll do uh, Stephanie, Susan, Shay, and then we'll do a small break um, and then come back. Um, so a couple things, I, you know, I think a lot of us are uh, focused on how to expand the number of classes yeah. that are doing this. So I guess one comment would be, if you're making faculty revise their learning outcomes, I think that's a really big obstacle because a lot mm -hmm. of us- We like can't learning require outcomes. that. What? We can't require that. Yeah, Academic so units require that. Backwards plan. I'm assuming you have learning outcomes from your unit. Oh, I mean, you have, well, it's, no, often it's just for your course. Okay. You develop your own learning outcomes for your course and probably most of the things. I've never been given learning outcomes. Uh, I think it depends on each course. So, so for instance, yeah, I know AU4 revise. courses or different things, for instance, College of Arts and Sciences, I know there's a lot of planning about learning outcomes, we can't change the learning outcomes. Right. So okay, that so might be different existing, from other courses. Yeah, but if we have existing learning outcomes that we're happy with, I think um, my understanding is we could incorporate new learning to help. Most well, certainly, yes. Okay, I yeah. just want to make sure yeah. you're saying. And I guess the other thing is, um, kind of getting back to your question before that we were supposed to reflect upon is what mm. is the community that we're talking about? Mm. You know, I'm seeing nonprofits logging hours and all of those things that fit some courses really well, but say, you know, we had four courses in my program serving the state department this last semester, mm -hmm. you know, definitely not a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, but if we're defining the greater community, mm -hmm. um, and if we have classes on U.S. foreign policy and things like that, and students want to work in think tanks and government, um, I mean, would those still qualify as community-based learning when we're serving a government entity? I'll, I'll, again, be completely honest. I think past, right, as CSETs, we had that discussion. We were the place on campus for engagement within the DMV community that was ingrained in our mission statement. It was something that we would really try and stand by. So we would, even if there were nonprofits outside of DC or the DMV area, we would be more restrictive on that. I think now we're in a spot where it's like from a service learning pedagogical standpoint, what you're saying is absolutely correct. And I think I've within CSLP allowed for us to get a little bit out of that, but the more we can promote that in DC, getting out into the community connection, seeing the area that surrounds them, the better. When it comes to things like US Department of State, et cetera, which is in DC, I think that there are good opportunities there. And I'm thinking even, you know, it's not to say that there aren't campus partners that even operate in like more of a community organized fashion. It's just about being at a point selective and we have to be very intentional about our language because having heard this from students, like it just ends up being something where we set a kind of procedure on how we evaluate, is this a community organization? And then like we hear from a student saying, oh, well, I like was with, uh, you know, Hillel or the gardening club or like name like four different organizations. And they're just, um, we had a student like recently try and submit a reflection for going to AmFest, the music festival and said, oh, well, I was surrounded by people, that's community. And they're like, well, you should have made that more specific, right? This is like a, yeah, exactly. Like, Legitimate thing to happen like two we weeks. To, to figure out because I think most of us think of more traditional community-based learning, nonprofits, or I'm even thinking my SIS students. My SIS students love to use the phrase NGO for mm -hmm. every nonprofit, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't think is accurate for every nonprofit. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is something we need to be thinking about more clearly. Like so currently, would, what I'm talking about doesn't really fit because it's not their logging hours doing community service. It's more doing assignments that serve that community as a policy paper or something like that. Um, so I think this is one of the bigger conversations we need to get into. Yeah. 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 But I think yeah. too, like we've also talked before, there's the project-based models is why I want to pull up this slide. Um, there's sometimes a misunderstanding that CDL classes only have to be direct service hours. And especially when we get into higher level courses, there are so many project-based courses. I know this is true in SIS and school communication, for instance. So we do really want to emphasize this, that this is, again, the challenge with CBL. We can define it, but then there are so many different caveats and bullet points there to qualify some of these statements. Can you remove that pad? Yes. I'm on. And then, you know, we we continue to do CBL even during COVID. So we know remote opportunities that actually changed our whole way of how we looked at what does it mean to actually engage within a community. Um, Josie, I think, has yeah, probably seen I was just going to say also to your point, Stephanie, about, um, about the State Department example. I think, like, the broad, from a project standpoint, that's super in line with, like, what other classes are doing. But I think, like, one of the underlying things that we 
originally had in what the purpose of community service or learning like was or community learning was was to identify a part of the community that students are already in but not necessarily connected with and to mm -hmm. increase that connection mm -hmm. and that like the idea i think like at au especially like half of everyone i know wants to work in the state department or like you know some branch of government etc and and it's like well that's awesome if you can go out and serve your you know global community um but what are you doing in your own backyard and in, in starting on a smaller like scale i guess is maybe yeah like is it coming from the community um and so i think that that's part of how we had made that like you know distinction earlier not that that has to stay per se but was, you know, is this a community, a part, like, are you already a part of this community, but you just need to get in touch with it? Like, we're all a part of the DMV community. Um, or, and maybe we're all part of, um, like, a global service community in a way, too. Or, um, but that that was a kind of a basis for how we made that distinction previously. I, I also think about it in that power dynamic way, too. It's like with something where what's really nice about a lot of the ways nonprofit partners that we are selective about is that the work that they're doing is based within the community. It's not necessarily offshoots from governmental organizations that maybe aren't being responsive, like community action agencies specifically. So like a community action agency is a great example of maybe something that started off as like, a, hey, there was just money available. Let's figure out how we're actually getting the community involved in that like the suggestions, the work, et cetera, is coming from them. So I think that's just another little like layer to be mindful of is, are we just considering nonprofit work as anything that's not their for profit purpose? Because we have B Corps, for example, that we've partnered students with that are doing really great work that are coming from the community. It's just sure they have like a small profit lens, but that doesn't disqualify them. So I think that's from my personal point of view, some of what we hinge that decision on is like, is this AU's community garden that's just run by AU students? It just has community in its name, but really the community isn't the actual, like outside of AU community isn't being involved or is it truly coming from it? Um, that's one of the key distinctions that- It's easy to look you know, outside of your community and see problems that you want to help fix, but then you know, starting that locally is, is also important, but maybe the way to phrase that is like the State Department, you know, people in the State Department are a part of our community, right? They're living here locally. And if we're helping them do their work more efficiently, and we're looking at like internal processes for State Department stuff, then maybe that's, you know, maybe that is more- Yeah, being specific about the friends, community. More yeah. Like community. Yeah, all right. So I wanna make sure that we're sticking with our time. So let's go again. Yeah, I have a lot of comments that I, yeah. I will not make. I have one question. Um, what's our institutional relationship with the Corporation for National Community Service? Gosh, what a great question. <laughs> All right, so this is something- ready for graduate dissertation. No, this is, <laughs> this is just something it's evolved so much over time. So I used to work within the student capacity at AU and we had these VISTA workers. We uh, worked more closely with them after we just had capacity issues. And um, after 2018, 19, we kind of lost some of the connections there. I've gone to a few of the meetings since, but I, I don't think we have really someone who's taken up that role of trying to create that relationship back. So another example of, we used to have funding available through something called the Public Service Work Program public service work study program, something like that, sorry. And there was funds available for students who were working within nonprofits um, that was given through an external body. We didn't have any capacity within our office to continue to administer that. So now we don't have that funding. These are things that we're hoping to reclaim now with hopefully increase, like increased dedication on our staff side, as well as um, you know new, new leadership. I think when Melanie was mentioning the fact that I've only been here like two years and I'm the second most senior person within the office. Transition has been a huge part of it. And so a lot of those great things we had maybe five years ago, we have to get back. So that's kind of how I'm viewing it is like, how can we make sure we're getting some of the first sources of funding and then let's 
maybe get some of these things that are like one step away. Um, hopefully that answers yeah, it. Yeah, no, that gives me some background. Thank okay. you. I think there's room for vistas. I think there's room for recruitment and like, you know, consider a, a gap year career in national service, you know, that kind of thing for graduates and, and job preparation, especially folks that want to work mm -hmm. in the government. If they can do a year of AmeriCorps, I used to run to AmeriCorps programs in the 90s and in the 2010s. So I'm biased, um, but we're in DC, we're at American, so AmeriCorps <laughs> should definitely like play a bigger part, I think, in the consciousness of the campus, plus for community engagement and the professors like us that are trying to design, there are AmeriCorps programs that some students might even want to apply for a part-time AmeriCorps stipended position, like with a reading partners or something like that. But at the very least, they can volunteer with the AmeriCorps program. And the AmeriCorps members that are in the AmeriCorps programs are like looking to, for, to recruit volunteers. And then they can also learn how to come back to campus and recruit more volunteers, which is their leadership after they've you know, followed or, or done work. So I just think there's a really important I'm, I'm a big on national service, but I also think that this program, particularly as you're thinking through its evolution, and I'm happy to help, um, you know, should just incorporate the corporation. So, of, yes, the limitation does come back to also AU support. Uh -huh. uh, there did used to be more support around campus for AmeriCorps funded positions on campus. Right. That has dried up. The, the support has dried up? Yes. Or the, well, the funding administration. Yeah. It's from here, yes. Melanie, it's up to the president's office. office. Get into exactly. that president's office when yes. you're here And Great. until that, right? Because that's the top down approach. What I'm hearing within this energy in this room is the grassroots level of it, too. So we have department leaders, we have deans, we have a lot of really powerful actors within the room. So knowing that if capacity, and not to speak for, for you, Melanie, but like I don't imagine our office growing in staff size significantly anytime within this next year? Not within the next year. Yeah, yeah. but hopefully eventually. So like in the meantime, if, if you're you know within department discussions and you're like, oh yeah, there is, and this is where I don't know how it works, but say that there's other ways to provide that support within the academic affairs side, that might be a really great way for us to, yeah, collaborate and we can, we can help with like some of, what we can if there's also others taking the lead on it. We are working more with AU4 again, um, and Dean Trogdon is listening to us and partnering with us. But again, a lot of it hinges on, one, we need to know what the budget is, and two, we need to know what the new strategic plan is. So a lot of these things right now, I'm taking notes and making a wish list, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I'm going to do everything humanly possible to get us in the room when some of these decisions are made, but it does depend on the new administration. Thanks. We know we agree on all of these things. It's just getting a seat at the table. So last one, and then we'll go into a break. Um, just a quick note. It doesn't have to be discussion. We can circle back to it later. Just um, as we're talking about course design, learning outcomes and all of that. Um, thinking through how to communicate with EPCs. Um, is there looking Could you define, sorry, EPCs? I don't even know what it stands for. EPC educational policy. Committees? Committees? Gotcha. And it's different in each, each school. And mm -hmm. there are curriculum working groups that branch off and yeah. whatever. But that might be an opportunity. If you if you know there's interest, like there is interest in my department from faculty that are interested in incorporating it into courses, creating new courses, that is something that is buzzing for us. So coming to our curriculum working group meetings mm -hmm. to discuss how that, what that would look like, or uh, even communicating with some of the members on the EPC about what the, what the benefits are so that it's clear and the faculty doesn't have to be the solo you know, drum beater to why this is a good thing. That would make a huge difference, I think, mm -hmm. in changing the culture around the academic uh, <coughs> evaluation of community-based learning. I so love that like idea. Yes, yeah, yeah. that we've been pushing for. Mm. But there finally seems to be some energy heat and movement about. So. And are EPCs at the school level, department level, or division level? School level? Oh, I'm yeah. Level. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All the proposals created by the departments. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is great info. All right. It gets messy depending on each school, and each school has different policies. So we will have a larger break in about 45 minutes. So do we want to do a, a long a break? Lunch is en route. It's being delivered in two orders. 
So I know Lindsay's currently facilitating the first lunch delivery. Do we need a five minute break? And then at 12.45, we'll probably have like another 30 minute, 40, like 30-ish minute break for lunch. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna be breaking for lunch in about 15 to 20 minutes. So we're gonna start off with a little bit of a video. So uh, what we wanted to show is some of the students' perspective as well as faculty perspectives on YCBL. So this video is from Duke University. Experience. If this class wasn't a surface learning class, I think it would have been one of those classes where you just learn a bunch of statistics and like, you might hear a story or two, which is kind of like sad, but you'll, you'll forget about it. It's a very exciting thing for the students. And, and it gets more exciting as the course goes along, as they have more and more experiences of actually interacting with people who have lived experiences that relate to the subject matter they're reading. They're teaching you just as much as you're teaching them. The, what you're Yeah, but on this one, it's swapped. So I think that setting that we just fixed is causing that issue. So remember how there was that one, we just clicked it, it said swap. We should, because right now we only have, to, we have more in person. Okay, it's just here, is it still swapped? Let's see. There we go, okay. perfect. Oh, okay. Here it's, okay, thank you. We'll also include this in the video in the power. Service learning is pairing classroom knowledge with real world. So we'll share that video on it after. I think that's just going to be tough. Um, speeding through. Sounds good. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about like the why uh, before we, we get to lunch. Um, wanting to highlight, we, we know that community-based learning is a high-impact practice, and there's um, data and organizations and associations that back up that, that the fact that it is a high-impact practice, AACNU, um, they have a list and a set of high-impact practices and a little bit more information um, around those practices, and so community-based learning is um, highlighted um, by AACNU, and they have some data uh, data points around community-based learning and how it shows up on college campuses. So just a resource um, for sharing with you all. There's also the um, NESI data, the National Survey of Student Engagement, which is a, a really great um, tool that uh, American University uses to capture data from first-year students and um, seniors, uh, as well about their uh, points of engagement throughout their college or collegiate experience. Um, the unique thing is that there's a highlight around community engagement and community-based learning um, with the NISI uh, data and, um, and, and findings. And so uh, we'll share with you the report from American University um, from the class of uh, incoming 
sorry, where are we? I didn't say any of the semester. Um, it would have been, yeah, yeah, this um, particular first year class. And then, yeah, <laughs> seniors that have just graduated um, that highlight some key touch points, uh, naming the fact that uh, we're actually really in, in good alignment with other universities that they compare our institution to as a uh, as it relates to the US news and reports um, and how they align institutions, we are in alignment with community-based learning and practices um, of it being a high impact practice um, highlighted in that particular data set as well. And then uh, we talked about the National uh, Association for Colleges and Employers, NACE data that connects community-based learning, um, community engagement, leadership, all of those pieces um, to career readiness. And so there's some um, highlighted points specifically in that job outlook report, the 2024 um, job outlook, outlook report that also highlights community learning as high impact as well. So just wanted to highlight that, but we'll share those resources for you. Um, so you'll be able to kind of read a little bit later. And also we just added this last summer to the summer transition survey. So the incoming survey of first year students uh, as well as transfer students, data points around community engaged learning. So all that to say, we're gonna be getting more uh, information on what it is that connects, like are students motivated to do experiential learning, community engaged work, et cetera, from the incoming classes. So that's now new data that we have. Um, and even we can see it on a rating scale one to five and get a specific list of students who have said, oh, I'm really excited to do this within American University experience. And two, if there are data points that you all are looking for um, at any point during the year, if there's any um, form of assessment or data that we can um, pull for you all as it relates to AU students and their engagement um, with community-based learning or nationally, um, national data, let us know um, what you're looking for and we can do some digging and researching and connect the dots around that to tell the story, the beautiful stories of how this is definitely a high impact practice. So I filled this in like right before I didn't save, I guess. So uh, around this last year, 84 nonprofits, this was 998. I remember because it was so close to being over a thousand students at AU that we served. And then I believe this was um, over like 7,000, 8,000 hours uh, served in this just last year. So some of what I'm gonna show you, what's really cool about this is that actually for your class or for your department, you can create in gift polls, the reports I'm about to show you at the click of a button. So this is part of where showing the data back to students or to your department managers to just show the impact that they're having is really cool. This is a heat map of DC. This is a cluster map, how many impacts have happened over this last year within the different areas of DC. We notice a lot at AU, that's because sometimes students aren't really tagging their community partners or getting that verified. So that's a little bit- uh, Or the remote projects. Yeah, or remote projects. So a little bit maybe um, skewed towards that direction. Uh, this was actually an interactive map. We have this available if anyone wants to see our list of over 40 nonprofit partners for CSLP this last year, as well as um, where they're located. Okay, moving into theory. This is the speed portion. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and again, we'll have these resources available to you all um, in the uh, folder, SharePoint folder that we have. And of course, you'll have access to the slides. But we wanted to at least um, talk about and in this moment touch base on some of the community based theory and pedagogy that is used to frame um, what we do our work um, and continue to inform how we mo motivate our, our learning around community based. Um, um, or community engagement, sorry. So the theories that I pulled um, include cold uh, experiential learning theory. We have critical pedagogy um, pieces in there as well for you. Transformative learning theory, social change model of leadership, which I highlighted before. And that QR code is actually the SharePoint folder that uh, Amanda started for us that will have a lot of this work around pedagogy. Uh, related to um, community. I'm and, also and adding the PowerPoint there right now. Um, but we'll, we'll also, you'll, we'll email this to you. Uh, so you'll have all of this at your fingertips um, and in your inbox. So you can pull that information a little bit later. Also in the workbook, there's a couple of pieces that talk about some of the theories there too, but more information is available uh, that you can use for your own personal learning, but also share it in classroom experiences as well.
I do want to also highlight this mm. remarkable scholar, Dr. Tania Mitchell, who actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she has started already at the University of Maryland. Um, so she is close and maybe one day we can get her to come to, to AU. She has done a lot of work on inclusive practice as it relates to community engagement. Um, and so uh, I, I wanted to highlight specifically her work around transformative service learning. And I, I believe if it's not in the folder, we'll, we'll make sure it gets in there. There's a really great article uh, around, around this approach. 2008 article, which she talks about traditional versus critical service learning. And then the follow-up article that she wrote in I believe it's 2019 with her co-writer Lata about how this has changed over the years and what we still need to do. So, but really, really good scholarly work around the, uh, and again, like inclusive practice as it relates to community engage work right. and preparing our students. And when it comes to, you know, training faculty, again, that piece that we were just talking about with Gabrielle, where it's like, how can we ensure that the faculty who are interested in learning some of the theories behind this are provided an opportunity to do so? So over the summer, really what would help me out is if you're able to provide a list of faculty who you think are doing this work already, are interested in integrating it more formally, and we will then put them in an outreach list so that when we are hosting faculty trainings, whether on our campus, in association with GW, et cetera, that we can invite the right faculty there. That right now is our big limitation. It's not that we're not hosting events like this, it's that we'll put it out and we don't know if we have the right list that we're sending it out to because sometimes engagement is a little lackluster. So um, that would really help us out to have that. Who are the faculty who you think would really be interested in this if you're a staff member working with faculty? I'm gonna do this. Okay, I'm just all right. Okay, let's go. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm going to highlight this really quick, but CBL, uh, whether AU will reflect this in the strategic plan. Again, more to be known soon. Uh, it is actually captured in the current strategic plan. It spiked the number 2025. The current strategic plan ends June 30th, 2024. So, again, that's why we're waiting to find out about funding and strategic plan. There is increased support for experiential learning across the university. Uh, Stephanie Fisher is, of course, on the role of this, but there are different executive directors, associate deans, and directors across SIS, SOC, COGOD, and the faculty fellow in community leadership engagement to work on experiential learning. Uh, Bridget Trogna is also, we have found out, bringing some of the faculty senate in the next few months about experiential learning and community engaged learning and how we recognize this work across the university and how it's institutionalized. So we're hoping more support there. Uh, we have a number of different programs at AU. I just picked sort of the greatest hits. <laughs> community research scholars are now going to be the DC community impact scholars in the fall. So depending on what paraphernalia you're looking at, uh, you might see both names. The website, for instance, if you Google it, the title of the website says CBRS, but the actual website itself says DC Community Impact Scholars. So I want to highlight that. Uh, the public health scholars, community-based learning is built into the curriculum. Um, so where was Susan Comfort? But something especially for our health studies folks. And then we have a pro-cons partnership with the Latin American Youth Center Career Academy. Part of the working with Washington funding and support also supported two signature partnerships. One was with LAYCCA and the other was with Marcus Table. We have two pretty built out programs from COGOD and I'm highlighting the early education collaborative with Marcus Table, but the School of Education has a long history of supporting Marcus Table and that is a really considerable partnership that we're hoping can continue. Uh, and then in AU Core, last year I believe we had six complex problems courses that were community-based learning with AU core and complex problems. We do have to follow those specific learning outcomes. One of them is integrative learning, another is communication, another is about diverse perspectives. So for me, it's using complex problems PDL class. It's just a no-brainer. It clearly fits into those learning outcomes. Other faculty have noticed this. There does seem to be a higher number of courses in complex problems because of the learning outcomes. Uh, core capstones can also integrate community-based learning. So example, again, we'll hear from Garrett Grady Lovelace this afternoon, her SIS capstone is community-based learning. There's also a uh, film, Larry, help me out here, Laura Henson's community Laura documentary Henson, class. Yeah. Community documentary community class, voice community voice lab. Right. And then there's also an SOC, Gemma Puglisi's 
yeah. in our portfolio course. So again, for some reason, community learning does seem to be something, especially that capstone students are participating in, but we're often hearing from capstone students too, they wish they had access to these courses and knew more about them early on. So. Well, in, in that's a, also an SOC in some of the areas I mentioned earlier, um, our visual prerequisite for all production courses is visual literacy. Yes. I yep. designation. We have more students doing work in that class than the other classes. Yeah. Any other question. And yeah. we'll walk through in the second part of today's you know discussion examples of this so that we really put some kind of uh, exemplars on, on the stage here. With our um, AU values too, one of the things that's often under recognized is the US News and World Report has ranked AU as a top 20 service learning institution in the US. So it's something that definitely we should be resting our laurels on. And I think when it comes to the selection of the new president and even the first few words that he spoke to AU, service, community engagement, all of that is really in his, I think personally, his, his design for what uh, his vision is for AU. So we're going to just probably have a lot more spotlight on this if we are raising up that voice. It does seem out to us though, I mean, even if I'm thinking about the two examples we gave there, early core classes and the more that we can build out those middle core classes, so think habits of mind, um, some of the prereqs for the research classes, the better our students will get that community-based learning throughout the curriculum. Yeah, so what our office does is we facilitate the CV course designation process. So this is kind of one of these weird in-betweens where uh, we have this course designation form. That's the main thing that faculty need to do in order to have their course designated as community-based. I'm speaking yet extra loud, making sure everyone can hear, but like uh, if you are a faculty who's interested in teaching a community-based course, you can find it on our website. We have the link posted there. Oftentimes we're asked about what's the deadline for that. I'll be honest, we work directly with the course schedulers. The course schedulers are the ones who review those forms, reach out back to the faculty and to uh, anyone else who needs to approve it, and then finalizes it. Sometimes that process is very quick. Sometimes that takes a longer time. So when it comes to designating your class as CB, if you have the structure, the framework, if you feel comfortable that you're meeting the eight criteria, which will be on the next slide, then fill out the form and send me an email. I will follow up and make sure that your course is designated. What does designation do? It allows you to get some of the resources from CLCE. And it also, this is the big important thing with this new gift post automation that we now have, is your course will be designated as CB. It will create a gift post page for your course. All that data that I was showing earlier, you will have an ability to do that. Your students will have their own page to track their hours to. Uh, you'll be able to connect with nonprofit partners through that page. It really sets you up to teach a true CBL experience that's integrated in the way that we really need to push this, to progress this work forward. So a lot of times faculty are maybe teaching with community-based practices, but they're not designated as a CB course. Sometimes that ruins the standardization of the experience for students and affects our data. So again, I can't stress that enough that designating your course as CBL, if you're planning on teaching with that pedagogy, is going to give you more support, your students better access, and us the data we need to get more funding and support for Your students can only apply for the LIFT grant, and you can only apply for back to micro grants with CB coded courses, and that's something that's built into the grant restrictions. Yeah. So sometimes it's been more informal on teaching it, but let's let's make sure we formalize it. Um, all of the other parts here are things that can be found on our website. We can go to the next slide. Uh, with the eight criteria, also, again, this is on the actual application itself. I don't think we need to go directly through this. We'll hear even during the panel. What were some of the ways that faculty met these criteria within their course? In terms of course expectations, attendant orientation so you can learn how to use give posts and so that we can help you match with the partner if you don't have one in mind. Uh, sharing the syllabus with, sorry, that should be my email there, it might be blurred out, but uh, Um We have some surveys. So two to three surveys, it says three here, but sometimes it's just one at the beginning, beginning of the semester to make sure you're set up with a partner, that you've had an orientation on gift goals, really giving you the, the foundation you need to succeed. We have a check-in in the middle to make sure everything's going well, 
Uh, has the partner fallen through? Is everything going fine? And then when's your final presentation? And then one after your final presentation, just to ask, hey, how did everything go? What we're thinking is redoing that one and making that more of a community partner evaluation so that we're not asking you for more, but maybe engaging with the partner that you're working with to get some more information from them. Uh, we, we do like to attend the final presentations which detail your semester's work. We can attend those virtually in person. This is again, where you can uh, ask for funding for you, the deliverables that your students are creating. Or so think if you're using the poster maker in the library, for instance, we can pay for posters with faculty to micro grants. If your students need materials, uh, one of my students did, um, she needed scrolls and she did sort of the, a take on the constitution, but on maybe learning tenants. Uh, someone else needed, there was something else from the supply wise. Basically we can pay for any of the supplies. We just need communication and those micro grants filled out at the time. Yeah, and eventually we would love to make that into something that's more of an AU-wide symposium. Like there's currently a symposium on experiential learning, but how are we highlighting or raising the visibility of these fantastic projects that students are doing? I think that's gonna be a big kind of future uh, endeavor for us. So logging expectation for faculty is to make sure that your students are logging the hours that they're doing with their community partner on gift polls. I'll be, again, transparent here. Even if your partner isn't approving their hours, it is still very useful for us to, to have the students data on there. It's also how they get award, uh, hours towards things like the President's Volunteer Service Award or hours towards a program like the Community Service Learning Program. So it's just really imperative that uh, you're logging your hours on gift polls. Again, we, show, we can show you how to do that during our orientation training. Um, I see your hand, we'll get to questions in just a moment. Uh, we also have a specific student evaluation of teaching questions, so there's four. One of the things that's kind of interesting about this, come to a community of practice, we're actually redesigning what these SET questions will look like. So say you don't like the four that we're about to show um, and you have some input, like we can take that, we can get those edited. Um, it's now time to refresh. So let's, let's get some more community input on that. Uh, for us, you can expect us to be very responsive, to support in finding nonprofit partners, to training you on gift pulse and how to collect accurate data, uh, to attend your final presentations, and to have a little bit of grant funding available. That one's a little cut off and tenuous at the moment, just as Amanda has mentioned. Uh, did we have a quick question? Uh, I'm in. I'm in. Uh, at West Virginia, one of the things that we did to implement service learning on campus was to have TAs, not uh, TA specific for CB courses. As you're thinking about leadership models and different activities, it would be really helpful, I think, to have students like peer mentors mm -hmm. that are working with faculty maybe two or three courses a semester to absolutely. help them with the following up on good policy hours, set questions, et cetera. Et cetera. Absolutely, I think absolutely. That's one so, why CB works so well in complex problems because we have program leaders. So mm -hmm. the program leaders are often that manpower and labor to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things we'll do, and this is where we could again get some collaboration going here. GW, for example, they have over 100 student workers who work just with CBL courses within their national center. What we, we don't have that, right? But what we can do is if we can design what the job description looks like. And this is where I don't know what it's like to teach on this, but I can delegate that support. So, you know, if you're able to come up with some of the points that what would the student be doing, that TA be doing, that would be helpful to you, send those to me in an email. We will work on designing a job description. And while we can't afford a new full-time staff, that doesn't mean we can't get student staff to support with our community-based courses. Unfortunately, student labor is more affordable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next slide. All right, so the timeline, again, this is kind of the free service that I just mentioned. Uh, you have to designate your course as CV through the application and attend the orientation. Orientation will be over the summer. The fall semester orientation is a lot easier than the spring because that one, oftentimes we don't even, we're not even able to support that because it's just right in between the semester. So like if you're planning on doing a CV course and you wanna do one in the spring, I would recommend attending a summer or fall orientation. Um, so. You want to pause there? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Right. So we are going to pause here. We are going to do some reshuffling, and it is lunchtime. And lunch is in the next room. So please go grab your lunch. Uh, they are labeled. Um, everyone has super specific things. So please try to take the lunch that you are to be paid for. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
And so I am uh, honored right. to welcome our esteemed <laughs> panelists here today. So uh, I'll allow everyone a chance to introduce themselves if you want to start there. Oh, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Karen Cassell. I'm currently the director of development at Christ House. Um, but I started with service learning as a first year student in John Wisman's macroeconomics class in 1990. <laughs> when I was sent out either to do a paper or go do a community service activity. And so I chose the service and then went on to actually get to do a lot of student activism on and off campus here. I got to roll out AU's adoption of the community service learning project and the credit that goes with it. And then I went on to work with the provost's office to develop a manual for service learning for faculty and to build up what's now the community Leader, uh, Center for Leadership and Community Engagement. Got it. Yeah. But that is like the 17th yeah. title that it's had since it started. Um, and so, yeah. and I come to you today from back in the community based organization world, but I've, so I've been straddling when I'm not at AU, I've been with local and national nonprofits here in DC, but also I got the chance to teach at GW for nine years in their human service and social justice department. So I love this opportunity to come because I'm truly excited about all these intersections. Yeah. And if you recognize Karen, also oh. the <laughs> director of uh, new students and family orientation for all of our orientation activities, etc. And the uh, family engagement, yeah, until yeah. about six weeks ago or so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now located at Christ House, which primary location is within Columbia Heights and 14th Street area. Um, yeah, uh, Ochezi, then we can go to Garrett after. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ochezi Joseph, and I am a uh, a senior professor or lecturer in the School of Education, as well as the undergraduate program director. And Garrett, feel free to introduce yourself. Sure, hello everyone. Um, I wish I could be there in person. Um, I am Garrett Grady Lovelace at the School of International Service, and I focus on food and agricultural policy, but have long understood my scholarship as being with and for farmers and farm workers and anti-hunger activists and people on the front line of food system equity work. So um, I'm also working to incorporate it into my teaching and in my pedagogy with the help of Sagar and Amanda. And of course, Marcy Campos was a mentor of mine. So happy to be working with Melanie and many of the others in this room. And I've even been able to now publish and write and teach about community-based research scholarships on a meta level, but really excited to think through how to integrate this really exciting dynamic field into academic affairs, as well as campus life. Of course, it is such a great contribution to campus life, but it is also at the heart of you know, curriculum and, and good research. So really honored to be working with you all. And I should also say, I work with Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center very closely. So that's another home of mine on campus. Thank you. So again, thank our panelists for, for joining us. It's good to uh, round of applause for coming to you. Uh, so I guess the first question I have for everybody is what was your initial experience with CDL um, and how do you continue to practice CDL within your current field of work? Did you want, you uh, whoever wants to start, you can start. Karen, I'll jump in. <laughs> I mean, as I mentioned, so I got to start to do this work when, when at AU, this really, the, the, the impetus for us was the service learning credit, right? And a lot of the work at the time was really how do we convey with our faculty partners and most importantly with our students and community partners that this was not a credit for the hours you served, but the learning that occurred through that service, right? So it was trying to build, build up buy-in for faculty to do this work. It was trying to come up with supporting meaningful exercises for students to reflect and, re and demonstrate their learning and to sort of get community partners on board, right? Because there's all sorts of external factors that you can't control when you're working with externals. And if you're a faculty member who's on a tenure track, you have concerns that things go well, right? And so how do we balance all of those needs? And so really have been working with um, different strategies and applications of service learning or community-based research. Um, I was mentored by Sam Marullo. I don't know if that name comes through to anybody, but he had been, he had been writing about community-based research from George, Georgetown University. And I had the chance to also be on the staff with the Community Research and Learning Network in DC, Coral Network, which was like the precursor to DC's Campus Compact, which is now what is the Maryland? Transform, Transform Maryland. Maryland. Oh, Transform Mid-Atlantic, that's right, sorry. Um, but in my current work, 
uh, and in every nonprofit I've been in since, I like I come in with this secret weapon. Like I know how to get higher ed involved and the resources that higher ed can bring to the table. You know, like I am at an organization that is pretty bare bones right now, um, which is great on the sheet when you talk about the percentage of funds that go to overhead. It makes my job easier to sell to donors, but it also means it's really tight. And, um, and so there's a lot of resources and expertise that I know we could tap into, but my colleagues have not had the capacity to even start to think about it, right? And frankly, a lot of the folks that I work with too um, have been doing the same work. I saw Martha's table on your list in the YMCA. You know, some of these, the, the original founders and original staff are still the ones carrying a bulk of the weight. And so they, they're not stopping to look back and say, how do we engage a, a new generation of folks or adopt a new set of skills, frankly. Um, the number of my colleagues that don't use email right now is kind of baffling to me. So that I say that just to illustrate like there's a lot of challenges and start, but there's also so much opportunity. So that's kind of the place I come from. Very similar um, as Karen started, you know, I have a personal story as well to kind of go with that, but for me, it was thinking about integrating meaningful service into learning, right? It's just as it says um, on the website. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian and uh, born and raised in DC. And mm -hmm. DC natives are very particular about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm a native. Like, where you where? Step of spring. No. no. <laughs> we are very particular. So, Washington, DC. Um, but anyway, you know, giving back was something I love DC. And what, as, as much as I can support the community and give back, I wanna do that because that's what happened for me as a child. Um, where I grew up, we actually, I could walk to Martha's table where mm -hmm. I grew up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we had Martha's table and we had a, um, a, y -W, a YMCA, mm -hmm. and those two places, if that's where I first learned about community involvement. It was just right there. I didn't really understand it, but I knew that there were people there who cared and people there who were invested in the community to help to help us and to do do a lot for our community. Um, so that's kind of like my personal story. Um, when I came to AU, I didn't know anything about CBL, and I kept getting these emails from Marcy. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? Why does she keep emailing me? So I finally actually read it <laughs> and looked at it. I thought, oh my goodness, this could be really, really, really cool. Um, and it just kind of was a great way for me to see my vision and everything that I wanted to do in the community come to fruition. What's your kind of tie-in to CBO? Uh, what was your introduction and what are you doing for it? Yeah, thank you so much. So I think I would say the minute I got to DC 12 years ago, I realized that all of these grassroots organizations that aren't technically, um, you know, kind of DC serving, they're national serving or international, super grassroots, came to DC regularly to lobby on the Hill, to try to get something through in Congress, to try to get a better farm bill, to try to get farm workers protections. So um, I realized that AU University could be this wonderful space for them to land in and regroup. We could host them, we could have students support them as they gather their work and kind of get their policy briefs in order. So um, the location of DC was so inspiring to me, not just because the amazing work that's happening in DC, the kind of native DC activism that's so extraordinary, but because all of these people and coalitions and groups come to DC to try to influence you know, power and really move resources to their, to their communities and AU could be a great place for them. And in the process, it would be an extraordinary learning opportunity for my students. So I realized on day one that my students would be learning more from these community elders and organizers and leaders than they would in any textbook. And then it would complement the content we were looking at in class so effectively and so engagingly. So um, it's been a win, win, win from a teaching student and community perspective, but it's not always easy. And there's been a lot of trial and error, which we will talk about, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. We'll get into that. And I guess before we do, a follow-up question I have is, you know, we don't have really many students uh, participating within this discussion today. And my question to you all is, what is unique about kind of the students at American University 
that makes them a great fit for getting something from a community-based learning course? I'm gonna jump in because I love that question. And I, for years, as I worked with my colleagues on all of the different area campuses, um, it, it seemed evident to me, and I'll say this as a practitioner in the field as well, that I think AU students really do take that change maker to heart, whether they roll their eyes about what the label we, is we put on it. But I think that we have students who come here like expecting and ready and eager to do things. Some students on some of the other campuses are excited to research things, right? Or add locations to their resumes. I'm not gonna disclose my thoughts about which campuses <laughs> are which, but it really does stand out. Like I, you know, in all the years that we were linking AU to underserved communities across the city, it was AU students who were already there frequently or willing to go there in, in numbers and in capacities and in meaningful ways that I could not say the same of from students from other campuses. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, tooting my eagle love and horn over here, but yeah. So I'm gonna, I live in the School of Education, so I'm gonna speak to the students in the School of Education. And something that was a draw for me actually to come to AU was the School of Education's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism. So I have been in many places that talk the talk, but in our department, we are really doing more than talking the talk, we're walking the walk. And I lead with this with almost every presentation that I do as I represent the School of Education. And I talk about our commitment to anti-racism and um, anti-racist learning. So with that said, um, I start all my classes with this and we go over it. And I go over some like scenarios or we take sides and usually all the students are on one side <laughs> and they say, now, Dr. Joseph, we wouldn't be in this program if we didn't believe this. So I say that all to say the majority of our students are very like-minded when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. Um, so, you know, this, may, this makes the work attractive and easy because this is what they commit to. And when they come to AU, because again, like I said, we lead with this. So when they come to any orientations, when they come to us as a high school senior, again, we lead with this. So they don't come to us not knowing what our beliefs are. They know as soon as they step in the door and we, we reiterate it. Yeah, that is kind of bi-directional there that we're not only seeking students who uh, exude our values, but it's also we're training them as they've entered into our campus as to how to actively be promoters of our values. Uh, one of the other things too, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, your recent involvement and kind of your um, status as an AKA member. Uh, yes. what, what you've done with uh, the Eagle Endowment Grant in this past semester, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about that before we... Uh, go to Garrett. Let's go to Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, but this is a, that's a really that's something I wanted to prime you on because it is uh, super unique. And Garrett, just getting your video back up. So give us a second. There we go. You're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, um, thank you so much for this. I would echo everything Karen Anchezu just said, and I love that uh, School of Ed mission statement. Um, but on the grad level, I work with two-year, three-year um, professional master's program students. So these are people who've been in the workforce and they come back to school often seeking deeper critical analysis and deeper skills, you know, bigger questions about histories of colonialism, history, bigger questions about racism, bigger questions about political economy. But they want to take that knowledge and go right back into, you know, the USDA or into a, a civil society org or an NGO or FAO or UN. So super applied and pragmatic and very critical. And they recognize the value of practitioner expertise, expertise and these elders and these community kind of activists, heroic and legendary activists. So it's a great combination of people who are right for learning from and making the most of these community-based research um, um, experiences at the grad level and at the undergrad level, a parallel thing where you've got kind of 
movers, these people, these young people have so much initiative and drive. They also have a lot of debt. So they're ready to dive into the workforce, but they have a lot of ethics and they want to dive into the workforce, keeping their integrity and their, you know, kind of commitments and social and community commitments. So um, I think it's a perfect fit. And Sagar, we've talked about this for so long and Amanda and Melanie, but it could put AU on the map. It is AU's hidden strength, this community-based learning. I really do feel like it makes use of the strengths that AU already has, but could do it in a more kind of coherent and public-facing way. Absolutely. It's something that could really define, I think, AU and hopefully now our new president is also kind of carrying that same torch. Uh, before we go into a little bit more about leveraging the experience as both faculty and community partners, one more question that kind of, I feel like was a great discussion we were having earlier around the motivation of students to engage within this work. Do you all find that students are already internally motivated, intrinsically motivated when they're coming in? And does that change based off of if they're underclassmen or upperclassmen or potentially affiliation groups that they might be a part of, like, you know, uh, service organizations or Greek life, et cetera? I'll start. Let me go back to the mm -hmm. question you asked me first. So um, Sagar asked me about my sorority. And I, I said that only because I'm a, I was not involved with that work. Okay. So, but I am a proud member. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, one thing that is the, my sorority sisters undergraduate here on campus have come out to me just as an additional um, advisor, if you will, right? Um, and our, our sorority, like many of the D9 organizations are really committed to community involvement. And um, it's almost like, I mean, that's, that's what we are for. <laughs> we are for activism, we are for community support. So that is a, that is a big pillar um, in our organization. So, but yes, many, I see many of our students intrinsically motivated for sure. Mm -hmm. In fact, they already come telling me places that they are involved in already doing a lot of volunteering uh, work. And I'm like, okay, okay, let's, <laughs> let's see what we can do with this, you know? Um, so that's what, I, that's what I've seen. Well, I'll point back to, I mean, the existence of the Eagle Endowment is a great indicator mm -hmm. because we developed it years ago specifically because the students kept coming to me with great ideas, thinking my budget was gonna accommodate them. <laughs> but I also said like one, you know, there's a lot of real critical thinking and anybody around the table who's written a grant or sat on a grant review committee can appreciate that like, maybe we really do wanna teach people to think about how do you engage community stakeholders? How do you look to faculty mentors? What does this look like that has meaning and not the same thing that everybody else is doing? Like, how do you, how do you pitch this? What's your theory of change here in a, in a light version? And how do we help develop these skills? But I also suspected that there would be a lot of alumni who, at the undergraduate level at least, would certainly have told me that what they, their prized learning experiences were at these places where classroom theory and community practice intersected right? Yeah. That's where they learn the most. Yeah. And frequently that they learned that because it was hard, right? I think I worked, I spent years working with AU students' parents. They all want to make things very easy for their students. That comes through clearly. But I think that that real learning happens when they're challenged and pushed and see what really happens in the world. And then they feel like, oh, now I'm not walking in so naively, right? So we built this endowment to sort of support this and keep this going. Um, and so I think, yes, I agree. I think it's there and I think we shouldn't be afraid of it. And I think we shouldn't be afraid of, as we'll talk about all of the things that can go sideways because that's what happens in the real world, right? And they're ready for it. Yeah, yeah Garrett. Yeah, um, so I echo everything uh, that just got said. I'll say two points. One is the alumni are an untapped resource. And I actually would love to keep talking about how the students who graduate from the CBL, it's so impactful them. It's impactful for them on a short term level. And then I feel like a year or two later, they realize how much they learned in the process and how valuable those connections were and those reflections. So I feel like if there was a way for the recent grads to come back and help mentor and maybe get an honorarium or stipend, you know, for their time, but kind of close the loop so that the undergrads could learn how professionally valuable it is to do this work and how intellectually enriching it is, how it opens up so many doors. I think that could be a way to kind of show that it's professional, that it is educational, and that there's, a, you know, kind of quality of life um, from a campus experience. 
I'll say one thing I've noticed that's that's gotten harder in the last 12 years is students are busy and they used to in the same drive, the same drive that leads them to seek out new things and be entrepreneurial and be creative and be activists and change makers like overwhelms their schedule. And so I feel like it's up to us as the teachers and admin to make sure that they kind of channel these experiences in a way that doesn't kind of crush them, you know, at the end of the semester. Um, so I think it's up to us to maybe do one more level of cohering so that those who feel called to the CBO work can do it in a way where it's not just stacking on more work on top of a rigorous, you know, curriculum, but um, maybe that's something we could brainstorm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that was a little bit of a leading question because <laughs> I was wanting to kind of mention that one thing I know as a class is that AU students are very busy students. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think AU students are also ones that are oftentimes looking for a sense of community, a sense of purpose and belonging. And so when we take that into account, I think leveraging some of the other organizations and groups that they may be a part of, and as faculty member or a staff, opening up that dialogue with students to say, what else are you involved in? Because maybe that they're already involved with an organization, whether it's Greek Life, whether it's another club at, on campus, where they're already maybe engaged in service work and the actual idea or concept of adding in service learning isn't as much of a stretch, stretch as much as it is giving the flexibility to allow them to follow their own pursuits or what they're doing on the side. So part of that listening, you know, kind of to the students, and of course, this is where it's difficult when students are changing every semester, but kind of getting an idea through whether it's asking at the beginning of the class, like, you know, who is involved in other clubs here, or if you're working primarily with first year students, then potentially showing them, hey, this isn't something that you don't have to take every single opportunity that you hear from AU. Instead, here is one route where it could put you on a track and it connects already to these other clubs or organizations. So kind of showing it as like a both and rather than an either or, uh, which actually was in the original strategic plan that um, has now evolved since. So the next question kind of going more towards this idea of uh, the classes that you're, you're teaching is, um, what is kind of your most recent community-based learning project and how has that been incorporated into your class or in your case as like a, you know as a partner what is it that you would want to incorporate in the class because in gary's story yeah we all <laughs> go for it. then we can all echo you yeah. <laughs> Um, well, what's been nice about being so deep into this after many years and many trials and many errors, and, you know, I feel like it's been a learning journey for my community partners and for me, you know, and then obviously for the students in an iterative way, is that at this point, our community partners have a stronger focus of like, we need this translated, we need this policy brief. Um, and so the kind of matching of community needs with student skill sets is getting a little more efficient. I still feel like I could do better, you know, to kind of make use of that first valuable month of each semester. But there's something um, this past semester we did, um, students worked with Alianza Nesta de Campesinas, Farmworker Women Organization, did a bilingual um, blog post about Earth Day and pesticide exposure. And the community groups were so proud of it. And then they circulated it far and wide. And then these capstone seniors using it for kind of their grad applications. So I feel like that was a really valuable kind of deliverable that's continuing to have ripple effects. And so to clarify also, uh, your students, would you say they operate in a service hours fashion, a project-based fashion, or a little bit of both? And how did you kind of choose that modality? Yes, good question. So we did the 20 hours because it's CBL, but um, I do like the idea of having a stronger clarity on what the project is at the, even before the semester starts so that students have a project in mind and less a matter of tallying off the, the hours because I feel like by the end of the semester, they're proud of a project in a way that just being proud of 20 hours, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, an accomplishment, but it's not something they can kind of go to a grad program or an employer and really, you know, boast about in a way that a deliverable um, is kind of can go further. And obviously for our community partners to have a project accomplished over the semester is so useful for them. That's that's a, a great, great response to that or a new way to think about it too. I haven't even thought about that. Um, so Jesse. Oh yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Okay, so um, the course where we integrate, you know, we make our CBO course is a is is a course that not just education. It's, a, it's an elective, and it's a very popular elective for us. And so, not everyone is an education major. However, now what is? Oops, kind of cut off. But um, wonder why. Uh, we could, it's okay. We, you get, they, I think we get the idea. <laughs> so what I try to do, what I do with the students, I try to find out what their interests in majors are, right? Okay, so I start with interest-based. So this particular semester, I did have education students. Um, I had folks interested in policy. So what type of policy, Where whether it's fair housing, food security, Im immigration, and politics. So the... What's the fair called? Uh, the nonprofit networking fair is what we're saying. Right. Yeah. So attended that. And these are the partners that I met at the fair and basically talked to them about what I was looking for and what I needed for my students, right? Um, so if they check that box, <laughs> they got put on this list. And you know, I had contact information and hyperlinks and all those kind of things to make it very, very easy for the students to contact or learn more about the organization and that sort of thing. So you created the table and I you created it this. out with your students. I sure did. So this is actually on the, the syllabus. Oh, amazing. Mm -hmm. So one of the things just for everybody is uh, benefit of knowledge because the nonprofit <laughs> networking fair is an absolutely great way to meet yes. community partners. We do work over the summer, so don't feel like you have to wait until the fair in order to find your community partner, but we do offer that. Usually it's week one or week two of the semester. So oftentimes what we found to be successful is to identify your partner over the summer or before your class starts. But then you meet with your partner, maybe beforehand or during the fair. You know, if that works, you, have, you meet them during the fair, you get to establish that person person connection. Mm -hmm. But by that time, you've already maybe planned out what the project is like, but this is a nice place to have an in-person meeting. Uh, we usually do it right within MGC um, in the tavern on the first floor. I believe this fall semester's date will be on September, the, the first Wednesday in September, September 2nd or 4th, uh, I forget which one it is, or the uh, first week of school. So we have about 30 nonprofits. We want to have them from different areas. If you have an organization or a topic area that you would like to make sure there's representation from, uh, you can email me around that. But so glad to see that that was uh, effective. It was very effective. And, you know, this is after like a couple of semesters of reiteration, like what is going to work best for the students. And it's always different, right? <laughs> because everyone needs what they need. <laughs> and I guess, Karen, from your perspective as a community partner, um, how does, I guess, like finding that right fit for a class work for you when you're attending something like the fair? Sure. I mean, I think uh, certainly there's various ways to to integrate, right? So I've been on this, like I just onboarded my newest intern from Pepperdine, which is great. And I focus a lot on like her learning outcomes and we've written them out so she can see them. And so she can understand why you standing in front of a copier to scan documents for a couple hours is going to have a payoff later. It also eases my guilt, <laughs> but like, that's great. Um, or I've worked with like as a faculty to help facilitate like semester-based projects or multi-semester projects. There was also a model that GW did that was co-curricular service learning. So they had um, teams from different um, disciplines in the medical school come together. They wanted to help physical therapists learn how to talk to nurses, learn how to talk to doctors because they don't except for opportunities like this. And I would host, host them at our clinic. I was at Community of Hope when we did that. <laughs> um, and like, although the relationship with the institution and the structure of the program lasted for semester after semester, which was really helpful for me to get to know them and for them to get to know me, um, but also to build my institution's capacity, my organization's capacity to learn what to expect. Like, oh, this will be a chance. And it starts to get people thinking. Cause sometimes, you know, like I might be the only cheerleader at that nonprofit saying, no, wait, we can totally do this. Cause they're like, oh, I don't wanna deal with college students. They're gonna wait till the last minute. <laughs> they're like, they try to interview me, wasting my time. It's not like they're asking me things that they could find on the internet, like all that kind of stuff, right? 
Yeah. So you hear me. <laughs> so trying to like really cultivate what are those relationships like? And then also I think for, for me and my colleagues to really think of how do we scaffold that experience and recognizing some of the challenges that students have, like you said, they're really busy. So there was a project I did once in partnership with Appleseed Foundation for the DC office was working on the policy that you hear a lot right now about pay, pay and uh, credentialing for early childhood educators and I actually used the students in my class to do some of the survey work. Mm -hmm. Now frustrating because they're not going to see the end of it. Like we're just talking about this now and that happened in class like years ago. But I knew that Appleseed, because that was one of my affiliates when I worked for, for Appleseed, that they really valued evidence-based uh, policy work. And so I was really trying to underscore for my students up and coming nonprofit leaders that the importance is the evidence-based, not just how you feel about a thing, right? So this was a chance to see the messy work of the evidence base and like was it hard to get a hold of people on the phone yes yeah, sure was i have pictures we sat in the hallway in the, like, <laughs> with everybody with their laptops because they all could be online and they were all trying to make calls at the same time and all getting like clicks and hang-ups and i don't have time to talk to you right now and why should i tell you what i think about when i'm being paid like but great because it's theoretically nice to design a survey and then like to really experience what that looks like and, but that was like a, a building a relationship with a partnership that I, you know, co colleagues that I worked with. Um, and kind of like you, we offered two different topics at that time. So one group focused on housing, the other worked on education. What also worked for me really well as an instructor at the time was yeah. it gave my students some commonality. They all had to do a research project, but in the past I could end up with 30 different deep dive research projects. It was really hard as skilled as I am to try to like speak authoritatively about why your theory of change looks like this and who should you be talking to about this. So, so it helps streamline my work because they said, okay, we're all gonna look at early childhood education and now you can bring the lens that you wanna to bring to that, right? Like which part of this do you care most about? Is it um, for students who are non-English speakers or is it for how do you engage the families or is it the funding side? But they had this common base and they also had some professionals then and my partners that they could talk to for getting that substantive interview work and that follow-up work. Um, I think he was teeing me up though to speak specifically to one of the needs. I, I said, hey, I'm thinking I wanna do this. Can you help me find somebody? But so Christ House has been doing its work in much the same way for like 40 years. And it's very straightforward, direct service. The poor will always be with us. People will be unwell, we heal them, right? Like, I mean, in that, in that we treat their clinical needs. There's not a lot of new jazzy stuff about that on its surface, but we're also about to do some capital campaign work, like which you only get to do every 40 years or so. And I'm like, how can we find resources to make it green and sustainable? And that there's a lot of buzz about, right? And in fact, I know that the District of Columbia wants to support nonprofits doing this, but all my colleagues are like, what are you even talking about? Pavers and water, water rainfall and solar, whatever. I don't have time for all this business. So like, I would love to find students who can help me do that research and that scouting, right? And make the case. There's also stuff, maybe there's some folks in here who are doing public health related things, but like nutrition as a prescription, right? We feed our patients as they recover. And I think there's a lot that could be done. I mean, I think our practitioners understand the concept, but trying to help equip my chefs and my volunteers and our supply line so that we can source and provide not only nutritionally dense appropriate food, but culturally relevant, which is the other piece that seems to mm -hmm. be missing. So I could totally see students coming in to help in the kitchen while a pair of them are over here at the kitchen, like dining with the guys to see like, what are they thumbs up and thumbs down? <laughs> like, what should we repeat? How do we build the collection of recipes that have been written on backs of note cards, right? And like, how do we identify the most nutrition, um, nutri nutrient dense uh, foods that we can? And then how do we tell the story to other funders, yeah. right? To get people excited that we are actually applying some of the latest trends um, and the evidence-based practices. Yeah, so as we can sort of tell from Karen's response too, it's when they come to a community partner, there are so many different ways to engage with them across disciplines that it's really just about having that kind of sit down conversation of like, what are the different ways? Here's what I specialize in, here are the students I'm bringing in, here's what they might be interested in. What are those overlaps? What is the intersectionality between those? So we're gonna have, um, we have like about 15 more minutes or 10 more minutes before I wanna open it up to an audience Q&A. So I'm gonna ask one question around kind of uh, challenges to implementing this work, one about successes. Before I do that though, um, one of the things I really, that you know, kind of uh, makes me eager is what is the vision look like for the future? And how do we adapt our current CDL 
so that we're kind of thinking through uh, continuity and almost upgrading the student leadership experience. So Garrett, you might have some things to say on this. I'll make sure I get you back on the screen. Uh, I'm wondering when it comes to thinking of the pathway or pipeline for students, I uh, you know we have some department faculty within here, uh, what are ways that we could create service learning experiences that stick with the student for multiple years? And I think that within SIS, I know that that's been a conversation where it's like, how do we not only have CBL as an isolated one class semester type experience, but where maybe as Karen was just saying, you're engaging within developing the research instrument or survey instrument at the beginning, then taking that into research methodology for actually like collecting data and you know, having something where it's a multi-semester service learning project. Well, so is it coordinating, yeah, is it coordinating within your department <laughs> to find other faculty who teach those higher levels of classes and then kind of getting a string of CBL courses going so that there's like more of a pathway approach? Is it starting students off yeah. younger and then giving them more flexibility? There's so many different ways we can approach this, but we don't have anything standardized or you know, school wide or department wide. So, what are some of the innovations we could have around that? And the thing, I mean, that is one way. But I think what I found when this when this interest in related to work that they want to do, I have found that they naturally want to stick with it. You know, they because it's so interest based. Um, I think the other piece you were asking about. The intrinsic motivation, right? Because that's it. And so this, we have so many students who already come with the volunteering. How can we and make that a partner where they will continue doing what they've been doing and not have to change volunteering where they have been volunteering with that? Makes sense. Yeah, so creating stability within their existing within the, service yes. learning experience. Yes. That's, that's one great perspective. Yeah. Any others to add? Uh, Garrett or Karen? <laughs> Yeah, well, even Cyber, the way you phrased it of how should we have the students start younger? Yes, have them start younger. Uh -huh. And how can we coordinate across curriculum? Yes, let's coordinate across curriculum. So I feel like even just having those be goals, and then there's kind of a self-finding, you know, in this. But I would say if it's grounded in service learning, but then evolves or graduates to being part of research, automatically the students see how it, 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 they're, they're fascinated, you know, they're intrigued, they're intellectually hooked into it. Um, and so there needs to be a way where their major or their content or their, um, you know, focus and concentration in, in the academic side is augmented and supplemented with this experience so that it's not an add on, you know, volunteer experience, but it is woven into their intellectual journey here at AU. Now that's easier said than done, but I feel like even just positioning that way will could open up some resources, some academic affairs resources. And then, you know, each unit could kind of figure out who within them is already doing this work. And then we could kind of stagger or coordinate the classes so that a student who has a first year CBL and they're introduced to it, but it's more of a service learning because they can't really do full research as, you know, teenagers at that point. But then by their junior year or their senior year, they are able to do some original research for their community partner and they've built trust um, and the community partner trusts them and there's some kind of history with there. I'd say the other thing that I've, I would love to throw out to the table is an iterative way where one cohort of student who works with a community org can put their deliverables and maybe their self-reflections in a hub where the next cohort of students can read and learn and build off of what the previous cohort can do. And that will allow the community orgs not to feel like they're having to reinvent the wheel and reteach the nuances of their org and reteach the nuances of their place-based work as much. And that might make it more efficient for the community orgs and the students could feel like they're part of a longer journey. I will say that my final point is that sometimes these very overachieving, wonderful entrepreneurial students expect to have a full you know, deliverable in four months. And I feel like the reality is that they will make great contributions, but it might be the following cohort that takes to the next level or expands it. So if the student sees themselves in a broader journey of research that's community-led and community-based, then it takes away some of the, the logistical stress and also there's a nice kind of collaborative feel to the work. Yeah. 
And, you know, uh, for everyone who's maybe now engaging with this for the first time, Garrett just finished teaching a course that is we're working with seniors at a capstone level. Mm -hmm. The way also, just as a shout out, Garrett, the, we just came from your final presentation, the way that you've inspired students to really engage with the research aspect itself, which as when I was a student, that didn't seem like the most interesting part, but you really like you could see the way that students personally connected to it through their service learning experience, which I just thought was phenomenal. Um, all the way to someone like Amanda Chalka, who's working with underclassmen students and getting that same level of personal reflection. And we see that coming up very early on and then staying with the student for, throughout their experience. So knowing that you're not in this alone, that you have other faculty who are definitely willing to work with you to, regardless of your department, the uh, level of students that you're teaching, whether you're doing research-based work or not, all of that is kind of accessible within community-based learning. Yeah. I have a question. Do our students hear, like if they have so many hours by the time they graduate, like wear a special cord at graduation or something <laughs> like that? Only because that's what my daughter did from like in high school, right? If you got over a certain amount of hours, you got to wear, a, you got a special cord. Yeah. So, you know, for those kids who mm -hmm. academic, they're not gonna be the 4.0s, but they're gonna have 2000 hours mm -hmm. of CDL and they get that special cord at graduation. Yeah, so- like, so That's we, a great incentive. I think. We've talked <laughs> internally around- uh, Right? <laughs> so this is where those programs around um, mm -hmm. kind of the certification and how are we recognizing students who are engaging within local programs of our office, you know, that's kind of a discussion we have ongoing. So I, I'm not going to say anything until we have anything there, but what I can say is that American University, as of last year, just got accredited by the Office of the President of the U.S. to distribute what's called the President's Volunteer Service Award. So now if anyone at the AU community, students, faculty, anyone, does over a hundred hours of volunteer work and logs it on gift posts, signs up for the President's Volunteer Service Award, AKA PVSA for short, um, they can receive a distinguished award package from the Office of the President of the US. That award package includes a signed letter from the President of the US, a certificate of completion, and a medallion, which we just presented to 22 students mm -hmm. for doing over 100 hours of work in a one-year period that they got to wear across state for graduation. Oh, nice. So, um, you know, that's just like, as of last year, a really great accomplishment. Yeah, it's uh, pretty special uh, University Student Achievement Awards to see the seniors who were getting that award. Absolutely. And the recognition. And I mean, just seeing people realize like this is actually a thing and we're rewarding mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. behavior. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So before we open it up to audience questions, the last, uh, I guess, in theory, second to last question I have is name one of the biggest obstacles or challenges, I could say, to having implemented community-based uh, learning within your course, as well as what you felt like was, you know, for you personally, what was that biggest accomplishment? Is It could be a story, it could be um, something you had as a personal success, it could be a success you've seen but biggest kind of obstacle to uh, executing community-based learning and the biggest thing that lets you up throughout that process. I'd say as I work to support faculty at AU or my colleagues at GW, one of the biggest obstacles is just finding the right person at a community partner organization. And when you let your, when you have your students, your undergraduates try to do this on their own, if they're each trying to come up with their own, they're, you're gonna get all that pushback, right? Because Volunteer coordinators don't return phone calls. We're just notoriously bad at it <laughs> with competing interests. And the student then gives up. Well, I tried. Well, right. you tried once, you tried a number that's no longer operable and then you let it go. So taking advantage of those networking opportunities I think is really key where you've got alumni involved in places because you want somebody who's invested in the outcome there. And oftentimes, I hate to say it, but like the volunteer coordinator might just be a two years older than your student. So they're not thinking about the learning needs of your student. They're thinking, my boss told me I need to get somebody on this shift, right? And that's about where it goes. So I think trying to figure out who with that organization has the um, permission structure to invite you in to partner into that work is really key. And then thing I was left. Oh, I, think, I mean, the, the creativity and the excitement and the enthusiasm and every organization that I've partnered with or worked in, 
the stakeholders from top to bottom will all say that what they love the most is that energy that the students bring with them when we're all tired and cranky <laughs> and they come in, well, what about, and how about, and I've got this idea. And you might be like overwhelmed with like, please set your ideas aside for right now. But, uh, but it really does make you feel like you're recommitting to your mission, so. Yeah, actually even just later today, we're going to uh, my sister's place. They work with uh, domestic violence advocacy um, or prevention advocacy and they're recognizing Alpha Chi Omega, a sorority at AU, uh, today as their biggest kind of change makers within the volunteer space. So definitely that energy and enthusiasm brought by our students is something that's unique that they wouldn't get from other volunteers like high school students who they might be working sure. with. Uh, one of the other things I think is that that main challenge <coughs> point in the past, we've tried to do it where students are finding their own community partner organizations at the beginning of the semester. There's nothing against that. What I will say though is that point Amanda mentioned earlier around preparation before the semester mm -hmm. and accountability as being huge because we had that for about a semester and from my end it was awful I'll be honest with you all because like it was three four weeks into the semester and then I was getting flooded with students where I said I'm in a CDL course there's no guidance it, that, or they, that's what they felt that there was no guidance from their faculty member on finding a partner and it feels like it was just kind of pushed off on so again, happy to students walk in through the center for leaders of community week and week ten and eleven. Yeah, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. trying to meet their twenty hours. Yeah, or and find a partner. Yeah, we do give faculty the benefit of the doubt, um, but when you also look at syllabi, you don't see who's integrated in the syllabi mm -hmm. about community partners or who is the of partners or the different pathways to find partners that students do get to choose. Generally, that works better for upper level courses. Um, it does make us think like faculty can be more intense. Absolutely. And that was like kind of semester one while I was in the role. And so what we, our solution to it, and this is why I'm bringing it up, yeah. <laughs> is to fill out that orientation survey at the beginning of the semester, because that helps us know how you're planning on engaging students, if you have a partner in mind, or if at that point we need to start working to help you find a partner. Yeah, I'll just go one step further and say, not just a partner, because sometimes partners would be like, yes, that's great. I'm so excited to work with these young people. Let's do it. And then late January comes and they're very busy. And they say, just hold on a few weeks until I can pull ahead because they're low resourced and their communities need food and their, you know, the farm bill's coming. And so that precious month is gone before they reach back out to the students who send that email, Karen, as you said, and don't get a response. So I keep learning and I keep relearning the need to even tighten the project as well as the community partner as much as possible before the semester starts because the timing, the students are busy, the community partners are busy. It's actually like the two busiest realms of people whom you're trying to match. Mm -hmm. um, so time is key. But then the success I would say is the alumni. I, there's so many, oh, there's so many um, wonderful students who then go on to work for those community orgs or they go on to work for the, you know, the USAID or UN, but they carry with them the frontline grassroots community perspective of the CBO work in their work for the in the government. So there's this amazing network of alumni who this was transformational for. So thank you. So yeah, as Garrett said, time management has been the big thing, a big challenge. So the solution to that in a way is preparation and clearly communicating what it is that you expect from your partners and by when, and same with your students too. So you, you all are in that unique position where you can manage the two busiest groups, but no, that's difficult. Um, and uh, it was very nice meeting all of you. And, and mine is scheduling, um, because when they pick their desired interest area, maybe their class schedule doesn't work with the schedule of the needs of the organization. So that's a little tricky. Um, so that's, I'm trying to build the categories and find more organizations so that there's more, uh, there are more options. Um, but most proud of, on the same regard, I had a student, not an education major, who built her schedule every year around the organization because she loved it that much and she didn't want to stop. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, I just want to say hi to Gary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Engel. Hi. Yeah. My students have learned so much from Professor Engel all these years. Can you talk a little bit about 
the interdisciplinary <laughs> work that we've done and most sure. recently the farm bill. That's a great uh, yes. audience question. Yeah. And then <laughs> so, again, we have yeah. a few minutes for audience questions too. So yeah, sure. So um I think like, oh my heaven, so many years I've been working with Larry and he taught me how to make film on my phone, but then has been teaching my students. And we have, the students have made documentary films, a 45 minute documentary film that our community orgs are already using in their outreach. Um, and now we just did the Farm Bill Summit last year. And so we got, we worked with SOC, their community voice lab and um, the environmental filmmaking crew, Larry and Maggie Stoner and a few others. And they have hundreds of hours of footage that we are now in the process of turning into film that is for our community partners as they do outreach about the Farm Bill. So it's the pointing the Farm Bill toward racial justice toolkit and now multimedia work. And it has been a very fruitful collaboration with School of International Service with focus on ag policy and SOC. So I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to give that full shout out when Larry was in the room. <laughs> Uh, questions from the audience and knowing that we also have CBL practitioners, current faculty in the room, feel free to chime in um, if you have anything you want to add. Yeah. I just, uh, I love everything I've heard, I've heard here. Um, there are so many things that I like to have done, for instance, this past semester. Uh, but one of the things that I recommended my students was since community partners are volunteer coordinators are so busy, mm -hmm. I, I told my students just you know, go show your face in the organizations that you're interested in because they are not going to probably reply you, you know, they are not going to take your phone calls or anything. Just go, you know, introduce yourself, no fear. The, the worst thing they can tell you is no, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then you move on. But um, for at least three people, that's how it works. And they say, but they don't reply. Well, they are busy. And so when they go into the community and work with the community partners, they realize how busy they are. And so they, he said, like, yeah, it's the only way just to go and, and, and show your face. And so, yeah. So that community partners are oftentimes more responsive to those individuals who they form an in-person connection with. I think I that's think so. absolutely so. true. I also think to that point, like, sometimes students don't know how, what, they're, what they should be asking for that introduction. Like, when we talk about the skill level that they're coming in with, some of them have no idea how to you introduce yourself. So if, if there's a difference where I'm like, hi, I'm with the American University, I've got this class project, can I... Or can I get 30 minutes of your time within the next two weeks to talk about how I can commit to you for 40 hours this semester, right? Like that's different. Then I know, oh, I'm going to get 40 hours worth of something out of you, okay? Um, or like when I had, when I was teaching it, I would give an introductory letter from me that they could include with that introduction. So they knew there's a real bona fide faculty member over here and a name that they might even recognize. Um, and I would outline what the expectations were and what we were going to ask of that supervisor. Right? Yeah, um, you mentioned earlier about um, maybe organizations, you know, when you say, well, we have volunteers or we have, we have people, students that they want to come into your organization to, um, to do a project or whatever. Sometimes the organizations do not know what they want. You know what I mean? Right. So how do you engage them and say, hey, can you show me your needs? Like, um, how do you have that conversation? with them to, to, so they can support the work that we do here. That's great, because I think, that, I mean, that's one of the main things that had always worked for me. I, I was able to leverage my work at AU to convene meetings on the regular of a whole group of nonprofits. So I, I think, you know, the folks in the center are really great resources for this because they spend all year listening to those partner needs, right? And as they evolve over time, and that you kind of, you can't match that on your own necessarily walking in to think, how am I going to plan for the fall? And it's now April or May, right? So, but, but like, how do we get to that authentic listening? Um, and like, what kind of skills do we, do we have? And I've done this like in a practical sense with some community mapping exercises. So um, like there was a three semester project that I was a part of. So students committed for a while with me, but their first semester was just going out into the community with some guided questions and structures. They had to go each ward in the city. They had to attend community meetings. They had to do at least one interview with somebody. Um, so like they were watching like ANC meetings or a PTA meeting, et cetera. But like, how do they learn to listen first before they run in thinking they know better, right? Um, and over time, that kind of gelled. And now that took three semesters for us to get to li listening, 
mapping and executing, but it did last, it was, it produced a lasting freestanding nonprofit entity out of that. So it depends on how much time you really want to put into this. Otherwise I'd say just, you know, call up some friendly people, Sagar can help find you. Yeah. Uh, one of the changes we made and want to give a chance for panelists as well to respond is as of last year, you'll notice if you look up on our website, we have this directory of nonprofits. So that it was a long-standing list. It's one that we get asked about frequently. And I think the problem that's illustrated by it is that students will reach out to those organizations. And as um, Moody mentioned, just crickets sometimes, right? So what we've spent the last year and a half doing is we have uh, actually been instituting a community partner needs assessment. So we've been asking really all of that information on a semesterly basis and capturing that data. So that's something that now we have. We're happy to, if you say, hey, like we even have a question on there, what school is it out of our schools uh, that you would want to work with most? Do you want to work with individual students? Do you want to work with a group of students? So please like ask us. And even if it's, say you would rather just have all the information rather than us giving you some suggestions, happy to share that with you as well. Uh, oh, Chessie and Gary, anything you want to add on to um, what happened? How do you elicit that response from a community partner that defines the project that could set up your class? Yeah, no, but like I said with mine, I spoke with them all mm -hmm. during the fair. fair. Yeah. So it was that in person, it was just convenient because they were all there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that just made it easy. Um, and one of my goals, because the fair, you're right, it, and it gets busy, like the fall semester fair, we had over 400 students attend. So it's tough to get that one-on-one -on -one time with partners. So one of my main like kind of goals for this year is to hopefully start up something where it's a monthly nonprofit showcase tied to what the um, monthly kind of area is. So what I mean by that is like, if one month is Pride Month or one month is API Month, bringing in organizations that have a connection to that, where they're then on campus, faculty are invited, students are invited, and there's more of a monthly forum that we can kind of count on to bring in partners to campus. I think that's something that would allow for kind of that fair experience to happen on a monthly basis. Um, and it's just something we've never done before. So uh, wish, wish me luck in that society. <laughs> um, so I love that you're moving in that direction because there is a dyna dynamic aspect to this. Um, I will say there are also long-standing community needs. So even this community needs assessment, which is by the way, such a great research um, task in and of itself. So even having students be part of a community needs assessment um, is would be so valuable for them. But I would say in my experience working with community orgs, when you ask them what research they need, Sometimes it's hard for them to figure out what an undergrad crew could do or what a law, they may, they may need legal counsel. You know, maybe they need some law profs or maybe they need people who are totally bilingual to do some translation or people who are GIS expert for map making. But sometimes if there's what I'm kind of building for this next semester in academic year or trying to, I'm gonna work with Sagar hopefully, is like a database of previous deliverables Yep. or a way for a community or could kind of see what's possible and then they could be a little bit sharper and more specific in what they feel like they could ask in an undergrad a smart and enterprising you know 20 set of 21 year olds could pull off um, and, and kind of the expectations are met and, and and the students don't feel kind of overwhelmed by you know needing to know the legal aspect or the economic aspect of a specific part of ag policy um, so that kind of matching needs to be iterative, but I feel like if the deliverables of previous CBL research were available for a community org to navigate or do some search terms and get some ideas, then they could go back to their organization and figure out what tasks or activities they could ask and then communicate to us. And then we could kind of have this matching be more effective and efficient. I, I love that idea. <laughs> That's brilliant, brilliant. Um, Can I add one thing here? Yeah. I think, too, looking at the needs of your students, your student population, we tend to see direct service hour options work better with younger students and the more of a framework and modeling you can do for them. So, giving an example of like, what does the email look like? Can you share your mm -hmm. syllabus? Having a community partner come talk to class. Mm -hmm. um, if I teach a first year writing course and there are a choice of three community partners, all three will come mm -hmm. talk to class within the first three classes. It eats up class time but it puts a face to a name, mm -hmm. establishes expectations. We can be clear about things like scheduling and timing. 
And also it gives the students an idea of what's reasonable. Um, I think of a lovely young man years ago who wanted to volunteer with RAIN, the Rainbow Peace Access National Network, which requires 40 hours of training just to get on the hotline. Yeah. That's not a reasonable partner for a student who's volunteering for 20 hours. So two, like picking appropriate community partners based on student needs and student time. Um, oh, can we admit someone to the waiting room? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. And then, Shay, did you have something to add in? Yeah, I was, um, when I worked for Tafray Justice Center, mm -hmm. I had two students that approached me separately. They were um, CBRS scholars and were looking at opportunities. And I realized whenever I spoke with both of them individually and realized they were coming from the same class. Um, and that was really helpful because then I was able to actually have three or four students from AU come and like I carpooled them once a week so they come into the office. It was in Falls Church. Um, but it was helpful to like group them even if they weren't like disparate. So I don't know if that's something that the center could do or if faculty, if you are like giving them a plethora of options, recommending that, hey, if you know a, you know a friend that's also interested in this topic, see if the two of you can go together and ask the community partner, like, hey, what can a team of us a mini team of us do because it was easier honestly to find projects that I could give to the three or four of them to work on than to try and like specialize projects or tasks for one at a time. That's that's a really great suggestion. It kind of builds upon what Ochezi did too with the mm -hmm. chart. And then maybe if that like if we added one row to that chart where it's like number of people or something like that. Right. Okay. Um, so noticing we're at in the center also have like a chart like that with different organizations and see okay, there's someone from this CD class, mm. two from the CD class, there's three CSLP students going there mm -hmm. and try to set up like shared lists or, you we know. We already do that with the list. Okay. The list Great. application actually requires students to yeah. try to volunteer with yeah. other students. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, and if they're volunteering with people from the class, like say like maybe Saw Girls from the Lift app and I'll have our group. Mm -hmm. But having a shared list of partners too, I think that's a great, yeah. Great idea. Um, just wanting to respect the panelists' time, we might have time for one more question. Someone wants to, yeah. Just a comment for this past semester. Um, my students, I invited a community partner to talk to, talk to us uh, over Zoom. And uh, my students did not want to work with that community organization because it was gonna be online. Like okay. all the things mm -hmm. that they had to do were online. And they said, no, if we were going to invest this time, we wanna be face to face. So it, it, uh, it prompted me to um, create an extra project mm -hmm. for the class uh, with the, the Latinx community here. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Because I knew that some of them were not going to get a face-to-face -face engagement with that community partner. So, so that's, that's you know, complicated because they do really want to be out there to go somewhere. They want the challenge to you know, so, so face other people. And so that's, that was interesting. We haven't really talked about the fact that we're in the midst of historic campus protests and uh, mm -hmm. wherever anyone might fall personally, uh, the, the question will come up in the fall, whether students can fill their leadership hours, service hours with a maybe nonprofit or other ad hoc organization that is, you know, on a certain mm -hmm. political spectrum for, around advocacy. Mm -hmm. Are there guardrails right. on this. So uh, rather than guardrails, because, you know, as long as an organization is a designated kind of nonprofit, it, to me, it's not our place to limit what it is that they're counting for service hours. If they're doing it, if they're doing the work, if they're with an organization that's reputable, absolutely. But what is something, and this is said actually, again, by the Office of the President of the U.S., there is requirements for those that presence on your service work. So two of those requirements is that the volunteer hours can't be uh, political and they can't be uh, faith-based or religious. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't work with Christ House or that you couldn't work with the League of uh, Women Voters, right? If something is still apolitical, it's you know helping with voter registration as a whole or promoting democracy as a whole or promoting, you know, um, like if it's not cross proselytizing, I always say that was wrong, uh, faith, a specific faith, that would count. But if it is doing something where it's almost, um, yeah, going after one faith or one political party, those hours 
aren't eligible to be with presence volunteer service award. And I share that with the student when they're choosing their community partner, but that still doesn't restrict them from getting their hours towards service learning class or the add on credit. So I'm sure if that like answers your I want to add one. Yeah. yeah. I want to put one pin in this too. If students are going to a protest, you can't count like any protest that takes place during class time. If you're going to excuse an absence for class time protest activity, you have to exclude excuse any absence during class time for any protest. Does that make sense? So if your students want to go to a pro Palestinian march, then if there are students from students supporting Israel, then you also have to excuse that. So if you're getting to a class time schedule issue, that's where it can get a little tricky. Basically, if you excuse mm -hmm. absences for one type of protest, it needs to cover every type of protest. That's interesting. Right? I'd, I would have thought that like C3, C4, you know, would play into this somewhat because like if it's 2000 and you're, you know, I tend to go with that. That's lives. That's C3. Some of the messiness, but that's not what everybody does. I would just say like, you know, you just mentioned and we could have a whole different session on faith-based work because Christ House ha has grown out of faith roots and certainly it says Christ in the name, which we're aware of the limitations that that conveys. But in practice, the service we actually provide is secular in nature, right? So we receive federal funding and all the rest. So don't rule us out. Faith-based groups, especially as we talk about civic society and what holds us together in sense of community play a really key role here. So I'll speak up for that. But I would also say, I actually got to teach a community organizing class at UW. So I think some of it is what is the objectives in their course, right? How is it framed? Yeah. And so is that the, the instruction? I also had students when I taught the like internship classes at GW where they had to do 192 hours of field work and where students thought that the organization that they themselves were running was sufficient, it was a really poor learning experience, right? Yeah. And so being able to frame that like, so you definitely have a lot of skills in place here, but unless you have, point me to your board of directors person who is going to do your evaluation, right? Because the point here is for you to be learning and you learn a lot by doing, but this is your chance to really like compare what you're learning um, in this setting versus what your colleague is learning in their setting, right? And how do we structure it? So um, yeah, content neutral, but right. Even when you said reputable, that's a subjective assessment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally valid. Yeah. yeah, I should have said recorded, I guess that, or like recognized. That's probably the, I guess. the one. Yeah. Certified is a yeah. like designation. Exactly. Uh, that's why I really like the 501c3 language because yep. we put something that's more universally class. recognized. Um, because we do have enough students who are volunteering with groups that have political affiliations or mm -hmm. affiliations. So mm -hmm. I don't know, Garrett, um, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I will. So not only is the University 501c3, but our technically our major partner organizations are, which means I had used the verb lobbying. Lobbying is not allowed, but you inform. So you can do congressional briefings. So we did a congressional briefing, which is informing policymakers about the impact of a said policy. So one can't, you know, advocate for voting for a particular policy, but one certainly can be involved in informing policymakers. At least that's what how what we're dealing with in the agricultural policy framework. Yeah, and, and that plays out in health too. We have a public health capstone, which is working on uh, one of the partners is the men's health network. And again, it's like one of the things where yeah, it's a communication is issue in a way to students as well, because you have to make sure that like part of what they're doing is having to select the partner. And if people aren't really fond of a partner, then you just have to be mindful of that as you're establishing the relationship with the partner and what you're promising to them. So um, that's one where sometimes getting a sense of your students first is also really important. It also sometimes comes up more in political years, mm -hmm. especially since we're in DC yeah. and students volunteering at different campaigns. Um, one thing I also do want to highlight for folks, per university policy, we cannot take a stand on political things on social media if it's a program or AU based account. So the example I have, for instance, um, the writing studies program got their uh, hand smacked by Peter Starr, former provost a few years ago, because we posted something in support of the staff union and the adjunct faculty union. And that was not allowed on social media that was associated with the university. 
So if we run any social media accounts or anything is public and it's clear that you were associated with AU, there's something you were. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the missing class part. It never occurred to me to- It came up a few years ago, I want them to come to my class. No, you can't miss class. Like, I'm, thank you. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to make that very clear. There was language in a former provost's email basically saying like, and it was, I can't remember what, I think it was maybe the Women's March, but mm -hmm. if you're going to excuse mm -hmm. absences for the Women's March, then you need to excuse absences for other marches. So for instance, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be excusing my students for January 6th participation. No, I'm not, I'm not excusing uh, anyone for missing my class for any of this stuff because they need to come to my class. That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> um, integrating the, the hours, like you were supposed to say. They were sick. Integrating they integrating the time. hours into the class. Um, I think too, like looking at how you're using hours in class. So for instance, they might be able to support an organization that was working on a protest, but if it's, as long as it's not during class time, that could technically be allowed. It's the protest during class time. That's part of the goal. Yeah, to be clear, I, I spent my career in the nonprofit movement doing 501c3s, but a lot of it was electoral. So I know what Garrett's talking about, about the you know, difference between lobbying and informing and all of that. But there's just, um, I think, a much different experience. I've done plenty of protesting and electoral stuff too, and uh, this current thing has me all flummoxed. But the point is that it's a much different service learning experience when you're working with a nonprofit that has a sort of longer term strategy than you know, creating uh, mayhem or doing a protest that is very emotional and does create long-term change maybe, but it's just a different experience. And that's not what I think this experience is about. Um, and, but I know that these questions are gonna come up because it's the year that it is. And so the political electoral races are very easy to answer. The protesting, or you know, either students for justice in Palestine or Hillel or whatever side you might be interested in helping, like that's a harder thing because they are C threes. I mean, you can also frame it as you use your absences how you how you want. Like my students have three to four absences. You want to use it for protest? Go for it. I'm not policing your absences. It's your business. So. so I wanted to give a round of applause again to our our panelists. Uh, and you know, it kind of makes a really nice transition into the following slide, which is around best practices. So what are things like that we found really effective within working with partners? So for example, like um, I know one of the things in Amanda's class, right? Uh, I'm just gonna start the screen share back, Garrett. Um, let's see. Hi, Garrett, thank you. Yes, and I'm so excited to be collaborating with you all. It feels like a really historic time with a new president. We have a lot of new deans. And there's a lot of momentum. So um, I am deep in this work and excited to work with you all. E email me anyone in the in the room, grady at American.edu, um, just for specific contacts or leads. But much gratitude to all of you all. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, y'all. And if uh, anybody's interested in collaborating over at Christ House, What's your email? Uh, I am Karen, what's the first name, dot last name, Casella, C-A-S-S-E-L-L-A, -S -S -E at Christhouse.org. Uh, we don't have business cards for you, because it's that humble an organization. Um, but happy to talk, or any other you know, campus partners. I've been around for a while, so I'm happy. To, I love brainstorming stuff for you. And we are a 24 seven medical respite care and recovery for men experiencing homelessness in DC. And we're from the heights. Thank you all. Thank, so you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Even as I'm uh, looking at these slides, I prepared them like, no, I kind of want to revise these, but <laughs> we're just going with what we have. Uh, this is sort of my speed lesson on best practices. Uh, my big thing, free space for informal and formal reflection in class. This is one of the eight requirements of the training course, but we also see students make more gains when we build in the metacognitive work to class. So you can create formal graded assignments, but also keep space in class for that informal discussion with students and problem solving, especially around things like scheduling, the commute, trying to partner students together, troubleshooting their lift applications, all of these things. Uh, big thing, build learning about DC, the social justice issue, the partners that you're chosen for the class or that your students are choosing a partner with into the course and specific communities into the course. 
Uh, so good example of this, um, I had a student this semester, my students in my complex promise class doing better, doing good. They volunteer at Gordon's Kids and it's an after school program that serves the same two neighborhoods in Anacostia for the last 30 some years. Every single person in the community is black. They are from an under-resourced community that is 100% of public assistance. Um, we had a student mid-semester ask why we weren't talking about the Latinx community in DC. And I was like, the Latinx community is a huge community in DC, but I gotta be honest, we don't actually have anyone using Florence Kids Services that's in the Latinx community. And it was a moment where it became clear that the amount of class time the student had missed, she didn't understand that aspect of the community. Um, it's something I'm thinking about how I'm building this into the course, but again, too, like build this time into the course. So if there is a gap in your student's knowledge, they can realize that. Um, also, I think too, social justice issues our students may know quite a bit or they believe that they do, but they may not know about the specific DC community that they're serving. That is most certainly something you just spend course time and class time investigating, whether it's course readings, in-class discussion, um, graded assignments, I think a combination of all of these elements most certainly required. Uh, model adaptability and communication with students. We've heard this, especially from Karen this morning, um, but thinking about how do you write an email to a community partner? How do you talk about hours? Um, I have a nonprofit who hasn't partnered with two of my, my classes over the last two years because of spring 22. They got a pretty rude email from a student demanding a reply over a weekend for hours. And it's a really bad taste in their mouth to work with first year students from American. They'll work with higher level students or they'll work with students on research projects, but they do not want to partner with first year courses anymore. Um, and that's a bridge that one student burned due to a really inappropriate email. So I think too, being really reasonable with our students about what are the kinds of hours nonprofits work? Um, we as faculty might answer an email on weekend. That's not true for someone who's working nine to five and making $45,000 a year as a volunteer coordinator. And we set those expectations. I'd also say too, especially if you can build in as much knowledge, again, about the community, about the community partner, about the type of work that they're doing into the course, things like scheduling. I love the fact that Ochoa has that whole graph. The more of us that we can be clear about how students can partner, and what the scheduling looks like and the kind of work that they do. Uh, I think of a former uh, volunteer coordinator, someone who's a soccer twelve years ago, she likened it to a dating app um, and trying to match people well. It really does come down to matching your students to the community partner that they're volunteering as well. Um, please ask your students to plan ahead. A lot of our students, again, great intentions, but time management is especially not a skill that most students have at this point post-COVID. It's something we've all experienced, I think, especially in terms of student projects. The sooner you can get your students volunteering, um, the better off they will be. Also think about how to plan ahead for projects, uh, community-based learning hours. One thing that we've increasingly seen, and I hate to say it, it happens more in the spring. Um, for some time, for some reason, we tend to get some lift grant applications and students want less than a 24 hour turnaround time. And that's not reasonable for my graduate assistant who works eight to 10 hours a week. It's not reasonable for me who sometimes get these applications on a teaching day when I have to teach three classes in a row because I'm sure faculty. The more that you can model again for your students how to communicate and plan ahead, the better off these experiences are. Uh, and again, just teaching your students how to work with a partner. Um, so one thing I like doing, I like inviting them to my classroom. I like explaining why I work with this partner. I like them seeing that I have a relationship. I even mention things in class, like I will text Kiana at Cordis Kids, or I will be emailing with so-and-so, or we've worked together for this many years. Um, if the students realize there is that level of accountability and that we're actually in partnership with the community partner, they're more likely to behave more reciprocally and rapidly. Uh, Josie, did you have a hand up? No, problem. Um, okay, cool. I do. So this is a question I had before. I'm a little unclear as to the difference between going Here's a partner we have a whole relationship with, and here's a volunteer circle, here's a thing we you know, and you can definitely you know, work with them and know if there's our course and everything else. Mm -hmm. so, or you can go find your own partner. Mm -hmm. Is that the way it works? Or is it like you can choose? So again, this is one of those CBL, like we have a broad definition and we sort of have best practices, but it's also gonna be different depending on certain classes. So for instance, my complex problems class, the students, the name of the nonprofit is in the course description. The entire course is built around Corden's kids. Yes. And I built the course because I was actually their first intern when I first came to DC in 2005. Mm -hmm. And it was an organization of five white ladies, as I like to say. I thought I paid the one year of uh, NASA Park events. 
Yes, like most of them. Yes, I might have been uh, your volunteer coordinator on this field that day. <laughs> um, but I've also seen the organization change over the almost 19 years I've been working with them and make progress in changing their policies and methods. And that's why I built the course, gotcha. looking at how nonprofits change over time. And that's the name of the course, Doing Better, Doing Good, and how we do this. Mm-hmm. My writing class, we partner with three nonprofits, Gordon's Kids, again, because I've got a continuing relationship, Martha's Table, it's a signature partnership from AU, and I've worked with them for the last six years. And then DC Reads, because students can volunteer at DC Reads and use their federal work study award through mm-hmm. AU, which also makes community-based learning accessible to people who have a federal work study work, because those are often the groups that are left out of this work. But I'll have each group come talk to class and on. Um, students can then decide based on their needs. Plenty of professors do like Ochesley does. I have noticed, especially in earlier classes or theme-based classes, if you can limit the number of partners in a class, it tends to work better. Um, in my writing class for the first, first year students, I would only do two to four partners. Three is kind of like a sweet spot. Um, and, and those classes also work well when there is that block, like we do the fair from 12 to two on that Wednesday, which is that block day. So for example, David Pike's class, who was another one of our faculty who did in the same way Ochesi did, or um, where those block classes are during the fair, that also makes things a little bit easier to find a partner who they, all of the partners have been briefed that like students may be coming in from a class like this. uh, And we designate 30 minute intervals for those classes to come talk to the partners during that time. Um, So that's another way to do it. I would recommend finding a few partners before going into the class uh, and rather than connect teams to your class. Yeah, exactly. Rather than like maybe letting it all for your students to figure out. Um, although that is, you know, there's nothing wrong with that option. It just takes a little bit more accountability and oversight from the faculty member. Yeah. One last uh, one I want to mention best practices. This seems really simple, but this happens all the time. Um, whether it's students or faculty, sometimes you meet someone within the community, a nonprofit organization, you're like, this organization does everything that I stand for. It's a great connection with my class. Everything works great. Up until you realize that the main service that that organization does happens to be like maybe the same day as your class or the same day as when students are all busy for another class, like a lab portion or something like that. So just, you know, if you're working with an after school program, be mindful that there's a specific time slot that maybe students would need to be able to go. Um, so for my complex problems class, for instance, for these kids, a, ma- a majority of the volunteering, as in 90%, is after school. So in the course description, we say you need one afternoon available from about 3 till 6, 7 p.m. because you also have to count on the commute for students exactly. to do this. Exactly. They do set up some individual projects with maybe one to three students a semester. We try to limit it as much as possible because it does great work for community partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's Shay's point, like trying to orchestrate different projects. Like it might be offloading, but the front work to get students to that point, it's a lot. Um, so I think, again, too, like being really clear about the schedule, you also have to be reasonable with yourself. Um, some former folks that used to engage in community-based learning uh, at AU, especially back in the aughts, tried to do this during class time. It's a lovely idea. I think it works well if you have a block class and it's a more local partner. But if you're trying to get from, say, AU to Anacostia in a three-hour block class, two hours is going to be commute. That may not be reasonable. Yeah. So. Another thing, so also with the community partners, you're going to have to look for one in advance. If there is a community partner like Copyright, we would love to have teams come and do uh, some translation work. That would have been great. The problems that they needed to build their background check, we needed to come up with an hour mm. because they had to use hours to students for legal reasons. And so, if there is a partner that you think is a particularly good fit and that you will likely have three or four students that will likely want to be there with them, reaching out to the students, making an advance, I don't know if they can't really know. But so, I mean, if you have an interest in working with a big partner, let me know in advance and we can start to get you. Yeah, get you ready for, for service because it took like a, a month and a half to get us to do all this access to the system. Thankfully, they were there for a year because they were CDRS, but like in a semester, that's half the semester. Oh. Yeah, and that's usually where, you know, just like honestly sending it, that's the orientation survey. We ask around background checks. Like, background checks have been one of the most difficult pieces to overcome, um, if I'm being honest, but it doesn't mean that they're not worth doing. It just means we have to start 
like right when the semester starts. And sometimes that's where having uh, um, almost like tiered levels of partnership sometimes work out really well, or you find an opportunity for them, like Free Minds Book Club, for example, they're often working with incarcerated individuals. Background checks are a big part of it, but that doesn't mean that they don't have opportunities available for students without that, right? Uh, it just takes a little bit of planning. So that actually leads into um, one of my challenges I have in here, forms. Uh, depending, especially if you have students volunteering with any organization that works with children, Ordinance kits, DC reads. Uh, DC reads, those are also the added level of the Federal Work Study Award, and your students have to be on board at work day. Um, bless her heart, there was a dear student this semester who came into the Center for Leadership Community Engagement Office and didn't understand why she wasn't being paid for DC reads. And the graduate assistant had to explain to her, you know, have you filled out the paperwork? Have you filled out a W9? Have you done this? She was like, what is this? And he was like, oh, have you not had a job before? Okay, let's fill out your job paperwork. So even, especially if you have students doing something like DC Reads, doing a kind of background check, Corden Skids, for instance, and anyone basically who's working at DC Reads, well, you're gonna need fingerprints. Um, I will say, you might wanna tell your students, this has come up in a couple of my classes this year, on the background check, they are not looking for low level charges such as speeding tickets and marijuana charges. That is not something of the background checks. Um, generally, we have noticed are looking for. Are you saying that the students get paid for doing DC reads? Yes. yes, federal work study. If your federal work study. If your federal, if your federal work study. Work study. Yeah. yeah. So you can use your federal work study award. Does it still count as voluntary then? It does. does. So, and American will pay for fingerprinting? Yeah, DC reads, right? They do. Yeah, DC reads pays for the fingerprinting. Yeah, the school partners, I think, take on that one. But in terms of the, uh, so it still counts for CBL hours. It just doesn't count towards the President's Volunteer Service Award. So if they're getting paid for it, even as federal work study, the only time when a student can get paid and still count it for hours is sometimes with stipends when the stipends aren't meeting a minimum wage. But because through federal work study, they're receiving minimum wage, it's, it's unfortunately not eligible. I do know others, I've heard other institutions sometimes do that. But that's not something that we want to get in the habit of doing that. Part of it is also the accessibility aspect because if we limited the students who would not try to use their uh, federal work study award, we could limit to more wealthy students uh, because generally students are getting federal work study. And I say so as a kind of former federal work study student herself, we used her award on the community service learning programs at Dickinson College back in the day. Uh, it makes it reasonable. There's no other way to fit that time in volunteer wise. So. Um, okay, so complex problems with CBL. I will not get all of these because again, we're quickly running out of time. Um, but I'm borrowing that complex problems language because it's challenging work. It is time consuming work and it gets messy. And many of these things aren't captured possibly in your elements or your merit or where you're putting in motion or your RT files. But these are most certainly aspects. Uh, so I think, especially for my students, they come away with a better understanding of how complicated social and racial justice is in work in a place like DC. They might have ideas from their own community, but then they understand certain things like DC, we don't have congressional representation. We have a DC council with eight council members, but even their hands are tied depending on the issue. Uh, Muriel Bowser, she might be a mayor, but example, she could not even call in the National Guard on January 6th. There are dramatic limitations to living and working in Washington, DC. And as our students start to unpack the complicated racial history of a deeply desegregated city, they start to understand this better. Uh, interpersonal communication skills across stakeholders. So I always say to students, like, and I even had this conversation via a student who was complaining about a grade yesterday. If there were a problem with service hours or there's a problem with logging vehicles, I need to know this before final grade time. Like the grade is in, and I'm happy to work through this with you, but this is not the point that I can make any of these changes. Like, I would have rather had this conversation with you back in March when you told me everything was okay. So I think modeling, again, what communication looks like and being proactive instead of reactive afterwards. Um, there is, there does seem to be, other than that one student, uh, accountability and purpose beyond grades. Students start to build that relationship with the community partner and it doesn't just become about the grade that's an eagle service, but it does become about the work that they're doing with the community partner. Uh, they're seeing how AU is connected to the outside community and hopefully we don't wanna become an island. They start to see how isolated AU is physically and in terms of culture from DC, and they want to experience more of the city. Uh, I do believe it builds intellectual curiosity, the interdisciplinary nature of CBL. It's exciting to them to hear about seniors and Garrett's SIS course, or 
the seniors doing the community documentary course in school of communication or how public health scholars who are seniors are building the work that they might have started thinking about in a first year course. Um, they have more time to network with partners and build volunteers. It is resume material. I intended to have done in internships and been able to build on some of the relationships we built with adult volunteers over time, which is lovely. Um, it also builds DC life skills, navigating transportation. Um, I always tell students you will learn the DC transit system much better than any other student humanly possible, which is very true. Challenges. Um, I don't want to perseverate on some of these. But balancing the pre-service training need programmatic learning outcomes. Um, I've even had faculty in my own program a little skeptical that I'll spend the first two to three classes having community partners come in. But again, if I can get my students volunteering sooner and understanding how their community work is actually tied to the learning outcomes and to the research they'll be doing, the class tends to work better. Um, again, forms. Um, actually, my complex forms classes, they're all voluntary affordance kids and they have a pretty clear way of doing forms and a number of different forms because you're working with children, I make it a graded assignment and it's complete and complete. So if they, we get to say September 20th in the fall and the forms aren't complete, I click incomplete and that big F that's showing up in Canvas, it's a little scary, but it's a big motivator. It works and it will stay incomplete until the forms are completed um, because it's not to me equitable to have an underpaid volunteer coordinator at 24 years old chasing down my 18 year olds. We don't want to do a background check. We don't want to do other things. That has been a game changer in terms of getting points for that. Um, this is a messy one. Uh, addressing bias and racism from well intentioned students. We actually had an ongoing issue with one of my students this semester. It was pretty frustrating for everybody involved. Um, I did ask students to make a bias report. Um, so it went to the Title IX office. The Title IX office said it didn't escalate that high. It then got sent back to the College of Arts and Sciences so they could handle it. Um, we're actually going to handle it in the fall with the students dean in their own school and have a conversation with the students back on campus. But this has been since the Explain week. Explain that. I, yeah, I, 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 it's really important that you're saying it. So okay. Uh, a student in one of my courses was saying biased things about the community around where they were serving. They're talking to other students about yes. it. Yes. And then when some of my students tried calling in the student, that student doubled down with misogynist language this year. So my faculty train tells me that we should be telling the students to make a bias report because that's what faculty are often told when they find these situations. Title IX looked at the situation. They said it didn't escalate to a Title IX issue. I'm not sure why, but they're apparently going by the very legal definition. Um, because they weren't insulting community, they were insulting outside. It wasn't considered a Title IX issue. It was considered a bias issue that the college could deal with. So apparently in the fall, we will have um, the new ABP of Inclusive Excellence, Nikenji Brown. Nikenji yes. Friday. Nikenji Friday, sorry. Um, she will have more of a framework for us. We're eager to find out what this is, but bias and racism come up and can be classes regulated. It's going to look different in every single class, depending on which communities you're working in. Um, it sometimes happens, unfortunately, with Latinx students in my class that works with more kids. We've had anti-blackness come up two or three semesters, no matter how many readings I have them read on anti-blackness, there seems to be this separation um, on what they are doing versus the actual theory of it. So again, offering space in class to reframe some of these things. And then also you being familiar yourself with things like how do you make a bias report? Um, you can just Google American University bias report and the form pops up. I think especially the space that we're in right now, the more that we can follow procedures. Uh, that was one thing when I spoke to some administrators, they said I had to make a bias report and follow Title IX office's direction and I couldn't step in and handle it. I think most examples are a little more subtle and they could be things like a comment in a class or something said in a graded assignment that you can grade students on. I'd also say the more that we can build some of these things into rubrics. So for instance, there's language in my rubric about bias or racist language in class. I can hold students accountable to that. At home. It's a big mess of work. Um, and I think we're going to find out more from our new ADP. So, um, related student anxiety, white fragility. This is a new one. I did a use for sign of reading um, about the volume of white women in volunteer work and the volume of wealthier, more privileged people because they have more time generally, more means to volunteer in under resourced communities. It led students, it was a good conversation, and I think it made students think about their own intentions, but then that entire cohort was so nervous about causing harm in the community 
then they weren't engaging the children that they were volunteering with at Horton's Kids programs because they were afraid of causing harm. It was like, you're actually causing harm by not helping that seven-year-old finish his math worksheet. Like that's the point of you being there. So two, it's thinking about how do we get around some of these student anxiety and often white fragility issues. Um, so students think about what is their class get then? No, we don't want them contributing harm to different communities, but we also want them to think about how are they doing this realistically? And what does it look like the task that nonprofits ask them to do? Um, balancing student expectations, community partners, I think Garrett said it really well. Uh, our students come in with big grand ideas and sometimes we have to manage them. They're not gonna change the world in the entire semester, but I do think community-based learning is a gateway to work that they may do down the line or to exploring their own relationship to who they are as citizens. Um, again, student time management, especially at midterms and before finals, mm. I tell my students, the more that you can plan ahead and get the service hours done early, again, getting the community partners in early, the better things will be. We did notice across courses, either a push for service hours in the last two weeks, or students dropped off in the last two weeks because they were ghost to their partners. And both are not things that we want to encourage. And the more that we can support students and also lay that foundation that this is not acceptable, and this is the kind of partnership that we want to have consistently all semester, the better off our students and the community will be. Uh, commute logistics. I have started just making a Microsoft Excel sheet for my students. They list their name, their contact number. I tell them that they cannot share contact information um, with people outside of the class, but it lists their site, their days, so they can coordinate things like the commute. If they can try to use their UPASS, we encourage it, but it also helps with the Lyft program if they're using the Lyft program. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we do have to be on call for student and partner concerns or community mm -hmm. challenges. I do give my first year courses my phone number, but I also look at it as in one, I would like to use this when it's an emergency, like the green line is down. Uh, you can't get on WMATA trip planner, but I'm at home on my laptop and I could do this. Um, I am, again, very strict on how it's used. Like, if you send me the 5 a.m. extension request, which has happened before, uh, I'm going to ignore that text. Um, but if you send me a text message or a phone call and I see it later on, I can help you troubleshoot some of this. Is there No, no. Um, the way it worked this year, we sent two or more students and generally going to places that were more metro inaccessible. So it's almost always worth seven or eight or places that are a little farther out. Virginia is a big one. Um, the problem is, especially with the Lyft Fund, I explained to students this way, it's sort of like a shared checking account across the entire university. Mm -hmm. So if someone maxes out because we're trying to pay for a lift from A to Rockville, for instance. So the way we worked with that group, the students took the metro to whatever metro station they put in Rockville, and then the lift was from the Rockville metro to the site. We had a UN as a backup, but we said to them, you know, please only do this if the red line is completely down. And most students are really good about doing this. Um, the same student actually we had some bias issues with in my class was not as good about the lift program, but the women in that cohort seemed to check that student. So uh, I think too, like as much as you can communicate to students about some of the limitations of the program, we do a Canvas Commons every year. So it's a module that you can just download and insert to your course. It has the application links. It has my contact info. It has files. It has the requirements for things like the Lyft program. Please share it with them and just put it in your course. Uh, we're happy to also come talk to students. We're going to start doing that if we get funding this fall, because we do want to make this clear. And we do also want students realizing that this is something that we're all trying to take advantage of and not just one group or one cohort maxing out. Um, and then Ludi pointed this earlier, but not realizing the course is CDL. Uh, I think the more that you can be front and center is in the first sentence of every single one of my syllabi, my course descriptions. I also add a couple of readings in the first two to three classes. I've also started adding a reading on writing for racial literacy, which does tend to nudge out folks and self-select that may not be interested in more complicated conversations. So I think too, thinking about what course text or readings connected to the kinds of concepts your students might encounter, especially for my students. They're building their racial literacy in a city once known as Chocolate City. It can be uncomfortable. If they're not ready to have that conversation about a 
writing text that's talking about this, they're probably not welcome to ready to do in the community, and they're probably going to drop the course. And that has actually the last three years I've taught that reading. Anyone who's been kind of on the fence or like, oh, I didn't know it's CBL, they've dropped right after that class. So it works well. Are y'all able to share some of the syllabi of these courses? They are on our Canvas course. Yes. Yeah. And if you want to share your stuff, we are happy to. It's a good segue into what we're about to do in maybe 10 minutes. We're going to speed through this next section and then potentially a five minute break before. Uh, knowing that we're at like three, we have until four. So um, we'll go to break in just a moment. I wanted to mention one part on this, like uh, the, ra the racism and bias training. So ARPC, the Anti-Racist Policy and Research Center at um, AU, they have resources available for faculty as well as for staff that I would definitely recommend, you know, going to their resources, talking to somebody there, setting up an appointment, if there's any concerns around how you integrate this, that portion within your class. Uh, we also have other faculty, of course, can talk about it. One of the other groups I would recommend is the DC Impact uh, Scholars. I remember I was in their very first inaugural cohort and we had one reading on white privilege, kind of that standard one where it's like, what's the difference between being wealthy or being um, poor and white and also white privilege, that kind of uh, tension that arises through it. We were lucky enough to be in a living learning community. So we all had done that reading. We're meeting in the uh, lounge before we're going to the lab class. And of course the lab class had an entire thing planned for that day. We sent an email, maybe 10 minutes as like a class or as like a group to the faculty, Dr. Jane Palmer. And we're like, we need to have a discussion on this because right now we're kind of having a conflict within our own uh, living learning community on whether or not this reading is like being understood by the cohort that we we're about to go through. And we spent, we had to be agile, right? To make sure that we were responsive to that so that we could move past it as a class, which we did honestly really well, but it really set us up for that next stage there. So, you know, obviously don't gloss over, even though it's a difficult conversation, like know that there are resources available and it is maybe requiring a little bit of adaptability, but it saves time later on. That's right. This is one other resource I do wanna, so we have different library subject guides, especially if you're teaching higher level courses, you most likely see some of these things. I love this guide, especially if you're trying to get shared language for a class. So for instance, I pointed to anti-blackness. It's something that comes up I've added this, we have a day where we just focus on this. You get the more theoretical definition from uh, former AU librarian, Christina Bush, and then a suggested readings. So I think too, if you're looking for shared language that people are using across courses and across the university, and also demonstrating how these are part of larger scholarly conversations that folks are having, this might be a great resource. This is available to anyone. I just Googled American University, Subject guide, library, anti-racism. So. All right, so we're gonna really speed through this next part. This is on Give Pulse. Again, a very important part of tracking the engagement. It's also a way to set up collaborative events or projects with your nonprofit partner. So we're gonna do an independent training on just Give Pulse. So I'm really gonna speed through on just the absolute highlights of it. We are doing a uh, faculty workshop in the fall once everyone has their Canvas courses. If you wanna come and do a deeper dive. Yeah, so students, they can create a co-curricular transcript. It is, sorry, absolutely. it's another CPRL. Oh, section right now? Yeah, yeah. Research okay. I wanted to funding. What did it is? Oh, uh, that's yeah. so okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, So students can generate like a transcript of the different community engagement that they've had. It also allows them to track it towards that presence on your service work. After this summer, if students are in a club that's service-oriented, they will also be familiar with GIFPULSE through that club and can track their club engagements through GIFPULSE as well. And ours are verified, so that ensures their academic integrity is kind of protected through that. For faculty, there is a Canvas integration, which we'll briefly walk through, but that's, again, more during the formal training. Thank you. Um, it's also flexible by course, so whether you're doing a project-based or an hours-based course, it works through that. There's templates that are repeatable, so don't feel like, oh, I've made this thing within Give Pulse, I can't repeat it semester over semester. That's part of why we upgraded. And you can visualize your impact as a class too, which we'll show you how to do. Um, you can find new partners through it, affiliate new partners. So I'm gonna show you that process in just a minute. 
and you can even share the data with them, which is great benefit for our community partners. Um, it also helps our partners organize their volunteer hours and shifts. That's actually kind of how the platform is built is partner, like nonprofits first in a way. Um, and it advertises them to larger than just AU. So it's not like AU is the only one within DC that uses this. So it's a really big sell for our partners because then they're realizing if I put a volunteer event on gift Pulse, it's not just AU students I'm marketing for, it's Montgomery College and George Washington, it's all of these other places to get the word out um, and allows them to get the data they need for grants and impact reports. And then for us, again, it gives us what we need to uh, have kind of monitoring and oversight over community-based learning. So there's a standardization as well as to track the data to get more support. Uh, so it does integrate with Canvas. Um, you'll see kind of just through the screenshot a little bit of what this integration looks like. What we're gonna do is actually get into more of an interactive. So I'm gonna click, actually, I wonder if this will work if I click right on it. So I'm gonna show everyone, we'll take five minutes to do really a very quick walkthrough. Um, Okay, I'm just gonna use Explore. So, screen sharing is paused, let me resume that. Okay, so this is the same process for everybody at AU, student, faculty, et cetera. American.givepulse.com. That's gonna take you to the AU specific homepage, first step. Everyone at AU has because they have an AU sign-in, an Outlook sign-in, they will have a single sign-on. So you'll add in your, or you'll sign in how you would to Outlook. Sign in, it's gonna give you the duo push. Okay, so if you're signing in for the first time, there's one page, it literally asks you, your name or email and you click confirm. It might ask you if you wanna share it on social media. I always skip that. Um, so if you're now a faculty or a student in a community-based course, and that's after you've done that designation form, your, reg your roster is tied up to every day. It gets updated based off of people who've added into your class, dropped into your class. This is like one of the key benefits of designating it as CV. You can then click on classes. So if you're, if you're doing this as a faculty or your students doing it, if they click on classes, it will show them whatever class they're actually registered for and only the community-based sections. So this is, again, something we didn't even have last year at this time. So it's a big benefit to make everything really easy. You can then, from this class page, check out your course. Uh, so if you click on the course as a whole, you'll see the kind of page of it. So it will show you the information pulled from the registrar's office, who the professor is of the class, who are the people in the class. Um, now, the way that I like to explain gift posts is there's two things you can do on gift posts. Let me show you. If you go to explore, you have events and you have groups. Events are volunteer events. Any group can do one of two things. They can create an event or they can affiliate with another group, almost like Facebook. So in a way, if you're a nonprofit or if you're a class and you're trying to create a collaborative event, you can do so by posting an event, you can make them repeatable, et cetera. And you can work even directly with the nonprofit partner to co-collaborate or sorry, to collaborate on creating an event. As a group, so this is where you'd find opportunities for volunteer, et cetera. Groups is what clubs, classes, nonprofits, anything that's a group of individuals would show up as a group. And again, a group can either post an event and or affiliate with other groups. So what does it mean to affiliate with another group or why is that kind of important? It's because it allows you the opportunity then to say, okay, so say that we, if you go to the homepage here, AU, we're gonna be clearing this all out over the summer, by the way, making sure that all of our affiliates are ones that we have very strong partnerships with. Um, but you would see here are nonprofits, students or us have worked with in the past. So say we go to something like the American Heart Association, it says that they have two upcoming events. Students on their app, Cork app, which is the same thing that say they're looking at 5 p.m., what's a club activity I can go to? They can also see service activities through that and it's connected. So any service events 
that your affiliate partners have posted will show up on that student's app as well, or it will show up on kind of events on their homepage. So what it allows you to do is if you've affiliated with a partner or that partner has affiliated with you, the events that you post or that they post will show up on each other's feed, so to speak. And so by doing that, it just raises the, the profile, it makes it easier to register for those type of uh, volunteer events. Um, partners can set how many volunteers that they want. They can set what the registration form looks like. Uh, you can send surveys through gift polls. So all of these other features we'll go over during the training. Again, going to classes, I'm just gonna show you kind of the very, so say you find a nonprofit that you wanna affiliate with, all you do is cl click this affiliate button, it will send a request to affiliate, and then they will have the opportunity to say, do I want my events to show up on their page? Do I want their events to show up on my page? Vice versa, neither, etc. So again, kind of switching now that mindset back to your student or faculty member, you've clicked on classes, you see that you have a community-based course on gift pulse, and you want to add hours to it. Um, you hit add impact. This is kind of something that's a cool feature is this is how you record your hours, right? But it's also a place for you to do reflection. And classes have the ability to set impact questions that are specific to your class. Everybody in the class will be asked that same question. Um, you can add questions to it, but like, you know, you can't really uh, tailor it for individual student or anything like that. But say you have a question, like let's say it's on strategies and stress management, right? And you have a core concept or learning objective that you wanna make sure students are reflecting on every time they add hours. You can, through creating an, uh, you can pretty much change this form to ask something that's more specific to your class. We will train you on how to do that, show you how to do that. And from there, then you'll get additional kind of reflection data from your students. How do you see all of this data at the end of the day? Um, you will have this manage tab as an administrator. You can even make your TAs and stuff administrators as well. And then I'll show you how AUs works. On the manage tab, you will be able to customize all these different things, right? So you can customize what your, your surveys look like. Uh, you can add surveys through that. You can customize your impact forms through this. And you can also see your data through this impacts tab. So say I wanted to see what is the, I, I've added a question on how has your service learning project added to your understanding of uh, social determinants of health throughout this course. You can show the class, the word cloud that comes up through, you know, all of the reflections at the beginning of the year, midway, end of the year, you know, just adding some kind of texture to it. You can also show them or maybe your department chair over you know, a year, hey, here are all of the ways that we've created impacts within the DC area. And usually do this on a uh, scrolling mouse. Okay, control and scroll, uh, gosh. Oh, there we go, okay. So when you actually get into this, what's cool is that I'll just do this one. You can click in on it. You can see the student who did it. You can see even their reflection if you click on it. Um, so, you know, each faculty is putting different levels, but like you can read what the student wrote. You can see who verified the hours as well. So this is kind of, again, where a lot of that data has some validity or hopefully is, is being standardized in some way. Um, and lastly, you can also see a cause distribution, which is kind of cool too. Uh, and say you're teaching multiple courses, uh, you can see what that looks like, different course by course, what the organizations are. You click on it, you'll see the different number of hours contributed to that learning or to that uh, impact area. Um, so again, just a few of the little things that you could do on Give Pulse. I just wanted to check my notes to see if there was anything this very kind of quick summary. Um, I think that's kind of the. Did you say there was a way for the service providers or the nonprofits to go in and, and check? Absolutely. Yeah. And what's cool is that we've really designed this in mind to reduce the amount of load on both faculty and nonprofits. 
So one of the ways that you can do that is say, you know, and students too, um, you can set up even geotags so that if you know a student is going in site or like to the site and you want it verified that way, there's multiple different ways they could do it. They could, you could set up a geotag so that when they're within a, a geographic area, it will automatically pop them in and out when they leave the zone. So that's one way to kind of automatically tally up those hours. You could also have it where there's a QR code set up and your partner, you've just like provided that code or your partner has that QR code available. So the student comes in, they scan the QR code to check in and then they check out. I forgot to mention, there is a Gift Pulse app and it's honestly fantastic. It's like one of the things I didn't realize that we got free access to once we kind of upgraded, but it is a really good tool um, as well. So um, I think, again, I think that's kind of gonna be the quick summary. We will offer trainings. There's so many different ways to use Gift Pulse to really make a community-based course sustainable and very powerful for you as a faculty member, as well as for your students to get the learning out of it. So, and your partner to keep track of everything. So um, please, if you have questions, if you have suggestions, what we've done as well, we're updating this over the summer, so don't judge it too harshly at the moment, is you Google American University Gift Pulse, and you'll see two tabs, or two different ones. We have Gift Pulse for community partners, as well as Gift Pulse for students. And we're even including all of these different tutorials. Um, so they're all like two minute or one page tutorials on like, if you're a student using Gift Pulse for the first time, what might you want to know? If you're a partner using Gift Pulse for the first time, what might you want to know? We're building this out again more over the summer. So if we hear from you all what's useful and what questions are, what's confusing, we can create step-by-step -step guides that will really cater to it. It's a, it's a big focus of our time over the summer. So yeah, with that, I wanna move us into our break until 3.15 and then we'll have a conclusion 45 minutes of an interactive activity. Actually, I wonder if we, based off of, because um, I know a lot of people have um, had to leave, if maybe if y'all are okay, we can scoop through, and I just wanted to do the activity, maybe condense it and just show you just the resource around it. And then uh, the last piece, which is sharing resources. So that way we can maybe just like round our time out. And like, if you have questions and want to um, sit back or stay back with us, uh, we are here and we can talk through uh, some additional questions and things that you all have. Is that, is that okay? Would that be okay? Yeah, I'd rather push through because that's a little bit Yeah, sounds good. Okay. So we will power through this last little bit. Um, one of the uh, resources we wanted to make sure you had and a good takeaway for you as well. Yeah, you remember, there's so many slides. Um, <laughs> where we put it? Was it before lunch? Yeah, yeah there right. we go. Awesome. So um, yeah, there we go. Has anybody heard of Stanford's Pathways uh, for Public Service? And it's also got a tag on in civic engagement before. That's great. So um, we will recap or cap this or share information around this uh, particular framework for you all. Um, and it's cool because it connects to a lot of new language. Well, I won't say it's new language, new language for me here at AU. Um, there are some other entities and departments talking about how do we create pathways um, and this pathway language for students. Um, uh, so it's cool because, again, it connects to some of the things that are happening on, on campus right now and some of the conversations around um, creating intentional experiences or, uh, for, for students and student learning. Um, but Stanford has created uh, this uh, thing called Pathways of Public Service, and they've identified uh, these different core areas uh, to help students understand that when they are engaged in these different experiences across campus um, that we know as community-based learning or community engagement, that is um, seen as more than just volunteering or just, you know, I'm just doing service. So they can see the value beyond um, just the, the framing of it being, uh, I'm just going out to, to do service and can see that it's multi-layered, um, multifaceted, and there's different ways. It's not a one size fits all approach, um, which also came up in some of our conversations today as well, but there's different ways that students can engage in a community um, engagement journey during their time at um, an institution. Stanford has identified these six particular areas that we um, wanted to share with you all uh, today. And, and some, uh, 
context around these things um, or this particular uh, pathway that they've created is that uh, the uh, this pathway was actually uh, pulled together by uh, several different institutions, but landed at Stanford. And now it's been picked up by Campus Compact. So they're doing a little bit more digging and deep diving in the pathway language uh, for public service or of public service and civic engagement to expand this out a little bit more um, thoroughly. Uh, the six areas that they have identified, though, are community engaged learning and research, um, connecting coursework and academic research to community identified concerns. Um, community organi organizing and activism, which we highlighted just a moment ago, involving, educating, and mobilizing individual and collective action towards social change. Direct service, which is, of course, the most popular one, um, working to address an immediate need or the immediate needs of a community um, partner or community. Philanthropy, donating or using private funds or charitable contributions um, for the public good, pub po sorry, policy and governance, um, participating in the public process, policy making, public governance, and then social entrepreneurship and corporate social responsibility um, using ethical business practice and um, private sector approaches to create change as well. So again, like it is helping students see that service is again, multifaceted and there's a lot of different branches um, that students can engage in this work. Um, it's non prescript it's not, this is not meant to be prescriptive. So this is just a uh, an opportunity to explore community engagement um, from different tenants and different facets as well. And it's unique because I read an article where there are a lot of universities that are using it in different ways. So they're using it, of course, in the classroom spaces to teach about community engagement and opportunities to engage um, with community partners, but also folks are using it in living learning communities um, and creating themes around these different pathways. They're using it um, for workshops and trainings, leadership um, development opportunities. They're using it for conferences, theming conferences um, and other things as, as well. And I think as we continue to see this evolve and um, deepen, we will see more ways that universities are using the pathways um, in, in the future. Um, we did have an activity around this particular uh, language when we talk about pathways um, that I will share with you that you could just do in ref your own like reflective practice. And to help you with an activity, um, it, it was really to partner a potential course that you're thinking about to one of the pathways or infusing some of the pathway language in some of the things that you're doing in a particular course. To help you do that, there's some examples listed here of uh, pathways uh, as you're reflecting on what that looks like. And I also wanted to point out, um, this is this actually came out of a really, really great meeting that we had with um, Bridget Trogdon um, regarding how do we continue to create partnership, um, build out the leadership and community engagement pieces um, and help to um, like make connections to raise more awareness around the work that we were doing and connect it to um, other entities around campus as well. And she had shared this thing that she has been working on, Pathway Language, about a guide to change making, which is very similar to what Stanford has created, um, but looking at different ways that students can engage in individual action and collective action um, to um, partake in or engage in social, in social change. So I wanted to make sure that you all had that too. She, shared with us that we can share with others, but we're excited to talk with her more to see how we might be able to build this out and use it in some of our work as as well. The activity, yes. Mm -hmm. I just have a question, I saw the voter engagement piece and since the election year, most persons are not from here, most persons that are not registered here. Um, does American do anything about uh, mail-in voting for students? Yeah, so, um, I'm I'm learning a little bit more, um, and I think it's unique because civic engagement has a and give me you can help give yeah, a little bit more yeah. context um, as a part of our work with CSAS, um, uh There we we have seen opportunities to do more of that civic engagement, uh, political awareness, and get in engagement work um, uh, with our our team and office, and so we are seeing that there are aspects of it existing in other spaces on campus, but we are in conversations about how to pull those pieces together, inclusive of creating resources for students um, and raising awareness for students to make sure that they know where they can be engaged in the voting process. Um, and uh, not just this upcoming election, but future elections as well, like providing resource and do we, do you know yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like where it exists right now? So the last two years, and I really have a feeling like this is gonna 
continue to be a commitment is uh, through the Division of Student Affairs last year, it was Regina Curran in the Title IX office, but we set up within the library, we work with the library to do a full on voter registration drive. So students can like, uh, we, we volunteer there, we have like the full six hours and I think it's like two or three days of um, on campus, excuse me, um, voter registration. So I, I would be shocked if we didn't do something like that again. From this, the student perspective, it's almost an excessive amount mm -hmm. of like, <laughs> like, it's hard to miss. Like you have to be like maybe mm -hmm. more available so you're not really at all, uh, you know, to miss. Are you trying to register here or are you trying to get them registered anywhere? Anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. And they do a bunch of absentee ballot mailings to facilitate that. We'll have the letters there, everything. Yeah. Like we'll have, we have the computers set up and everything and students, I mean, I, th I think maybe that's where I recently got registered too. It's like, the, and for anyone at the AU community, not just students too. So, yeah. yeah. I'm excited though, because I think there's opportunities for more engagement around that work um, and collaboration. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is the reflective activity um, that you um, can use or just to have it as a resource to try to think of like your course and connect it to not just the pathway language, but all of the things that we talked about today. Um, and there's some reflective prompts here and also in the workbook for you uh, to review and to think about when thinking of like, how do we connect the dots um, for uh, everything that we have shared today? And of course we are here as a resource for you. So if you're thinking about ways in which to make and bridge those connections and need some support and, or just want to bounce ideas off of us, we are here to um, help in that process as well. I wanted to make sure that you all, um, I'm excited to see more come out of this work around the pathway language. Um, and as we get more information, we will definitely share it with, um, with you all. Um, the other thing, last piece I wanted to share with you all are just some resources that you can take with you um, to go. Um, this will be a continued, uh, or uh, we will continue building this list out um, uh, as we get more resources. We want to make sure that we share all of those things with you all. Um, and so we have uh, some key websites uh, and links that you'll have and a, a separate doc uh, for some of the organizations that we're connected to um, where you can get information and more resources also around community-based learning and community engagement opportunities for students that are listed here. Um, we have, of course, the CBLR website, um, the Pulse language for you. And if you're looking, there is a database of also um, CB courses that will have links for you as well to share. You want to talk about walking, walking, working with Washington? Sure. Um, so we've alluded to this a few times today. Uh, we don't know if we have funding next year. So the minute we know, um, I will be showing it from the roof belts. Um, we will also share with our community practice page. So as long as you're on our email list or in that community practice, uh, you can self-enroll this link. Will be in the PowerPoint that we're going to share with you. Um, but it's a great resource. And we'd love to get people to use it more, especially as we try to collaborate more. Uh, the work with Washington County, next slide, please. Uh, this is what it funded 22 23. Uh, 23 24 is almost there budget wise. We're working on three more community partner honorariums. Um, but we have used so far uh, all but $3,000 with that budget. So we're quite proud. Um, but this is some of what the funding entails. Uh, we did, or we did not request, folks that we worked with in external affairs, what used to be known as the President's Office, did request more funding. Um, everyone who was a part of that funding process is students at the university. So this is also one of the challenges of trying to get people to give us a meeting to find out about what's going on as part of the budget. Um, but the big parts, especially are relevant to faculty, faculty microgrants. So again, that can fund student projects, um, Food or materials to support community camp, blah, community partner campus visits, the travel transportation fund. Uh, I will be honest, this fund last year we actually went over budget, so we borrowed from other parts of our working with Washington budget. We have the flexibility to do, um, but the more that we look at the communities that we support in the AU community, they're not near AU. Um, we're looking at different partnerships, possibly with on campus partners and some local groups. But a majority of the partners in Ward 7 or 8 or some communities in Virginia or Maryland. 
Um, and then community partner honorary. This one is a bit of a pain, especially for your community partner. It involves a lot of paperwork. Um, and this is obviously for me, it's dramatically the work day, but we have these three funding streams. We want to encourage people to use them. Uh, we find people even that do communities learning regularly that don't realize that we have things like a lift grant um, or that we can pay for things like posters or refreshments for class if community partners are coming. We'd love to do this. The community partner area, especially if you work with somebody repeatedly. So for instance, the Florence kids last year, um, because they've worked with a number of classes over the years, they and two other nonprofits received $500 community partner honorarians, which is fantastic. Um, there are some limitations, especially the community partner hour area. They do need to be a 501c3 or have a social security number because again, they are filling out some financial paperwork. Uh, there's no way around it. People have asked if we can cut checks before or send money to sell or pay power them out. And those are not things that are within our limitations, or I'm sorry, within our uh, realm of possibilities at AU. So, just one minute, though, are these, um, these are not for reimbursements. This is prior to We try to avoid reimbursements. Okay. The reimbursements take a while. So, okay. anytime, for instance, if you apply for a faculty micro grant, uh, Kyle and I will work with you. So, for instance, we worked uh, with Garrett Gray in the Blaze class to order food for her final because there were so many nonprofits coming, students, uh, different campus stakeholders, and we placed an order with Chart Falls. So, the class, so, there are applications. We actually have an update for Falls. We put them live on our uh, campus site yet because we're waiting to find out if we have funding. Yeah. But we have to pull out an application for every single one of these. This is something that is different from how things were done in the past before we had this funding stream, you can send us an email, that's great, um, but we would direct you towards the applications because we also need a record of all the requests and it helps us at least get this started. Um, students have complained about the Lyft application before. We have to set up how this works in Lyft. It's a huge Lyft, my graduate assistant and I, we're constantly troubleshooting it. Um, we're not asked, we've gone through this application number of times, we're not asking for unnecessary info. We need all the info on there. Uh, we need to set up things like geo tags. It takes a bit of work. So again, the more that you can encourage your students to apply early, the better. Uh, we're also welcome to setting up a program in case something happens. They might be able to use public transportation reliably most of the time, but if they have the green line or the red line's down, they're out of luck. Uh, so we're happy to set up a program in case. A majority of the programs were actually under what we budgeted. So we try to budget a little higher. A couple of the programs going to work the seven and eight were out in Maryland, Virginia max out or went over. So again, the way we transfer students is you have to think of it like a joint checking account. Um, and we also have to anticipate the last two weeks of the semester. Um, there's a lot of activity as we learned this semester that is most certainly when we saw the most lived activity all semester. So again, if you can model that communication, planning ahead, all of these things about being a good partner that works with our community partner for your students and when working with us, the easier is to fill all these grants. I provide you with a resource which might be helpful if you, God forbid, lose your funding. Mm -hmm. um, the I know for a fact that the state of Maryland has a nonprofit resource board at the governor's office cool. that yeah. might be able to provide funding for transportation, particularly to Montgomery and Prince George counties. Yeah. I'm not sure about Virginia, but I would think that there's got to be maybe the state nonprofit right. council or something might have some, we'll at least know where you should go to like apply for grants and stuff like that, since you can identify through uh, gift calls that the majority of students are going to these areas. Um, and then that's another partner who can identify other community partners and also help you with funding and transportation. Because as a student, a former student, uh, the UPASS doesn't work in Maryland and Virginia. Um, the Fairfax connector and stuff like that is outside of the range of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So even if it is Fairfax and it's 20 minutes, it's, if you don't have a car, it can be difficult. Sounds good. Um, articles, we have tons of articles and as um, many as we can, we will populate them into, um, some of them may already be in the SharePoint folder for you all, but we will continue to populate that SharePoint folder. So you have uh, tons of articles and reading materials for you as well. Um, some of my favorites, uh, books <laughs> and more podcasts, right? Um, so um, wanted to share some uh, key books for community engaged practice, community engagement, 
um, here for you. And then some podcasts, which I'll link in our master link of things as, as well, um, just for your continued learning. I'm a learner too. So if you want to send me something to add to the list, please do. Books, articles, podcasts, music, whatever it is. <laughs> I would love it, love it, love it. And that's it. Um, any other questions, thoughts? Ideas. How do you know what interactive activity we're missing? The hats. Oh, or, no, no, the, uh, what's it called? The colors, right? The, well, we, um, for the Stanford Pathway model, um, we had posters. There's going to be some moving around, posted notes to do some idea sharing around some of the pathways and how uh, they can show up in not just classes, but just your work with, with students. But I'll share, we have an outline of the activity, so I'll share that, I'll put that in the, um, in the SharePoint folder, just in case anybody wants to use it, yeah. We could do a workshop on it. We could, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in this, um, there's a new survey to go along with the Stanford Pathways too for students, so we could maybe do some more around. Yeah, and I feel like, usually it's your own connection to survey. Can I ask you something, uh, uh, Melanie, if you're so kind, you had uh, sort of a list of books that you really always go back to, and there was a book that had a title of Liberation. Yes. Uh -huh. I, I, could you please give me the title? So it, it, it's the Apedia. Mm -hmm. We yeah. already dropped it in the folder that we have. Okay. It's fantastic. The um, Leadership for Liberation. Yeah, mm -hmm. I will, if you go back to, do you have a QR code? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was before the, the community practice. It, you said it's on there. Oh. Mm -hmm. You want to show the? No, I'm saying the liberation PDF that Ludi was saying, it's in the SharePoint folder. Oh, yes. Yeah, we can find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you use that QR code, it'll take you to this folder, and I'm about to add our updated slide deck to this too. Yeah. Before you do, I'm gonna make something. Oh well, I can change it regardless. There were some updates that we got, yeah. Yeah. but because it's on SharePoint, I can most likely not. Uh, and that's where. How long is There's the like. Is there a QR code for the community practice that potentially? If... There is a self enrolled thing. So, so it's in this PowerPoint. If you get any of our community practice emails, if you go back, that link is in every single one of those emails. Yep. Um, I feel like I may have put it in here. Another QR code. I love QR codes. Are all of your emails first initial last name? Yeah. Mine is just a chat down. C H O U T K A. What about you, Melanie? Bullock, yeah. Same. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was a hair movie that. Um, for faculty trainings on Give Pulse, I would just highly recommend you record it. Yeah. Um, adjuncts and graduate student instructors can always get access to uh, notifications mm -hmm. or resources for faculty. That's something that CTR always gets somewhat frustrated with. Mm -hmm. There's a new adjunct fellow at CTR. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to engage more with adjuncts, I highly recommend mm -hmm. um, the adjunct fellow. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am also one of the facilitators for the Greater Building Teacher Faculty Program at CTRL, and that is a professional development program for graduate student instructors. So let's start instructors working on CDL stuff as they're learning to be professors. Also, clarification some adjuncts have kept asking if they can apply for any of these funds. Most certainly, there are no limitations on who the professor can be. So please keep that in mind. Uh, we've had graduate assistants. We taught courses this year who applied, and they also got money. So the limitations are for the lift uh, and the faculty micro grants. It must be a CDL coded course. We partner in our area. We have a little bit more flexibility. And with our gift folds kind of purchase into this upgraded version, we get three videos, one hour long each, that we're able to record and then we pretty much own those. So all we have to do is come up with what are what's most important to those different stakeholder groups. So we're going to do one for faculty, one for um, you know student, one for faculty and other administrators of a group, one for students, so those engaging within it, and then one for nonprofits. So um, any like anything at all that might be useful uh, 
I know it's hard to conceptualize now because you haven't had an introduction to it, but during our first session, please like let us know and then we will have a recording by the end of the summer that, that we can share out. Yeah. Um, you said three hour long videos? Three one hour long videos. I guarantee none of us will watch an hour long video. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, so what we're hoping to do is have like, okay, what are the learning objectives and then splice it up into like, Okay, here's how you affiliate, and here's how you set up a assignment and Canvas extension, and you know, so hearing ideas on that. But abs absolutely, we're going to be very mindful of time with the trainings because <laughs> no one wants to sit through an hour of that. We had a whole boot camp last summer. That's when I got exposed to it all, and it was uh, eight weeks long, and each of them was an hour long. Right. And um, I have, yeah, so many notes and stuff that's come from it. That's like. Who else is going to do that with me? I guess the team this year. <laughs> um, you had a video that you could not show. It, is it a video done by the office by uh, CSS? Question. So um, it's a it's done by Duke University. The but we have been testing. Sorry, we have been working with the library to get testimonials on it. One of the the questions and like again if anyone has to leave go for it but like one question I kind of have for everybody is what is it look like to actually showcase some of this work so that the whole AU community and those who are potential stakeholders like can hear about this um I know that part of the the big benefit of bringing in Melanie is the storytelling aspect but I feel like there's still uh and we have all the student stories I feel like though there's just like disconnect between who's the audience that we really want to market this to and what's the formal event. And um, I know the library has started the symposium on experiential learning, but I really do feel like we could get towards something just for service learning or community. And as we do that, if you all have some really great stories that we could like, we could help with the storytelling component of that um, and sharing it out more widely, let us know um because yeah like Sagar said we're exploring some things around how do we just tell our story more and tell the students experiences and their stories share it out more and so if there's some things that you want to highlight and we'll we'll check in with you all of course um about that but um would love to work in partnership with folks about how do we tell the story what, what i have learned uh, throughout the years is i have been insisting on, on the CSS office to have an actual video that can be shown on the website but I also know that AU imposes a lot of restrictions on the kinds of videos that can be sort of put on the website. But there has to be a way. There has to be a way in which, you know, like the showcasing for, you know, leadership or the work that's, that's done. And it can be like a two minute video. People don't have, you know, like the patience to watch a whole lot, but mm -hmm. there are like snippets of things like different kinds of projects, professors engaged, community partners just going out in, a, in, in the metro or whatever, but, uh, but two minute video showcasing what the office does, but also what students and faculty and staff have done here uh, related to this. But I know that AU is very particular about this. Even having that short video and then having it within the Canvas Commons or within the um, AUX courses, for example, like something that, you know, that's really how I think we raise the visibility of this work. So it's definitely a great, great idea. It's just like, I, I, uh, I think it's just a time thing, right? Yeah. Like, and we do have a secret web friend, like internally, Julia, to help yeah, us with that work. Yeah, great um, That we, we could um, definitely touch base and explore a little bit more of that. So. But we'll, we'll probably be reaching out too to, as we pull those stories together, um, so that we can make sure we have a, a good um, array of different voices to support them. Most of the time. So there's a little bit of flexibility, and this is where we've added on the application and the Canvas Commons for the fall once we get the okay. Um, we had someone from Garrett's class, for instance, say that they couldn't use the lift funds. And I said, We didn't get an application from you. Like, I don't remember rejecting you. Like, what's up? It's like, oh, it says, Four more students. I'm one. My schedule didn't work with others. I'm like, we could have worked with you. Like, I wish we knew this information center too. So I also say, like, if you have questions or concerns, please reach out to us. Um, we won't, for instance, if you have a student 
trying to go 20 minutes away from AU and it's on a bus line, that's not something we could do. Um, but 45 minutes even, there's also, we filled some grants with students who are volunteering midday in Shaw. And because Shaw is on the green line, we could take some of the bus lines. You know, the buses can be more, more or less reliable depending on the wind blows. Um, we can set it up for those in case scenarios. So I think too, like if you want me to come to class and help do a lesson with your students on commuting, like I sit there with my both classes and we spend time figuring out transportation. For the class that goes with Warren's kids, I'll actually commute with them the first time so they learn how to use the bus system better because the bus system can be a little tricky, especially for early college students or if you haven't used the bus before. Um, but we're happy to talk through lift ideas. And I'd rather like talk through something and come up with a solution than you sort of feel like your needs are not met. Most certainly. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.